Chapter 64 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 64 The Old Woman and Her Pig. Once upon a time, an old woman was sweeping her little house when, to her great joy, she found a silver sixpence. What, said she, shall I do with this little sixpence? I think I will go to market and buy a pig. So the next day she went to market and bought a nice little white pig. She tied a string to one of the pig's legs and began to drive him home. On the way, the old woman and her pig came to a stile, and she said, Please, pig, get over the stile. But the pig would not. Just then a little dog came trotting up, and the old woman said to him, Dog, dog, bite pig. Pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home tonight. But the dog would not. So the old woman held up her stick and said, Stick, stick, beat dog. Dog won't bite pig. Pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home tonight. But the stick would not. So the old woman gathered some bits of wood together to make a fire, and set them on fire, and then threw her stick into the fire and said, Fire, fire, burn stick. Stick won't beat dog. Dog won't bite pig. Pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home tonight. But the fire would not. So the old woman fetched a pail of water that was standing near and said, Water, water, quench fire. Fire won't burn stick. Stick won't beat dog. Dog won't bite pig. Pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home tonight. But the water would not. Then the old woman saw an ox coming, so she said, Ox, ox, drink water. Water won't quench fire. Fire won't burn stick. Stick won't beat dog. Dog won't bite pig. Pig won't go. I see by the moonlight it's long past midnight. Time pig and I were home an hour and a half ago. But the ox would not. So the old woman turned around and saw a butcher, and she said, Butcher, butcher, kill ox. Ox won't drink water. Water won't quench fire. Fire won't burn stick. Stick won't beat dog. Dog won't bite pig. Pig won't go. I see by the moonlight it's long past midnight. Time pig and I were home an hour and a half ago. But the butcher would not. So the old woman took a rope out of her pocket and said, Rope, rope, hang butcher. Butcher won't kill ox. Ox won't drink water. Water won't quench fire. Fire won't burn stick. Stick won't beat dog. Dog won't bite pig. Pig won't go. I see by the moonlight it's long past midnight. Time pig and I were home an hour and a half ago. But the rope would not. Just then a large brown mouse ran across the meadow, and she said, Mouse, mouse, gnaw rope. Rope won't hang butcher. Butcher won't kill ox. Ox won't drink water. Water won't quench fire. Fire won't burn stick. Stick won't beat dog. Dog won't bite pig. Pig won't go. I see by the moonlight it's long past midnight. Time pig and I were home an hour and a half ago. Yes, said the mouse. I will if you give me some cheese. So the old woman put her hand in her pocket and found a nice piece of cheese, and when the mouse had eaten it, the mouse began to gnaw the rope, the rope began to hang the butcher, the butcher began to kill the ox, the ox began to drink the water, the water began to quench the fire, the fire began to burn the stick, the stick began to beat the dog, the dog began to bite the pig, and the pig began to go. But what time the old woman and her pig got home, you nor I nor nobody knows. End of chapter 64 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 65 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 65. The Story of the Three Little Pigs. There was once an old sow with three little pigs, and as she had not enough to keep them, she sent them out to seek their fortune. The first that went off met a man with a bundle of straw, and said to him, Please, man, give me that straw to build me a house. Which the man did, and the little pig built a house with it. Presently came along a wolf, and knocked at the door, and said, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. To which the pig answered, No, no, by the hair of my chinny-chin-chin. Chin. And the wolf then answered to that, Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house in. So he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in and ate up the little pig. The second little pig met a man with a bundle of furs and said, Please, man, give me that furs to build a house. 
which the man did, and the pig built his house. Then along came the wolf and said, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. No, no, by the hair of my chinny-chin-chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. So he huffed and he puffed and he puffed and he huffed, and at last he blew the house down, and he ate up the little pig. The third little pig met a man with a load of bricks and said, Please, man, give me those bricks to build a house with. So the man gave him the bricks, and he built his house with them. Then the wolf came, as he did with the other little pigs, and said, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. No, no, by the hair on my chinny-chin-chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. Well, he huffed and he puffed, and he huffed and he puffed, and he puffed and he huffed, but he could not get the house down. When he found that he could not, with all his huffing and puffing, blow the house down, he said, Little pig, I know where there is a nice field of turnips. Where, said the little pig. Oh, in Mr. Smith's home field, and if you will be ready tomorrow morning, I will call for you, and we will go together and get some for dinner. Very well, said the little pig, I will be ready. What time do you mean to go? Oh, at six o'clock. Well, the little pig got up at five and got the turnips before the wolf came, which he did about six, when he said, Little pig, are you ready? The little pig said, Ready? I have been there and come back again and got a nice potful for dinner. The wolf felt very angry at this, but thought that he would be even with the little pig somehow or other. So he said, Little pig, I know where there is a nice apple tree. Where? said the pig. Down at Merry Garden, replied the wolf, and if you will not deceive me, I will come for you at five o'clock tomorrow and get some apples. Well, the little pig bustled up the next morning at four o'clock and went off for the apples, hoping to get back before the wolf came, but he had farther to go and had to climb the tree, so that just as he was scrambling down from it, he saw the wolf coming, which, as you may suppose, frightened him very much. When the wolf came up, he said, Little pig, what, are you here before me? Are they nice apples? Yes, very, said the little pig. I will throw you down one. And he threw it so far that while the wolf was gone to pick it up, the little pig jumped down and ran home. The next day the wolf came again and said to the little pig, Little pig, there is a fair at Shanklin this afternoon. Will you go? Oh, yes, said the pig. I will go. What time shall you be ready? At three, said the wolf. So the little pig went off before the time, as usual, and got to the fair, and bought a butter churn, which he was going home with when he saw the wolf coming. Then he could not tell what to do. So he got into the churn to hide, and by doing so it turned round and rolled down the hill with him inside, which frightened the wolf so much that he ran home without going to the fair. He went to the little pig's house and told him how frightened he had been by a great round thing which came down the hill past him. Then the little pig said, Ha! Ah, I frightened you then. I had been to the fair and bought a butter churn, and when I saw you I got into it and rolled down the hill. Then the wolf was very angry indeed, and declared he would eat up the little pig, and that he would get down the chimney after him. When the little pig saw what he was about, he hung on the pot full of water, and made up a blazing fire, and just as a wolf was coming down, took off the cover, and in fell the wolf. So the little pig put on the cover again in an instant, boiled him up and ate him for supper, and lived happily ever afterward. End of chapter 65 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 66 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan Chapter 66 The Three Sillies Once upon a time there was a farmer and his wife who had one daughter, and she was courted by a gentleman. Every evening he used to come and see her, and stop to supper at the farmhouse, and the daughter used to be sent down into the cellar to draw the beer for supper. So one evening she had gone down to draw the beer, and she happened to look up at the ceiling while she was drawing, and she saw a mallet stuck in one of the beams. It must have been there a long, long time, but somehow or other she had never noticed it before, and she began thinking, and she thought it was very dangerous to have that mallet there, for she said to herself, 
Suppose him and me was to be married, and we was to have a son, and he was to grow up to be a man, and come down into the cellar to draw the beer, like as I'm doing now, and the mallet was to fall on his head and kill him. What a dreadful thing it would be! And she put down the candle and the jug, and sat herself down and began a-crying. Well, they began to wonder upstairs how it was that she was so long drawing the beer, and her mother went down to see after her, and she found her sitting on the settle, crying, and the beer running over the floor. Why, whatever is the matter, said her mother. Oh, mother, says she, look at that horrid mallet. Suppose we was to be married, and was to have a son, and he was to grow up, and was to come down to the cellar to draw the beer, and the mallet was to fall on his head and kill him. What a dreadful thing it would be! Dear, dear, what a dreadful thing it would be, said the mother, and she sat down aside of the daughter and started a-crying too. Then after a bit the father began to wonder that they didn't come back, and he went down into the cellar to look after them himself, and there they too sat a-crying, and the beer running all over the floor. Whatever is the matter, says he. Why, says the mother, look at that horrid mallet. Just suppose if our daughter and her sweetheart was to be married, and was to have a son, and he was to grow up, and was to come down into the cellar to draw the beer, and the mallet was to fall on his head and kill him, what a dreadful thing it would be. Dear, 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 so it would, said the father, and he sat himself down aside the other two, and started a-crying. Now the gentleman got tired of stopping up in the kitchen by himself, and at last he went down into the cellar, too, to see what they were after, and there they three sat a-crying side by side, and the beer running all over the floor. And he ran straight and turned the tap. Then he said, Whatever are you three doing, sitting there crying and letting the beer run all over the floor? Oh, says the father, look at that horrid mallet. Suppose you and our daughter was to be married, and was to have a son, and he was to grow up, and was to come down into the cellar to draw the beer, and the mallet was to fall on his head and kill him. And then they all started a-crying worse than before. But the gentleman burst out a-laughing, and reached up and pulled out the mallet, and then he said, I've travelled many miles, and I never met three such big sillies as you three before, and now I shall start out on my travels again, and when I can find three bigger sillies than you three, then I'll come back and marry your daughter. So he wished them good-bye and started off on his travels, and left them all crying because the girl had lost her sweetheart. Well, he set out, and he travelled a long way, and at last he came to a woman's cottage that had some grass growing on the roof, and the woman was trying to get her cow to go up a ladder to the grass, and the poor thing durnt not go. So the gentleman asked the woman what she was doing. Why, look, he, she said, look at all that beautiful grass. I'm going to get the cow on to the roof to eat it. She'll be quite safe, for I shall tie a string round her neck and pass it down the chimney and tie it to my wrist as I go about the house, so she can't fall off without my knowing it. Oh, you poor silly, said the gentleman, you should cut the grass and throw it down to the cow. But the woman thought it was easier to get the cow up the ladder than to get the grass down, so she pushed her and coaxed her and got her up and tied a string round her neck and passed it down the chimney and fastened it to her own wrist. And the gentleman went on his way, but he hadn't gone far when the cow tumbled off the roof and hung by the string tied around her neck, and it strangled her. And the weight of the cow, tied to her wrist, pulled the woman up the chimney, and she stuck fast halfway and was smothered in the soot. Well, that was one big silly. And the gentleman went on and on, and he went to an inn to stop the night, and they were so full at the inn that they had to put him in a double-bedded room and another traveller was to sleep in the other bed. The other man was a very pleasant fellow, and they got very friendly together, but in the morning, when they were both getting up, the gentleman was surprised to see the other hang his trousers on the knobs of the chest of drawers, and run across the room and try to jump into them, and he tried over and over again, and couldn't manage it, and the gentleman wondered whatever he was doing it for. At last he stopped and wiped his face with his handkerchief. Oh dear, he says, I do think trousers are the most awkwardest kind of clothes that ever were. I can't think who could have invented such things. It takes me the best part of an hour to get into mine every morning, and I got so hot. How do you manage yours? So the gentleman burst out a-laughing and showed him how to put them on, and he was very much obliged to him, and said he never should have thought of doing it that way. 
so that was another big silly. Then the gentleman went on his travels again, and he came to a village, and outside the village there was a pond, and round the pond was a crowd of people, and they had got rakes and brooms and pitchforks reaching into the pond, and the gentleman asked what was the matter. Why, they said, matter enough, moon's tumbled into the pond, and we can't rake her out anyhow. So the gentleman burst out a-laughing, and told them to look up into the sky, and that it was only the shadow in the water. But they wouldn't listen to him, and abused him shamefully, and he got away as quick as he could. So there was a whole lot of sillies, bigger than those three sillies at home. So the gentleman turned back home again, and married the farmer's daughter, and if they didn't live happily for ever after, that's nothing to do with you or me. End of chapter 66 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 67 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 67 The Cat and the Mouse the cat and the mouse played in the malt house. The cat bit the mouse's tail off. Pray, puss, said the mouse, give me my long tail again. No, said the cat, I'll not give you your tail again till you go to the cow and fetch me some milk. First she leaped and then she ran till she came to the cow and thus began. Pray, cow, give me some milk that I may give to the cat so she may give me my long tail again. No, said the cow, I will give you no milk till you go to the farmer and get me some hay. First she leaped and then she ran, till she came to the farmer and thus began. Pray, farmer, give me some hay that I may give to the cow, so she may give me some milk that I may give to the cat, so she may give me my long tail again. No, said the farmer, I will give you no hay till you go to the butcher and fetch me some meat. First she leaped and then she ran, till she came to the butcher and thus began. Pray, butcher, give me some meat, that I may give to the farmer, so he may give me some hay, that I may give to the cow, so she may give me some milk, that I may give to the cat, so she may give me my long tail again. No, said the butcher, I will give you no meat, till you go to the baker and fetch me some bread. First she leaped, and then she ran, till she came to the baker, and thus began. Pray, baker, give me some bread, that I may give to the butcher, so he may give me some meat, that I may give to the farmer, so he may give me some hay, that I may give to the cow, so she may give me some milk, that I may give to the cat, so she may give me my long tail again. Yes, said the baker, I'll give you some bread, but if you eat my meal, I'll cut off your head. The baker gave the mouse bread, which she brought to the butcher. The butcher gave the mouse meat, which she brought to the farmer. The farmer gave the mouse hay, which she brought to the cow. The cow gave the mouse milk, which she brought to the cat. And the cat gave the mouse her long tail again. End of chapter 67 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 68 of Tales of Laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Hereafter This Once upon a time there was a farmer called Jan, and he lived all alone by himself in a little farmhouse. By and by he thought that he would like to have a wife to keep it all vitty for him. So he went a courting a fine maid, and he said to her, Will you marry me? That I will, to be sure, said she. So they went to church and were wed. After the wedding was over, she got up on his horse behind him, and he brought her home, and they lived as happy as the day was long. One day Jan said to his wife, Wife, can you milk ye? Oh, yes, Jan, I can milk ye. Mother used to milk ye when I lived home. So he went to market and bought her ten red cows. All went well till one day when she had driven them to the pond to drink. She thought they did not drink fast enough 
so she drove them right into the pond to make them drink faster and they were all drowned when jan came home she up and told him what she had done and he said oh well there never mind my dear better luck next time so they went on for a bit and then one day jan said to his wife wife can you serve pigs oh yes jan i can serve pigs mother used to serve pigs when i lived home so jan went to market and brought her some pigs all went well till one day when she had put their food into the trough she thought they did not eat fast enough and she pushed their heads into the trough to make them eat faster and they were all choked when jan came home she upped and told him what she had done and he said oh well there never mind my dear better luck next time so they went on for a bit and then one day jan said to his wife wife can you bake ye oh yes jan i can bake ye mother used to bake ye when i lived home so he brought everything for his wife so that she could bake bread all went well for a bit till one day she thought she would bake white bread for a treat for jan so she carried her meal to the top of a high hill and let the wind blow on it for she thought to herself that the wind would blow out all the bran but the wind blew away meal and bran and all so there was an end of it when jan came home she upped and told him what she had done and he said oh well there never mind my dear better luck next time so they went on for a bit and then one day jan said to his wife wife can you brew ye oh yes jan i can brew ye mother used to brew ye when i lived home so he brought everything proper for his wife to brew ale with all went well for a bit till one day when she had brewed her ale and put it in the barrel a big black dog came in and looked up in her face she drove him out of the house but he stayed outside the door and still looked up in her face and she got so angry that she pulled out the plug of the barrel threw it at the dog and said what dost look at me for i be jan's wife then the dog ran down the road and she ran after him to chase him right away when she came back again she found that the ale had all run out of the barrel and so there was an end of it when jan came home she up and told him what she had done and he said oh well there never mind my dear better luck next time so they went on for a bit and then one day she thought to herself tis time to clean my house when she was taking down her big bed she found a bag of groats on the tester so when jan came home she upped and said to him jan what is the bag of groats on the tester for that is for here after this my dear now there was a robber outside the window and he heard what jan said next day he waited till jan had gone to market and then he came and knocked at the door what do you please to want said molly i am here after this said the robber i have come for the bag of groats now the robber was dressed like a fine gentleman so she thought to herself it was very kind of so fine a man to come for the bag of groats so she ran upstairs and fetched the bag of groats and gave it to the robber and he went away with it when jan came home she said to him jan here after this has been for the bag of groats what do you mean wife said jan so she upped and told him and he said then i'm a ruined man for the money was to pay our rent with the only thing we can do is to roam the world over till we find the bag of groats then jan took the house door off its hinges that's all we shall have to lie on he said so jan put the door on his back 
and they both set out to look for hereafter this many a long day they went and in the night jan used to put the door on the branches of a tree and they would sleep on it one night they came to a big hill and there was a high tree at the foot so jan put the door up in it and they got up in the tree and went to sleep by and by jan's wife heard a noise and she looked to see what it was it was an opening of a door on the side of the hill out came two gentlemen with a long table and behind them fine ladies and lords each carrying a bag and one of them was hereafter this with the bag of groats they sat round the table and began to drink and talk and count up all the money in the bags so then jan's wife woke him up and asked what they should do now's our time said jan and he pushed the door off the branches and it fell right in the very middle of the table and frightened the robbers so that they all ran away then jan and his wife got down from the tree took as many money bags as they could carry on the door and went straight home and jan brought his wife more cows and more pigs and they lived happily ever after end of chapter sixty eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter sixty nine of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Pat Mathewson, England. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 69 Titty Mouse and Tatty Mouse. Titty Mouse and Tatty Mouse both lived in a house. Titty Mouse went to leasing and Tatty Mouse went to leasing. So they both went to leasing. Titty Mouse leased an ear of corn and Tatty Mouse leased an ear of corn. So they both leased an ear of corn. Titty Mouse made a pudding, and Tatty Mouse made a pudding. So they both made a pudding. And Tatty Mouse put her pudding into the pot to boil. But when Titty went to put hers in, the pot tumbled over and scalded her to death. When Tatty sat down and wept, and a three-legged stool said, Tatty, why do you weep? Titty's dead said tatty and so i weep then said the stool i'll hop so the stool hopped then a broom in the corner of the room said stool why do you hop oh said the stool titty's dead and tatty weeps and so i hop then said the broom i'll sweep so the broom began to sweep then said the door broom why do you sweep oh said the broom Titty's dead, and Tatty weeps, and the stool hops, and so I sweep. Then said the door, I'll jar. So the door jarred. Then said the window, Door, why do you jar? Oh, said the door, Titty's dead, and Tatty weeps, and the stool hops, and the broom sweeps, and so I jar. Then said the window, I'll creak. So the window creaked. Now there was an old form outside the house, and when the window creaked, the form said, Window, why do you creak? Oh, said the window, Titty's dead, and Tatty weeps, and the stool hops, and the broom sweeps, the door jars, and so I creak. Then said the old form, I'll run round the house. Then the old form ran round the house. Now there was a fine, large walnut tree growing by the cottage, and the tree said to the form, form why do you run round the house oh said the form titty's dead and tatty weeps and the stool hops and the broom sweeps the door jars and the window creaks and so i run round the house then said the walnut tree i'll shed my leaves so the walnut tree shed all its beautiful green leaves now there was a little bird perched on one of the boughs of the tree and when all the leaves fell it said walnut tree why do you shed your leaves? 
Oh, said the tree, Titty's dead, and Tatty weeps. The stool hops, and the broom sweeps. The door jars, and the window creaks. The old form runs round the house, and so I shed my leaves. Then said the little bird, I'll moult all my feathers. So he moulted all his pretty feathers. Now there was a little girl walking below, carrying a jug of milk for her brothers and sisters' supper. And when she saw the poor little bird moult all its feathers, she said, Little bird, why do you moult all your feathers? Oh, said the little bird, Titty's dead and Tatty weeps, the stool hops and the broom sweeps, the door jars and the window creaks, the old form runs round the house, the walnut tree sheds its leaves, and so I moult all my feathers. Then said the little girl, I'll spill the milk. So she dropped the pitcher and spilt the milk. Now there was an old man just by on the top of a ladder, thatching a rick. When he saw the little girl spill the milk, he said, Little girl, what do you mean by spilling the milk? Your little brothers and sisters must go without their supper. Then said the little girl, Titty's dead and Tatty weeps. The stool hops and the broom sweeps. The door jars and the window creaks. The old form runs round the house. The walnut tree sheds all its leaves. The little bird moults all its feathers and so I spill the milk. Oh, said the old man, then I'll tumble off the ladder and break my neck. So he tumbled off the ladder and broke his neck, and when the old man broke his neck, the great walnut tree fell down with a crash and upset the old form and house, and the house falling knocked the window out, and the window knocked the door down, and the door upset the broom, and the broom upset the stool, and poor little Tatty Mouse was buried beneath the ruins. End of chapter 69「Chapter Seventy of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Seventy. The Magpie's Nest. Once upon a time, all the birds of the air came to the magpie and asked her to teach them how to build nests for the magpie is the cleverest of all at building. So she put them all around her and began to show them how to do it. First of all, she took some mud and made a sort of round cake with it. Oh, that's how it's done, said the thrush. And away he flew, and so that's how thrushes build their nests. Then the magpie took some twigs and arranged them around the mud. Now I know all about it, said the blackbird, and off he flew, and that's how blackbirds make their nests to this very day. Then the magpie put another layer of mud over the twigs. Oh, that's quite obvious, said the wise owl, and away he flew, and owls have never made better nests since. After this, the magpie took some twigs and twined them around the outside. The very thing, said the sparrow, and off he went, so sparrows make rather slovenly nests to this day. Well, then Madge Magpie took some feathers and stuffed and lined the nest very comfortably with it. That suits me, cried the starling, and off he flew, and very comfortable nests have starlings. So it went on, every bird taking away some knowledge of how to build nests, but none of them waiting to the end. Meanwhile, Madge Magpie went on working and working without looking up, till the only bird that remained was the turtle dove, and that hadn't paid any attention all along, but only kept on saying its silly cry, Take two, Taffy, take two, oo, oo. At last the magpie heard this, just as she was putting a twig across. So she said, One's enough. But the turtle dove kept on saying, Take two, Taffy, take two. Then the magpie grew angry and said, One's enough, I tell you. Still the turtle dove cried, Take two, Taffy, take two. At last and at last the magpie looked up and saw nobody near her but the silly turtle dove, and then she grew very angry and refused to teach any more. And that is why all the birds build their nests in different ways up to this day. Each one made off, you see, as soon as he thought he had learned the magpie's secret, and each is perfectly contented with his own way. End of chapter 70. Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter 71 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Scrapefoot. Once upon a time there were three bears who lived in a castle in a great wood. One of them was a great big bear, and one was a middling bear, and one was a little bear. And in the same wood there was a fox who lived all alone. His name was Scrapefoot. Scrapefoot was very much afraid of the bears, but for all that he wanted very much to know about them. And one day as he went through the wood he found himself near the bear's castle, and he wondered whether he could get into the castle. He looked all about him everywhere, and he could not see anyone. So he came on very quietly, till at last he came up to the door of the castle, and he tried whether he could open it. Yes, the door was not locked, and he opened it just a little way, and put his nose in and looked, and he could not see anyone. So then he opened it a little way farther, and put one paw in, then another paw, and another, and another, and then he was all in the bear's castle. He found he was in a great hall with three chairs in it, one big, one middling, and one little chair, and he thought he would like to sit down and rest and look about him. So he sat down on the big chair. But he found it so hard and uncomfortable that it made his bones ache, and he jumped down at once and got into the middling chair, and he turned round and round in it, but he couldn't make himself comfortable. So then he went to the little chair and sat down in it, and it was so soft and warm and comfortable that Scrapefoot was quite happy. But all at once it broke into pieces under him, and he couldn't put it together again. So he got up and began to look about him again, and on one table he saw three saucers, of which one was very big, one was middling, and one was quite a little saucer. Scrapefoot was very thirsty, and he began to drink out of the big saucer. But he only just tasted the milk in the big saucer, which was so sour and so horrid that he would not taste another drop of it. Then he tried the middling saucer, and he drank a little of that. He tried two or three mouthfuls, but it was not nice, and then he left it and went to the little saucer, and the milk in the little saucer was so sweet and so nice that he went on drinking it till it was all gone. Then Scrapefoot thought he would like to go upstairs and he listened and he could not hear anyone. So upstairs he went, and he found a great room with three beds in it. One was a big bed, one was a middling bed, and one was a little white bed. And he climbed into the big bed, but it was so hard and lumpy and uncomfortable that he jumped down again at once and tried the middling bed. That was rather better, but he could not lie comfortably in it. So after turning about a little while, he got up and went to the little bed, and that was so soft and so warm and so nice that he fell fast asleep at once. And after a time the bears came home, and when they got into the hall the big bear went to his chair and said, Who's been sitting in my chair? And the middling bear said, Who's been sitting in my chair? And the little bear said, Who's been sitting in my chair and has broken it all to pieces? And then they went to have their milk, and the big bear said, Who's been drinking my milk? And the middling bear said, Who's been drinking my milk? And the little bear said, Who's been drinking my milk and has drunk it all up? Then they went upstairs into the bedroom, and the big bear said, Who's been sleeping in my bed? And the middling bear said, Who's been sleeping in my bed? And the little bear said, Who's been sleeping in my bed? And see, here he is. So then the bears came and wondered what they should do with him. And the big bear said, Let's hang him. And then the middling bear said, Let's drown him. And then the little bear said, Let's throw him out the window. And then the bears took him to the window, and the big bear took two legs on one side, and the middling bear took two legs on the other side, and they swung him backward and forward backward and forward, and out of the window. Poor Scrapefoot was so frightened, and he thought every bone in his body must be broken. But he got up, and first shook one leg. No, that was not broken. And then another, and that was not broken. 
and another and another, and then he wagged his tail and found there were no bones broken. So then he galloped off home as fast as he could go, and never went near the bear's castle again. End of chapter 71「Chapter seventy two Tales of Laughter by Wiggins and Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wise Men of Gotham of Bind Sheep. There were two men of Gotham, and one of them was going to market to Nottingham to buy sheep, and the other came from the market, and they both met together upon Nottingham Bridge. "'Where are you going?' said the one who came from Nottingham. "'Mary,' said he that was going to Nottingham, "'I am going to buy sheep.' "'Buy sheep?' said the other. "'And which way will you bring them home?' "'Mary,' said the other, "'I will bring them over this bridge.' "'By Robin Hood,' said he that came from Nottingham, "'but thou shalt not.' "'By Maid Marian,' said he that was going thither, "'but I will.' "'You will not,' said the one. "'I will.' "'Then they beat their staves against the ground, "'one against the other as if there'd been a hundred sheep between them. "'Hold in,' said one. Beware, lest my sheep leap over the bridge. I care not, said the other. They shall not come this way. But they shall, said the other. Then the other said, If that thou make much to do, I will put my fingers in thy mouth. Will you, said the other. Now, as they were at their contention, Another man of Gotham came from the market with a sack of meal upon a horse, and seeing and hearing his neighbors at strife about sheep, though there were none between them, said, Ah, fools, will you ever learn wisdom? Help me, and lay my sack upon my shoulders. They did so, and he went to the side of the bridge, unloosened the mouth of the sack, and shook all his meal out into the river. Now, neighbors, he said, how much meal is there in my sack? Mary, they said, there is none at all. Now, by my faith, said he, even as much wit as is in your two heads to stir up strife about a thing you have not. Which was the wisest of these three persons? Judge yourself. Of Hedging a Cuckoo Once upon a time, the men of Gotham would have kept the cuckoo, so that she might sing all the year, and in the midst of their town they made a hedge round in compass, and they got a cuckoo, and put her into it, and said, Sing there all through the year, or thou shalt have neither meat nor water. The cuckoo, as soon as she perceived herself within the hedge, flew away. A vengeance on her, said they. We did not make our hedge high enough. Of Sending Cheeses There was a man of Gotham who went to the market at Nottingham to sell cheese. And, as he was going down the hill to Nottingham Bridge, one of his cheeses fell out of his wallet and rolled down the hill. Ach, gaffer, said the fellow, can you run into market alone? I will send one after another after you. Then he laid down his wallet and took out the cheeses and rolled them down the hill. Some went into one bush and some went into another. I charge you all to meet me near the market place, cried he, and when the fellow came to the market to meet his cheeses, he stayed there till the market was nearly done. Then he went about to inquire of his friends and neighbors and other men if they did see his cheeses come to the market. Who should bring them? 
said one of the market men. Marry themselves, said the fellow. They know the way well enough, he said. A vengeance on them all. I did fear to see them run so fast that they would run beyond the market, and am now fully persuaded that they must now be almost at York, whereupon he forthwith hired a horse to ride to York, to seek his cheeses where they were not. But to this day no man can tell him of his cheeses. Of Drowning Eels When Good Friday came, the men of Gotham cast their heads together what to do with their white herrings, their red herrings, their sprats, and other salt fish. One consulted with the other, and agreed that such fish should be cast into their pond, which was in the middle of the town, that they might breed against the next year, and every man that had salt fish left cast them into the pool. I have many white herrings, said one. I have many sprats, said another. I have many red herrings, said the other. I have much salt fish. Let all go into the pond or pool, and we shall fare like lords next year. At the beginning of next year following, the men drew near the pond to have their fish, and there was nothing but a great eel. Ah, said they all, a mischief on this eel, for he has eaten up all our fish. What shall we do to him? said one to the other. Kill him, said one. Chop him into pieces, said another. Not so, said another. Let us drown him. Be it so, said all. And they went to another pond and cast the eel into the pond. Lie there and shift for yourself, for no help thou shalt have from us. And they left the eel to drown. Of Sending Rent Once on a time the men of Gotham had forgotten to pay their landlord. One said to the other, Tomorrow is our payday, and what shall we find to send our money to our landlord? The one said, This day I have caught a hare and he shall carry it, for he is light of foot. Be it so, said all. He shall have a letter and a purse to put our money in, and we shall direct him the right way. So, when the letters were written and the money put in a purse, they tied it around the hare's neck, saying, First you go to Lancaster, then thou must go to Lochborough, and Newark is our landlord and commend us to him, and there is his dues. The hare, as soon as he was out of their hands, ran on along the country way. Some cried, Thou must go to Lancaster first. Let the hare alone, said another. He can tell a nearer way than the best of us all. Let him go. Another said, It's a subtle hare. Let her alone. She will not keep the highway for fear of dogs of counting. On a certain time there were twelve men of Gotham who went fishing, and some went into the water, and some on dry ground. And as they were coming back, one of them said, We have ventured much this day wading. I pray God that none of us that did come from home be drowned. Mary, said one, let us see about that. Twelve of us came out, and every man did count eleven, and the twelfth man never did count himself. Alas, said one to the other, one of us is drowned. They went back to the brook where they had been fishing, and looked up and down for him that was drowned, and made great lamentation. A courtier came riding by, and he did ask what they were seeking, and why they were so sorrowful. Oh! said they. This day we came to fish in this brook, and there were twelve of us, and one is drowned. Why, said the courtier, count me how many of you there be. And one counted eleven, and did not count himself. Well, said the courtier, what will you give me if I find the twelfth man? Sir, said they, 
all the money we have. Give me the money, said the courtier, and he began with the first, and gave him a whack over the shoulders that he groaned, and said, There is one. And he served all of them that they groaned. But when he came to the last, he gave him a good blow, saying, Here is the twelfth man. God bless you on your heart, said all the company. You have found our neighbor. End of chapter 72、Chapter、73 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 73 Henny Penny. One day Henny Penny was picking up corn in the cornyard when, whack, something hit her upon the head. Goodness gracious me, said Henny Penny, the skies are going to fall. I must go and tell the king. So she went along and she went along and she went along till she met Cocky Locky. Where are you going, Henny Penny? says Cocky Locky. Oh, I'm going to tell the king the skies are falling, says Henny Penny. May I come with you? says Cocky Locky. Certainly, says Henny Penny. So Henny Penny and Cocky Locky went to tell the king the sky was falling. They went along and they went along and they went along till they met Ducky Daddles. Where are you going to, Henny Penny and Cocky Locky? says Ducky Daddles. Oh, we're going to tell the king the skies are falling, says Henny Penny and Cocky Locky. May I come with you? says Ducky Daddles. Certainly, says Henny Penny and Cocky Locky. So Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, and Ducky Daddles went to tell the king the sky was a falling. So they went along and they went along and they went along till they met Goosey Poosey. Where are you going to, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, and Ducky Daddles? says Goosey Poosey. Oh, we're going to tell the king the sky's a falling, says Henny Penny and Cocky Locky and Ducky Daddles. May I come with you, says Goosey Poosey? Certainly, says Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, and Ducky Daddles. So Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Poosey went to tell the king the sky was a falling. So they went along and they went along and they went along till they met Turkey Lurkey. Where are you going, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Poosey? says Turkey Lurkey. Oh, we're going to tell the king the sky's a falling, says Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Poosey. May I come with you, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Poosey? says Turkey Lurkey. Oh, certainly, Turkey Lurkey, says Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Poosey. So Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey all went to tell the king the sky was a falling. So they went along and they went along and they went along till they met Foxy Woxy, and Foxy Woxy says to Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey, Where are you going, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey? And Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey says to Foxy Woxy, We're going to tell the king the skies are falling. Oh, but this is not the way to the king, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey says Foxy Woxy. I know the proper way. Shall I show it you? Oh, certainly, Foxy Woxy says Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey. So Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, Turkey Lurkey, and Foxy Woxy all went to tell the king the sky was a falling. So they went along and they went along and they went along till they came to a narrow and dark hole. Now this was the door of Foxy Woxy's cave, but Foxy Woxy says to Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey, This is a short way to the king's palace. You'll soon get there if you follow me. I will go first, and you come after, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey. Why, of course, certainly, without doubt, why not, says Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey. So Foxy Woxy went into his cave and didn't go very far, but turned round to wait for Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Poosey, and Turkey Lurkey. 
So at last Turkey Lurkey went through the dark hole into the cave. He hadn't got far when, Hoof! Foxy Woxy snapped off Turkey Lurkey's head and threw his body over his left shoulder. Then Goosey Pussy went in and, Hoof! Off went her head and Goosey Pussy was thrown beside Turkey Lurkey. Then Ducky Daddles waddled down and, Hoof! snapped Foxy Woxy and Ducky Daddles head was off and Ducky Daddles was thrown alongside Turkey Lurkey and Goosey Pussy. Then Cocky Locky strutted down into the cave, and he hadn't gone far when, snap, hrumph, went Foxy Woxy, and Cocky Locky was thrown alongside of Turkey Lurkey, Goosey Pussy, and Ducky Daddles. But Foxy Woxy had made two bites at Cocky Locky, and when the first snap only hurt Cocky Locky, but didn't kill him, he called out to Henny Penny. So she turned tail and off she ran home, and she never told the king the sky was a-falling. End of chapter 73. Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter 74 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Hill. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 74 A Son of Adam A man was working one day. It was very hot, and he was digging. By and by he stopped to rest and wipe his face, and he grew very angry to think he had to work so hard just because of Adam's sin. So he complained bitterly, and said some very hard words about Adam. It happened that his master heard him, and he asked, Why do you blame Adam? You'd ha' done just like Adam, if you'd ha' been in his place. No, I shouldn't, says the man. I should ha' known better. Well, I'll try you, says his master. Come to me at dinner time. So come dinner time, the man came and his master took him into a room where the table was a set with good things of all sorts, and he said, Now you can eat as much as ever you like from any of the dishes on the table, but don't touch the covered dish in the middle till I come back. And with that the master went out of the room and left the man there all by himself. So the man began to taste some of this dish and some of that, and enjoyed himself finely. But after a while, as his master didn't come back, he began to look at the covered dish, and to wonder whatever was in it. And he wondered more and more, and he says to himself, It must be something very nice. Why shouldn't I just look at it? I won't touch it. There can't be any harm in just peeping. So at last he could hold back no longer, and he lifted up the cover a tiny bit, but he couldn't see anything. Then he lifted it up a bit more, and out popped a mouse. The man tried to catch it, but it ran away and jumped off the table, and he ran after it. It ran first into one corner, and then, just as he thought he'd got it, into another, and under the table, and all about the room. And the man made such a clatter, jumping and banging and running round after the mouse, a trying to catch it, that at last his master came in. Ah, he said, never you blame Adam again, my man. End of chapter 74 Chapter 75 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. The Happy Family The largest green leaf in the country is certainly the burdock leaf. If you hold it in front of you, it is large enough for an apron, and if you hold it over your head, 
it is almost as good as an umbrella it is so wonderfully large a burdock never grows alone where it grows there are many more and it is a splendid sight and all this splendor is good for snails grand people in olden times used to have the great white snails made into fricassees and when they had eaten them they would say oh what a delicious dish for these people really thought them good such snails lived on burdock leaves and for them the burdock was planted there was once an old estate where no one now lived to require snails indeed the owners had all died out but the burdock still flourished it grew over all the beds and walks of the garden its growth had no check till it became at last quite a forest of burdocks here and there stood an apple or plum tree but for this nobody would have thought the place had ever been a garden it was burdock from one end to the other and here lived the last two surviving snails they knew not themselves how old they were but they could remember the time when there were a great many more of them and that they were descended from a family which came from foreign lands and that the whole forest had been planted for them and theirs they had never been away from the garden but they knew that another place once existed in the world called the duke's palace castle in which some of their relations had been boiled till they became black and were then laid on a silver dish but what was done afterward they did not know besides they could not imagine exactly how it felt to be boiled and placed on a silver dish but no doubt it was something very fine and highly genteel neither the cockchafer nor the toad nor the earthworm whom they questioned about it could give them the least information for none of their relations had ever been cooked or served on a silver dish the old white snails were the most aristocratic race in the world they knew that the forest had been planted for them and the nobleman's castle had been built solely that they might be cooked and laid on silver dishes they lived quite retired and very happily and as they had no children of their own they had adopted a little common snail which they brought up as their own child the little one would not grow for he was only a common snail but the old people particularly the mother snail declared that she could easily see how he grew and when the father said he could not perceive it she begged him to feel the little snail's shell and he did so and found that the mother was right one day it rained very fast listen when a drumming there is on the burdock leaves tum 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 said the father snail there come the drops said the mother they are trickling down the stalks we shall have it very wet here presently i am very glad we have such good houses and that the little one has one of his own there has been really more done for us than for any other creature it is quite plain that we are the most noble people in the world we have houses from our birth and the burdock forest has been planted for us i should very much like to know how far it extends and what lies beyond it there can be nothing better than we have here said the father snail i wish for nothing more yes but i do said the mother i should like to be taken to the palace and boiled and laid upon a silver dish as was done to all our ancestors and you may be sure it must be something very uncommon the nobleman's castle perhaps has fallen to decay said the snail father or the burdock wood 
may have grown over it, so that those who live there cannot get out. You need not be in a hurry. You are always so impatient. And the youngster is getting just the same. He has been three days creeping to the top of that stalk. I feel quite giddy when I look at him. You must not scold him, said the mother snail. He creeps so very carefully. He will be the joy of our home, and we old folks have nothing else to live for. But have you ever thought where we are to get a wife for him? Do you think that farther out in the wood there may be others of our race? There may be black snails, no doubt, said the old snail. Black snails without houses, though, they are vulgar and conceited too. But we can give the ants a commission. They run here and there, as if they all had much business to get through. They most likely will know of a wife for our youngster. I certainly know a most beautiful bride, said one of the ants, but I fear it would not do, for she is a queen. That does not matter, said the old snail. Has she a house? She has a palace, replied the ant, a most beautiful ant palace with seven hundred passages. Thank you, said the mother snail, but our boy shall not go to live in an ant hill. If you know of nothing better, we will give the commission to the white gnats. They fly about in rain and sunshine. They know the burdock wood from one end to the other. We have a wife for him, said the gnats, a hundred man steps from here. There is a little snail with a house, sitting on a gooseberry bush. She is quite alone, and old enough to be married. It is only a hundred man steps from here. Then let her come to him, said the old people. He has the whole burdock forest. She has only a bush. So they brought the little lady snail. She took eight days to perform the journey, but that was just as it ought to be, for it showed her to be one of the right breeding. And then they had a wedding. Six glowworms gave as much light as they could, but in other respects it was all very quiet, for the old snails could not bear festivities or a crowd. But a beautiful speech was made by the mother snail. The father could not speak. He was too much overcome. Then they gave the whole burdock forest to the young snails as an inheritance, and repeated what they had so often said, that it was the finest place in the world, and that if they led upright and honorable lives, and their family increased, they and their children might some day be taken to the nobleman's palace, to be boiled black and laid on a silver dish. And when they had finished speaking, the old couple crept into their houses and came out no more, for they slept. The young snail pair now ruled in the forest and had numerous prodigy. But as the young ones were never boiled or laid in silver dishes, they concluded that the castle had fallen into decay, and that all the people in the world were dead, and as nobody contradicted them, they thought they might be right. And the rain fell upon the burdock leaves, to play the drum for them, and the sun shone to paint colors on the burdock forest for them, and they were very happy. The whole family was entirely and perfectly happy. Hans Christian Andersen End of chapter 75 Recording by Linda Bree Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 76 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggins. The Blind Man, the Deaf Man, and the Donkey. A blind man and a deaf man once entered into a partnership. The deaf man was to see for the blind man, and the blind man was to hear for the deaf man. One day both went to a notch together. The deaf man said, The dancing is very good, but the music is not worth listening to. And the blind man said, On the contrary, I think the music is very good, but the dancing is not worth looking at. Musical and Dancing Entertainment After this day they went together for a walk in the jungle and there found a dobie's donkey that had strayed away from its owner and a great big chatty such as a dobie's boil clothes in which the donkey was carrying with him the deaf man said to the blind man brother here are a donkey and a dobie's great big chatty with nobody to own them let us take them with us they may be useful to us some day. Very well, said the blind man. We will take them with us. So the blind man and the deaf man went on their way, taking the donkey and the great big chatty with them. A little farther on they came to an ant's nest, and the deaf man said to the blind man, Here are a number of very fine black ants much larger than i ever saw before let us take some of them home to show our friends very well answered the blind man we will take them as a present to our friends so the deaf man took a silver snuff-box out of his pocket and put four or five of the finest black ants into it which done they continued their journey but before they had gone very far, a terrible storm came on. It thundered and lightened and rained and blew with such a fury that it seemed as if the whole heavens and earth were at war. Oh dear, oh dear, cried the deaf man, how dreadful this lightning is. Let us make haste and get to some place of shelter. I don't see that it's dreadful at all answered the blind man but the thunder is very terrible we had better certainly seek some place of shelter now not far off was a lofty building which looked exactly like a fine temple the deaf man saw it and he and the blind man resolved to spend the night there and having reached the place they went in and shut the door taking the donkey and the great big chatty with them. But this building, which they mistook for a temple, was in truth no temple at all, but the house of a very powerful Rashkas. And hardly had the blind man, the deaf man, and the donkey got inside and fastened the door, than the Rashkas, who had been out, returned home, to his surprise he found the door fastened and heard people moving about inside his house ho ho cried he to himself some men have got in here have they i'll soon make mincemeat of them so he began to roar in a voice louder than the thunder and to cry let me into my house this minute you wretches let me in, let me in, I say, and to kick the door and batter it with great fists. But though his voice was very powerful, his appearance was still more alarming, insomuch that the deaf man, who was peeping at him through a chink in the wall, felt so frightened that he did not know what to do. But the blind man was very brave, because he couldn't see, and went up to the door and called out who are you and what do you mean by coming battering at the door in this way 
and at this time of night a kind of ogre i'm a rashkas answered the rashkas angrily and this is my house let me in this instant or i'll kill you all this time the deaf man who was watching the rascus was shivering and shaking in a terrible fright but the blind man was very brave because he couldn't see and he called out again oh you're a rascus are you well if you're rascus i'm bascus and bascus is as good as rascus bascus roared the rascus bascus bascus what nonsense is this there is no such creature as a bascus go away replied the blind man and don't dare to make any further disturbance lest i punish you with a vengeance for know that i'm bascus and bascus is rashkus father my father answered rashkus heavens and earth bascus and my father i never heard such an extraordinary thing in my life you my father and in there i never knew my father was called bascus yes replied the blind man go away instantly i command you for i am your father bashkus very well answered rashkus for he began to get puzzled and frightened but if you are my father let me first see your face for he thought perhaps they are deceiving me the blind man and the deaf man didn't know what to do but at last they opened the door a very tiny chink and poked the donkey's nose out when the rashkus saw it he thought to himself bless me what a terrible ugly face my father bashkus has he then called out oh father bashkus you have a very big fierce face but people have sometimes very big heads and very little bodies pray let me see your body as well as head before i go away then the blind man and the deaf man rolled the great big doby's chatty with a thundering noise past the chink in the door and the rashkus who was watching attentively was very much surprised when he saw this great black thing rolling along the floor and he thought in truth my father bashkus has a very big body as well as a big head he's big enough to eat me up altogether i'd better go away but still he could not help being a little doubtful so he cried o oh, bashkus father bashkus you have indeed got a very big head and a very big body but do before i go away let me hear you scream for all rashkus scream fearfully then the cunning deaf man who was getting less frightened pulled the silver snuff-box out of his pocket and took the black ants out of it and put one black ant in the donkey's right ear and another black ant in the donkey's left ear and another and another the ants pinched the poor donkey's ears dreadfully and the donkey was so hurt and frightened he began to bellow as loud as he could eaw 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 ah ah at this terrible noise the rashkus fled away in a great fright saying enough enough father bashkus the sound of your voice would make the most refractory obedient and no sooner had he gone then the deaf man took the ants out of the donkey's ears and he and the blind man spent the rest of the night in peace and comfort next morning the deaf man woke the blind man early saying awake brother awake here we are indeed in luck the whole floor is covered with heaps of gold and silver and precious stones and so it was for the rashkas owned a vast amount of treasure 
and the whole house was full of it. That is a good thing, said the blind man. Show me where it is, and I will help you collect it. So they collected as much treasure as possible and made four great bundles of it. The blind man took one great bundle, the deaf man took another, and putting the other two great bundles on the donkey, they started off to return home. But the Rashkus, whom they had frightened away the night before, had not gone very far off, and was waiting to see what his father, Bashkus, might look like by daylight. He saw the door of his house open and watch attentively, when walked out, only a blind man, a deaf man, and a donkey, who were all three laden with large bundles of his treasure. The blind man carried one bundle, the deaf man carried another bundle, and two bundles were on the donkey. The Rashkis was extremely angry, and immediately called six of his friends to help him kill the blind man, the deaf man, and the donkey, and recover the treasure. The deaf man saw them coming, seven great Rashkis, with hair a yard long and tusks like an elephant's, and was dreadfully frightened, but the blind man was very brave because he couldn't see, and said, Brother, why do you lag behind in that way? Oh, answered the deaf man, there are seven great Rashkas with tusks like an elephant's coming to kill us. What can we do? Let us hide the treasure in the bushes, said the blind man, and do you lead me to a tree? Then I will climb up first, and you shall climb up afterward and so we shall be out of their way. The deaf man thought this good advice, so he pushed the donkey and the bundles of the treasure into the bushes, and led the blind man to a high sopari tree that grew close by. But he was a very cunning man, this deaf man, and instead of letting the blind man climb up first and following him, he got up first and let the blind man clamber after, so that he was farther out of harm's way than his friend. When the Rashkas arrived at the place and saw them both perched out of reach in the Sopari tree, he said to his friends, Let us get on each other's shoulders. We shall then be high enough to pull them down. So one Rashkas stooped down and the second got on his shoulders and the third on his and the fourth on his and the fifth on his and the sixth on his and the seventh and the last rashkus who had invited all the others was just climbing up when the deaf man who was looking over the blind man's shoulder got so frightened that in his alarm he caught hold of his friend's arm crying they're coming they're coming the blind man was not in a very secure position and was sitting at his ease and not knowing how close the rashkas were the consequence was that when the deaf man gave him this unexpected push he lost his balance and tumbled down on to the neck of the seventh rashkas who was just then climbing up the blind man had no idea where he was but thought he had got to on to the branch of some other tree, and stretching out his hand for something to catch hold of, caught hold of the Rashka's two great ears, and pinched them very hard in his surprise and fright. The Rashka's couldn't think what it was that had come trembling down upon him, and the weight of the blind man upsetting his balance down he also fell to the ground, knocking down in their turn the sixth, fifth, fourth, third, second, and first Rashkus, who all rolled one over another, and lay in a confused heap at the foot of the tree together. Meanwhile the blind man called out to his friend, Where am I? What has happened? Where am I? Where am I? The deaf man, who was safe up in the tree, answered, 
well done brother never fear never fear you're all right only hold tight i'm coming down to help you but he had not the least intention of leaving his place of safety however he continued to call out never mind brother hold on as tight as you can i'm coming i'm coming and the more he called out the harder the blind man pinched the rashka's ears which he mistook for some kind of palm branches the six other rashkas who had succeeded after a good deal of kicking in extricating themselves from their unpleasant position thought they had quite enough of helping their friend and ran away as fast as they could and the seventh thinking from their going that the danger must be greater than he imagined and being moreover very much afraid of the mysterious creature that sat on his shoulders put his hands to the back of his ears and pushed off the blind man and then without staying to see who or what it was followed his six companions as fast as he could as soon as all the rashkas were out of sight the deaf man came down from the tree and picking up the blind man embraced him saying i could not have done better myself you have frightened away all our enemies but you see i came to help you as fast as possible then he dragged the donkey and the bundles of treasure out of the bushes gave the blind man one bundle to carry took the second himself and put the remaining two on the donkey as before this done the whole party set off to return home but when they had got nearly out of the jungle the deaf man said to the blind man we are now close to the village but if we take all this treasure home with us we shall run great risk of being robbed i think our best plan would be to divide it equally then you can take care of your half and i will take care of mine and each one can hide his share here in the jungle or wherever pleases him best very well said the blind man do you divide what we have in the bundles into two equal portions keeping one half yourself and giving me the other the cunning deaf man however had no intention of giving up half the treasure to the blind man so he first took his own bundle of treasure and hid it in the bushes and then he took the two bundles off the donkey and hid them in the bushes and he took a good deal of treasure out of the blind man's bundle which he also hid then taking the small quantity that remained he divided it into two equal portions and placing half before the blind man and half in front of himself said there brother is your share to do what you please with the blind man put out his hand but when he felt what was a very little heap of treasure it was he got very angry and cried this is not fair you are deceiving me you have kept almost all the treasure for yourself and only given me a very little oh no how can you think so answered the deaf man but if you will not believe me feel for yourself see my heap of treasure is no larger than yours the blind man put out his hands again to feel how much his friend had kept but in front of the deaf man lay only a very small heap no larger than what he had himself received at this he got very cross and said come come this won't do you think you can cheat me in this way because i am blind but i'm not so stupid as all that i carried a great bundle of treasure you carried a great bundle of treasure and there were two great bundles on the donkey do you mean to pretend that all that made no more treasure than these two little heaps no indeed i know better than that stuff and nonsense answered the deaf man stuff or no stuff continued the other you are trying to take me in and i won't be taken in by you no i'm not 
said the deaf man yes you are said the blind man and so they went on bickering scolding growling contradicting until the blind man got so enraged that he gave the deaf man a tremendous box on the ear the blow was so violent that it made the deaf man hear the deaf man very angry gave his neighbor in return so hard a blow in the face that it opened the blind man's eyes so the deaf man could hear as well as see and the blind man could see as well as hear this astonished them both so much that they became good friends at once the deaf man confessed to having hidden the bulk of the treasure which he thereupon dragged forth from its place of concealment and having divided it equally they went home and enjoyed themselves end of chapter seventy six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter seventy seven of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggum the alligator and the jackal a hungry jackal once went down to the riverside in search of little crabs bits of fish and whatever else he could find for his dinner now it chanced that in this river there lived a great big alligator who being also very hungry would have been extremely glad to eat the jackal the jackal ran up and down here and there but for a long time could find nothing to eat at last close to where the alligator was lying among some tall bulrushes under the clear shallow water he saw a little crab sidling along as fast as his legs could carry him the jackal was so hungry that when he saw this he poked his paw into the water to try and catch the crab when snap the old alligator caught hold of him oh dear thought the jackal to himself what can i do this great big alligator has caught my paw in his mouth and in another minute he will drag me down by it under the water and kill me my only chance is to make him think he has made a mistake so he called out in a cheerful voice clever alligator clever alligator to catch hold of a bulrush root instead of my paw i hope you find it very tender the alligator who was so buried among the bulrushes that he could hardly see thought on hearing this dear me how tiresome i fancied i had caught hold of the jackal's paw but there he is calling out in a cheerful voice i suppose i must have seized a bulrush root instead as he says and he let the jackal go the jackal ran away as fast as he could crying oh wise alligator wise alligator so you let me go again then the alligator was very much vexed but the jackal had run away too far to be caught next day the jackal returned to the riverside to get his dinner as before but because he was very much afraid of the alligator he called out whenever i go to look for my dinner i see the nice little crabs peeping up through the mud then i catch them and eat them i wish i could see one now the alligator who was buried in the mud at the bottom of the river heard every word so he popped the little point of his snout above it thinking if i do but just show the tip of my nose the jackal will take me for a crab and put in his paw to catch me and as soon as ever he does i'll gobble him up but no sooner did the jackal see the little tip of the alligator's nose than he called out ah my friend there you are 
no dinner for me in this part of the river then i think and so saying he ran farther on and fished for his dinner a long way from that place the alligator was very angry at missing his prey a second time and determined not to let him escape again so on the following day when the little tormentor returned to the waterside the alligator hid himself close to the bank in order to catch him if he could now the jackal was rather afraid of going near the river for he thought perhaps the alligator will catch me to-day but yet being hungry he did not wish to go without his dinner so to make all as safe as he could he cried where are all the little crabs gone there is not one here and i am so hungry and generally even when they are under water one can see them going bubble 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 and all the little bubbles go pop 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 on hearing this the alligator who was buried in the mud under the river bank thought i will pretend to be a little crab and he began to blow puff 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 bubble 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 and all the great bubbles rushed to the surface of the river and burst there and the waters eddied round and round like a whirlpool and there was such a commotion when the huge monster began to blow bubbles in this way that the jackal saw very well who must be there and he ran away as fast as he could saying thank you kind alligator thank you thank you indeed i would not have come here had i known you were so close this enraged the alligator extremely it made him quite cross to think of being so often deceived by a little jackal and he said to himself i will be taken in no more next time i will be very cunning so for a long time he waited and waited for the jackal to return to the riverside but the jackal did not come for he had thought to himself if matters go on in this way i shall some day be caught and eaten by the wicked old alligator i had better content myself with living on wild figs and he went no more near the river but stayed in the jungles and ate wild figs and roots which he dug up with his paws when the alligator found this out he determined to try and catch the jackal on land so going under the largest of the wild fig trees where the ground was covered with the fallen fruit he collected a quantity of it together and burying himself under the great heap waited for the jackal to appear but no sooner did the cunning little animal see this great heap of wild figs all collected together than he thought that looks very like my friend the alligator and to discover if it were so or not he called out this juicy little wild figs i love to eat always tumble down from the tree and roll here and there as the wind dries them but this great heap of figs is quite still these cannot be good figs i will not eat any of them ho ho thought the alligator is that all how suspicious this jackal is i will make the figs roll about a little then and when he sees that he will doubtless come and eat them so the great beast shook himself and all the heap of little figs went roll 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 some a mile this way some a mile that farther than they had ever rolled before or than the most blustering wind could have driven them seeing this the jackal scampered away saying i am so much obliged to you alligator for letting me know you are there for indeed i should have hardly guessed it you were so buried under that heap of figs the alligator hearing this was so angry that he ran after the jackal but the latter ran very very fast away too quickly to be caught then the alligator said to himself i will not allow that little wretch to make fun of me another time 
and then run away out of reach i will show him that i can be more cunning than he fancies and early the next morning he crawled as fast as he could to the jackal's den which was a hole in the side of a hill and crept into it and hid himself waiting for the jackal who was out to return home but when the jackal got near the place he looked about him and thought dear me the ground looks as if some heavy creature had been walking over it and here are great clods of earth knocked down from each side of the door of my den as if a very big animal had been trying to squeeze himself through it i certainly will not go inside until i know that all is safe there so he called out little house pretty house my sweet little house why do you not give an answer when i call and all is safe and right you always call out to me is anything wrong that you do not speak then the alligator who was inside thought if that is the case i'd better call out that he may fancy all is right in his house and in as gentle a voice as he could he said sweet little jackal at hearing these words the jackal felt quite frightened and thought to himself so the dreadful old alligator is there i must try to kill him if i can for if i do not he will certainly catch and kill me some day he therefore answered thank you my dear little house i'd like to hear your pretty voice i'm coming in in a minute but first i must collect firewood to cook my dinner and he ran as fast as he could and dragged all the dry branches and bits of stick he could find close up to the mouth of the den meanwhile the alligator inside kept as quiet as a mouse but he could not help laughing a little to himself as he thought so i have deceived this tiresome little jackal at last in a few minutes he will run in here and then won't i snap him up when the jackal had gathered together all the sticks he could find and put them round the mouth of his den he set them on fire and pushed them as far into it as possible there was such a quantity of them that they soon blazed up into a great fire and the smoke and flames filled the den and smothered the wicked old alligator and burned him to death while the little jackal ran up and down outside dancing for joy and singing how do you like my house my friend is it nice and warm ding dong ding dong the alligator is dying ding dong ding dong he will trouble me no more i have defeated my enemy ring a ting ding a ting ding ding dong end of chapter 77 recording by linda ray nielsen vancouver bc chapter 78 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggum why the fish laughed as a certain fisherwoman passed by a palace crying her fish the queen appeared at one of the windows and beckoned her to come near and show what she had at that moment a very big fish jumped about in the bottom of the basket is it a he or a she inquired the queen i wish to purchase a she fish on hearing this the fish laughed out loud it is a he replied the fisherwoman and proceeded on her rounds the queen returned to her room in a great rage and on coming to see her in the evening 
the king noticed that something had disturbed her are you indisposed he said no but i am very much annoyed at the strange behavior of a fish a woman brought me one to-day and on my inquiring whether it was a male or female the fish laughed most rudely a fish laugh impossible you must be dreaming i am not a fool i speak of what i have seen with my own eyes and have heard with my own ears passing strange be it so i will inquire concerning it on the morrow the king repeated to his vizier what his wife had told him and bade him investigate the matter and be ready with a satisfactory answer within six months on pain of death the vizier promised to do his best though he felt almost certain of failure for five months he labored infatigably to find a reason for the laughter of the fish he sought everywhere and from every one the wise and the learned and they who were skilled in magic and in all manner of trickery were consulted nobody however could explain the matter and so he returned broken-hearted to his house and began to arrange his affairs in prospect of certain death for he had sufficient experience of the king to know that his majesty would not go back from his threat among other things he advised his son to travel for a time until the king's anger should have somewhat cooled the young fellow who was both clever and handsome started off whithersoever kismet may lead him he had been gone some days when he fell in with an old farmer who also was on a journey to a certain village finding the old man very pleasant he asked him if he might accompany him professing to be on a visit to the same place the old farmer agreed and they walked along together the day was hot and the way was long and weary don't you think it would be pleasanter if you and i sometimes gave each other a lift said the youth what a fool this man is thought the old farmer presently they passed through a field of corn ready for the sickle and looking like a sea of gold as it waved to and fro in the breeze is this eaten or not said the young man not understanding his meaning the old man replied i don't know after a little while the two travelers arrived at a big village where the young man gave his companion a clasp knife and said take this friend and get two horses with it but mind and bring it back for it is very precious the old man looking half amused and half angry pushed back the knife muttering something to the effect that his friend was either a fool himself or else trying to play the fool with him the young man pretended not to notice his reply and remained almost silent till they reached the city a short distance outside which was the old farmer's house they walked about the bazaar and went to the mosque but nobody saluted them or invited them to come in and rest what a large cemetery exclaimed the young man what does the man mean thought the old farmer calling this largely populated city a cemetery on leaving the city their way led through a graveyard where a few people were praying beside a tomb and distributing chaptis and kulchas to passers-by in the name of their beloved dead they beckoned to the two travelers and gave them as much as they would what a splendid city this is said the young man now the man must surely be demented thought the old farmer i wonder what he will do next 
he will be calling the land water and the water land and be speaking of light where there is darkness and of darkness when it is light however he kept his thoughts to himself presently they had to wade through a stream that ran along the edge of the cemetery the water was rather deep so the old farmer took off his shoes and pajamas and crossed over but the young man waded through it with his shoes and pajamas on well i never did see such a perfect fool both in word and in deed said the old man to himself however he liked the fellow and thinking that he would amuse his wife and daughter he invited him to come and stay at his house as long as he had occasion to remain in the village thank you very much the young man replied but let me first inquire if you please whether the beam of your house is strong the old farmer left him in despair and entered his house laughing there's a man in yonder field he said after returning their greetings he has come the greater part of the way with me and i wanted him to put up here as long as he had to stay in this village but the fellow is such a fool that i cannot make anything out of him he wants to know if the beam of this house is all right the man must be mad and saying this he burst into a fit of laughter father said the farmer's daughter who was a very sharp and wise girl this man whosoever he is is no fool as you deem him he only wishes to know if you can afford to entertain him oh of course replied the farmer i see well perhaps you can help me to solve some of these other mysteries while we were walking together he asked whether he should carry me or i should carry him as he thought that would be pleasanter mode of proceeding most assuredly said the girl he meant that one of you should tell a story to beguile the time oh yes well we were passing through a cornfield when he asked me whether it was eaten or not and didn't you know the meaning of this father he simply wished to know if the man was in debt or not because if the owner of the field was in debt then the produce of the field was as good as eaten to him that is it would have to go to his creditors yes 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 of course then on entering a certain village he bade me to take his clasp knife and get two horses with it and bring back the knife again to him are not two stout sticks as good as two horses for helping one along on the road he only asked you to cut a couple of sticks and be careful not to lose his knife i see said the farmer while we were walking over the city we did not see anybody that we knew and not a soul gave us a scrap of anything to eat till we were passing the cemetery but there some people called to us and put into our hands some chapatis and kulchas so my companion called the city a cemetery and the cemetery a city this also is to be understood father if one thinks of the city as a place where everything is to be obtained and of inhospitable people as worse than the dead the city though crowded with people was as if dead as far as you were concerned while in the cemetery which is crowded with the dead you were saluted by kind friends and provided with bread true true said the astonished farmer then just now 
when we were crossing the stream he waded through it without taking off his shoes and pajamas i admire his wisdom replied the girl i have often thought how stupid people were to venture into that swiftly flowing stream and over those sharp stones with bare feet the slightest stumble and they would fall and be wetted from head to foot this friend of yours is a most wise man i should like to see him and speak to him very well said the farmer i will go and find him and bring him in tell him father that our beams are strong enough and then he will come in i'll send on ahead a present to the man to show him that we can afford to have him for our guest accordingly she called a servant and sent him to the young man with a present of a basin of ghee twelve chapatis and a jar of milk and the following message o oh friend the moon is full twelve months make a year and the sea is overflowing with water halfway the bearer of this present and message met his little son who seeing what was in the basket begged his father to give him some of the food his father foolishly complied presently he saw the young man and gave him the rest of the present and the message give your mistress my salam he replied and tell her that the moon is new and that i can find only eleven months in the year and the sea is by no means full not understanding the meaning of these words the servant repeated them word for word as he had heard them to his mistress and thus his theft was discovered and he was severely punished after a little while the young man appeared with the old farmer great attention was shown to him and he was treated in every way as if he were the son of a great man although his humble host knew nothing of his origin at length he told them everything about the laughing of the fish his father's threatened execution and his own banishment and asked their advice as to what he should do the laughing of the fish said the girl which seems to have been the cause of all this trouble indicates that there is a man in the palace who is plotting against the king's life joy joy exclaimed the vizier's son there is yet time for me to return and save my father from an ignominious and unjust death and the king from danger the following day he hastened back to his own country taking with him the farmer's daughter immediately on arrival he ran to the palace and informed his father of what he had heard the poor vizier now almost dead from the expectation of death was at once carried to the king to whom he repeated the news that his son had just brought never said the king but it must be so your majesty replied the vizier and in order to prove the truth of what i have heard i pray you call together all the maids in your palace and order them to jump over a pit which must be dug we'll soon find out whether there is any man there the king had the pit dug and commanded all the maids belonging to the palace to dry jump it all of them tried but only one succeeded that one was found to be a man thus was the queen satisfied and the faithful old vizier saved afterward as soon as could be the vizier's son married the old farmer's daughter and a most happy marriage it was end of chapter seventy eight recording by linda marie nielsen
Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 79 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Selfish Sparrow and the Houseless Crows. A sparrow once built a nice little house for herself, and lined it well with wool and protected it with sticks, so that it resisted equally the summer sun and the winter rains. A crow who lived close by had also built a house, but it was not such a good one, being only made of a few sticks laid one above another on the top of a prickly pear hedge. The consequence was that one day, when there was an unusually heavy shower, the crow's nest was washed away, while the sparrow's was not at all injured. In this extremity the crow and her mate went to the sparrow and said, Sparrow, sparrow, have pity on us and give us shelter, for the wind blows and the rain beats, and the prickly pear hedge thorns stick into our eyes. But the sparrow answered, I'm cooking the dinner, and cannot let you in now. Come again presently. In a little while the crows returned and said, Sparrow, sparrow, have pity on us and give us shelter, for the wind blows and the rain beats, and the prickly pear hedge thorns stick into our eyes. The sparrow answered, I'm eating my dinner. I cannot let you in now. Come again presently. The crows flew away but in a little while return, and cried once more, Sparrow, sparrow, have pity on us, and give us shelter, for the wind blows and the rain beats, and the prickly pear hedge thorns stick into our eyes. The sparrow replied, I'm washing the dishes. I cannot let you in now. Come again presently. The crows waited a while, and then called out, Sparrow, sparrow, have pity on us, and give us shelter, for the wind blows and the rain beats, and the prickly pear hedge thorns stick into our eyes. But the sparrow would not let them in. She only answered, I'm sweeping the floor. I cannot let you in now. Come again presently. Next time the crows came and cried, Sparrow, sparrow, have pity on us and give us shelter, for the wind blows and the rain beats, and the prickly pear hedge thorns stick into our eyes, she answered, I'm making the beds. I cannot let you in now. Come again presently. So, on one pretense or another, she refused to help out the poor birds. At last, when she and her children had had their dinner, and she had prepared and put away the dinner for the next day, and put all the children to bed and gone to bed herself, she cried to the crows, You may come in now and take shelter for the night. The crows came in, but they were much vexed at having been kept out so long in the wind and the rain, and when the sparrow and all her family were asleep, the one said to the other, The selfish sparrow had no pity on us. She gave us no dinner, and would not let us in till she and all her children were comfortably in bed. Let us punish her. So the two crows took all the nice dinner the sparrow had prepared for herself and her children to eat the next day, and flew away with it. End of chapter 79 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 80 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Lambkin Once upon a time there was a wee, wee lambkin who frolicked about on his little, tottery legs and enjoyed himself amazingly. 
Now one day he set off to visit his granny, and was jumping with joy to think of all the good things he should get from her, when whom should he meet but a jackal, who looked at the tender young morsel and said, Lambkin, Lambkin, I'll eat you. But Lambkin only gave a little frisk, and said, To Granny's house I go, where I shall fatter grow, then you can eat me so. The jackal thought this reasonable, and let Lambkin pass. By and by he met a vulture, and the vulture, looking hungrily at the tender morsel before him, said, Lambkin, Lambkin, I'll eat you. But Lambkin only gave a little frisk, and said, To Granny's house I go, where I shall fatter grow, then you can eat me so. The vulture thought this reasonable, and let Lambkin pass. And by and by he met a tiger, and then a wolf, and a dog, and an eagle, and all these, when they saw the tender little morsel, said, Lambkin, Lambkin, I'll eat you. But to all of them Lambkin replied, with a little frisk, To Granny's house I go, where I shall fatter grow, then you can eat me so. At last he reached his Granny's house, and said, all in a hurry, Granny dear, I've promised to get very fat, so, as people ought to keep their promises, please put me into the corn bin at once. So his granny said he was a good boy, and put him into the corn bin, and there the greedy little lambkin stayed for seven days, and ate and ate and ate, until he could scarcely waddle, and his granny said he was fat enough for anything, and must go home. But cunning little lambkin said, that would never do, for some animal would be sure to eat him on the way back. He was so plump and tender. I'll tell you what you must do, said Master Lampkin. You must make a little drumkin out of the skin of my little brother who died, and then I can sit inside and trundle along nicely, for I am as tight as a drum myself. So his granny made a little nice drumkin out of his brother's skin, with the wool inside, and Lampkin curled himself up snug and warm in the middle, and trundled away gaily. Soon he met the eagle, who called out, Drumkin, Drumkin, have you seen Lampkin? And Mr. Lampkin, curled up in his soft warm nest, replied, Fallen into the fire, and so will you. On, little Drumkin, turn pa, turn to. How very annoying, sighed the eagle, thinking regretfully of the tender morsel he had let slip. Meanwhile Lampkin trumbled along, laughing to himself and singing, Tumpa, tum tu, tumpa, tum tu. Every animal and bird he met asked the same question. Drumkin, drumkin, have you seen Lampkin? And to each of them the little sly boots replied, fallen into the fire, and so will you. On, little drumkin, turn pa, turn to, tum pa, tum to, tum pa, tum to. Then, then they all sighed to think of the tender little morsel they had let slip. At last the jackal came limping along, for all his sorry looks as sharp as a needle, and he too called out, drumkin, drumkin, have you seen lampkin? And Lampkin, curled up in his snug little nest, replied gaily, Fallen into the fire, and so will you. On, little drumkin, turn pa. But he never got any further, for the jackal recognized his voice at once, and cried, Hello, you've turned yourself inside out, have you? Just you come out of that. Whereupon he tore open drumkin and gobbled up Lampkin. End of chapter 80. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 81 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Tales of Laughter. By Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Town Mouse and the Country Mouse. 
Once upon a time a town mouse met a country mouse on the outskirts of a wood. The country mouse was sitting under a hazel thicket, plucking nuts. "'Busy harvesting, I see,' said the town mouse. "'Who would think of our meeting in this out-of-the-way part of the world?' "'Just so,' said the country mouse. "'You are gathering nuts for your winter store,' said the town mouse. "'I am obliged to do so if we intend having anything to live upon during the winter.' said the country mouse. "'The husk is big and the nut full this year, enough to satisfy any hungry body,' said the town mouse. "'Yes, you are right there,' said the country mouse, and then she related how well she lived and how comfortable she was at home. The town mouse maintained that she was the better off, but the country mouse said that nowhere could one be so well off as in the woods and hills. The town mouse, however, declared she was best off, and as they could not agree on this point, they promised to visit each other at Christmas, and then they could see for themselves which was really the more comfortable. The first visit was to be paid by the town mouse. Now, although the country mouse had moved down from the mountains for the winter, the road to her house was long and tiring, and one had to travel up hill and down dale, the snow lay thick and deep. So the town mouse found it hard work to get on, and she became both tired and hungry before she reached the end of her journey. How nice it will be to get some food, she thought. The country mouse had scraped together the best she had. There were nut kernels, poly potty, and other sorts of roots, and many other good things which grow in woods and fields. She kept it all in a hole far underground, so the frost could not reach it, and close by was a running spring, open all the winter, so she could drink as much water as she liked. There was an abundance of all she had, and they ate both well and heartily, but the town mouse thought it was very poor fare indeed. "'One can, of course, keep body and soul together on this,' said she, "'but I don't think much of it. Now you must be good enough to visit me and taste what we have.' Yes, that her hostess would, and before long she set out. The town mouse had gathered together all the scraps from the Christmas fare which the woman of the house had dropped on the floor during the holiday bits of cheese, butter, and tallow ends, cake crumbs, pastry, and many other good things. In the dish under the ale tap she had drink enough. In fact, the place was full of all kinds of dainties. They ate and fared well. The country mouse seemed never to have enough. She had never tasted such delicacies. But then she became thirsty, for she found the food both strong and rich, and now she wanted something to drink. "'We haven't far to go for the beer we shall drink,' said the town mouse, and jumped upon the edge of the dish and drank till she was no longer thirsty. She did not drink too much, for she knew that Christmas beer was strong. The country mouse, however, thought the beer a splendid drink. She had never tasted anything but water, so she took one sip after another, but as she could not stand strong drink, she became dizzy before she left the dish. The drink got into her head and down into her toes, and she began running and jumping about from one beer barrel to the other, and to dance and tumble about on the shelves among the cups and mugs. She squeaked and squealed as if she were intoxicated. "'You must not carry on as if you had just come from the back woods and make such a row and noise,' said the town mouse. "'The master of the house is a bailiff, and he is very strict indeed,' she said." The country mouse said she didn't care either for bailiffs or beggars. But the cat sat at the top of the cellar steps, lying in wait, and heard all the chatter and noise. When the woman of the house went down to draw some beer and lifted the trap door, the cat slipped by into the cellar and struck its claws into the country mouse. Then there was quite another sort of dance. The town mouse slid back into her hole and sat in safety looking on while the country mouse suddenly became sober when she felt the claws of the cat in her back. "'Oh, my dear bailiff, dearest bailiff, be merciful and spare my life, and I will tell you a fairy tale,' she said. "'Well, go on,' said the cat. "'Once upon a time there were two little mice,' said the country mouse, squeaking slowly and pitifully, for she wanted to make the story last as long as she could. "'Then they were not lonely.' said the cat dryly and curtly. And they had a steak, which they were going to fry. Then they could not starve, said the cat. And they put it out on the roof to cool. 
said the country mouse. Then they did not burn themselves, said the cat. But there came a fox and a crow and ate it all up, said the country mouse. Then I'll eat you, said the cat. But just at that moment the woman shut the trap door with a slam, which so startled the cat that she let go her hold of the mouse. One bound and the country mouse found herself in the hole with the town mouse. From there a passage led out into the snow, and you be sure the country mouse did not wait long before she set out homeward. And this is what you call living at ease and being well off, she said to the town mouse. Heaven preserve me from having such a fine place and such a master. Why, I only just got away with my life. End of chapter 81「Chapter eighty two of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Tales of Laughter by Laura Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Greedy Cat. Once on a time there was a man who had a cat, and she was so awfully big and such a beast to eat, he couldn't keep her any longer. So she was to go down to the river with a stone round her neck, but before she started she was to have a meal of meat. So the goody set before her a bowl of porridge and a little trough of fat, that the creature crammed into her and ran off and jumped through the window. Outside stood the goodman by the barn door threshing. Good day, goodman, said the cat. Good day, pussy, said the goodman. Have you had any food today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat. And now I think think of it i'll take you too and so she took the goodman and gobbled him up when she had done that she went into the byre and there sat the goody milking good day goody said the cat good day pussy said the goody are you here and have you eaten up your food yet oh i've eaten a little today but i'm most fasting said the pussy it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman. And now I think of it, I'll take you too. And so she took the goody and gobbled her up. Good day, you cow at the manger, said the cat to Daisy the cow. Good day, pussy, said the bell cow. Have you had any food today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. I've only had a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody, and now I think of it, I'll take you too. And so she took the cow and gobbled her up. Then off she set into the home field, and there stood a man picking up leaves. Good day, you leaf picker in the field, said the cat. Good day, pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? said the leaf picker. Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody and Daisy the cow. And now I think of it, I'll take you too. So she took the leaf picker and gobbled him up. Then she came to a heap of stones. And there stood a stoat and peeped out. Good day, Mr. Stoat of Stone Heap, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker. And now I think of it, 
I'll take you too. So she took the stoat and gobbled him up. When she had gone a bit further, she came to a hazel break, and there sat a squirrel gathering nuts. Good day, Sir Squirrel of the break, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody, and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat. And now I think of it, I'll take you too. So she took the squirrel and gobbled him up. When she had gone a little farther, she saw Reynard the fox, who was prowling about by the woodside. Good day, Reynard Slyboots, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stout and the squirrel. And now I think of it, I'll take you too. So she took Reynard and gobbled him up. When she had gone a little farther, she met Long Ears, the hare. Good day, Mr. Hopper, the hare, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody, and the cow and the leaf picker, and the stout and the squirrel, and the fox. And now I think of it, I'll take you too. So she took the hare and gobbled him up. When she had gone a bit farther, she met a wolf. Good day, you greedy gray legs, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat, and the squirrel, and the fox, and the hare. And now I think of it, I may as well take you too. So she took and gobbled up gray legs too. So she went on into the wood, and when she had gone far and farther than far, o'er hill and dale, she met a bear cub. Good day, you bear-breached bear, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy, said the bear cub. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody, and the cow and the leaf picker, and the stout and the squirrel, and the fox and the hare, and the wolf. And now I think of it. I may as well take you too. And so she took the bear cub and gobbled him up. When the cat had gone a bit farther, she met a she-bear, who was tearing away at a stump till the splinters flew, so angry was she at having lost her cub. Good day, you, Mrs. Bruin, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody, and the cow and the leaf picker, and the stoat and the squirrel, and the fox and the hare, and the wolf and the bear cub, and, now I think of it, I'll take you too. And so she took Mrs. Bruin and gobbled her up too. When the cat got still farther on, she met Baron Bruin himself. Good day, you Baron Bruin, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy, said Bruin. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, 
but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody, and the cow and the leaf picker, and the stoat and the squirrel, and the fox and the hare, and the wolf and the bear cub, and the she bear, and now I think of it, I'll take you too. And so she took Bruin and ate him up too. So the cat went on and on and farther than far till she came to the abodes of men again, and there she met a bridal train on the road. Good day, you bridal train on the king's highway, said she. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat. And the goodman and the goody, and the cow and the leaf picker, and the stoat and the squirrel and the fox, and the hare and the wolf and the bear cub, and the she bear and the he bear, and now I think of it, I'll take you too. And so she rushed at them and gobbled up both the bride and the bridegroom and the whole train with the cook and the fiddler and the horses and all. When she had gone still farther, she came to a church and there she met a funeral. Good day, you funeral train, said she. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody and the cow, and the leaf picker and the stoat and the squirrel, and the fox and the hare and the wolf, and the bear cub and the she bear and the he bear, and the bride and bridegroom and the whole train. And now, I don't mind if I take you too. And so she fell on the funeral train and gobbled up both the body and the bearers. Now, when the cat had got the body in her, she was taken up to the sky. And when she had gone a long, long way, she met the moon. Good day, Mrs. Moon, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat and the squirrel and the fox and the hare and the wolf and the bear cub and the she bear and the he bear and the bride and the bridegroom and the whole train and the funeral train and now i think of it i don't mind if i take you too and so she seized hold of the moon and gobbled her up both new and full so the cat went a long way still and then she met the sun good day you sun in heaven good day mrs pussy said the sun have you had anything to eat today Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat. And the goodman and the goody and the cow, and the leaf picker and the stoat and the squirrel, and the fox and the hare and the wolf, and the bear cub and the she bear and the he bear, and the bride and bridegroom and the whole train, and the funeral train and the moon, and now I think of it, I don't mind if I take you too. And so she rushed at the sun in heaven and gobbled him up. So the cat went far and farther than far till she came to a bridge, and on it she met a big billy goat. Good day, you billy goat on broad bridge, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? said the billy goat. Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting. I've only had a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, 
and the goodman and the goody in the byre, and Daisy the cow at the manger, and the leaf picker in the home field, and Mr. Stout of Stone Heap, and Sir Squirrel of the Brake, and Reynard Slyboots, and Mr. Hopper the Hare, and Greedy Greylegs the Wolf, and Bear Breach the Bear Cub, and Mrs. Bruin and Baron Bruin, and a bridal train on the king's highway, and a funeral at the church, and Lady Moon in the sky, and Lord Sun in heaven, and, now I think of it, I'll take you too. That we'll fight about, said the billy goat, and butted at the cat till she fell right over the bridge into the river, and there she burst. So they all crept out one after the other, and went about their business, and were just as good as ever, all that the cat had gobbled up. The goodman of the house, and the goody in the byre, and Daisy the cow at the manger, and the leaf picker in the home field, and Mr. Stout of Stone Heap, and Sir Squirrel of the Brake, and Renard Slyboots, and Mr. Hopper, the hare, and Greedy Greylegs, the wolf, and Bear Breach, the bear cub, and Mrs. Bruin, and Baron Bruin, and the bridal train on the highway, and the funeral train at the church, and Lady Moon in the sky, and Lord Sun in heaven. End of chapter 82 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 83 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Well done, ill paid. Once upon a time there was a man who had to drive his sledge to the wood for fuel, and a bear met him on the way. Hand over your horse, growled the bear, or I'll kill all your sheep by summer. Oh, heaven help me, said the man. There's not a stick of firewood in the house. You must let me drive home a load of fuel, else we shall be frozen to death. I'll bring the horse to you tomorrow morning. Yes, on these terms he might drive the wood home. That was a bargain. But Bruin said if he didn't come back, he should lose all his sheep by summer. So the man got the wood on the sledge and rattled homeward. But he wasn't over pleased with his bargain, you might fancy. So just then a fox met him. Why, what's the matter? said the fox. Why are you so down in the mouth? Oh, if you want to know, said the man, I met a bear up yonder in the wood, and I had to give my word to him to bring Dobbin back to-morrow, at this very hour, for if he didn't get him, he said he would tear all my sheep to death by summer. Stuff? Nothing worse than that? said the fox. If you give me your fattest weather, I'll soon set you free. See if I don't. Yes, the man gave his word and swore he would keep it true. Well, when you come with Dobbin tomorrow for the bear, said the fox, I'll make a clatter up in the heap of stones yonder. And so, when the bear asks what the noise is, you must say it is Peter the marksman, who is the best shot in the world and after that you must help yourself. Now, the next day, off set the man, and when he met the bear, something began to make a clatter up in the heap of stones. Hist, hist! What is that? said the bear. Oh, that's Peter the marksman, to be sure, said the man. He's the best shot in the world. I know him by his voice. Have you seen any bear about here, Eric? shouted out a voice in the wood. Say no, said the bear. No, I haven't seen any, said Eric. What's that, then, that stands alongside your sledge? bawled out the voice in the wood. 
say it's an old fir stump said the bear oh it's only an old fir stump said the man such fir stumps we take in our country and roll them on our sledges bawled out the voice if you can't do it yourself i'll come and help you say you can help yourself and roll me on the sledge said the bear no thank ye i can help myself well enough said the man and rolled the bear on the sledge such fir stumps we always bind fast on our sledges in our part of the world bawled out the voice shall i come and help you say you can help yourself and buy me fast do said the bear no thanks i can help myself well enough said the man who set to binding bruin fast with all the ropes he had so that at last the bear couldn't stir a paw such fir stumps we always drive our axe into in our part of the world bawled out the voice for then we guide them better going down steep pitches pretend to drive the axe into me do now said the bear then the man took up his axe and at one blow split the bear's skull so that bruin lay dead in a trice and so the man and the fox were great friends and on best of terms but when they came near the farm the fox said i've no mind to go right home with you for i can't say i like your dogs so i'll just wait here and you can bring the weather to me but mind you pick out one nice and fat yes the man would be sure to do that and thank the fox much for his help so when he had put the horse into the stable he went across to the sheep pen where are you going asked his wife oh i am only going over to the sheep pen to fetch a fat ram for the good fox who saved our horse said the man as i have promised him one why on earth give that thief of a fox any ram said the woman we have got the horse quite safe and the bear besides and the fox has stolen more geese from us than the ram is worth or if he hasn't already taken them he is sure to do some time no take the most savage pair of these dogs of yours and let them loose on him then perhaps we'll get rid of that thieving old rascal said the woman the man thought this was sensible advice and took two of his savage red dogs put them in a bag and set out with them have you got the ram said the fox yes come and fetch it said the man undoing the string round the bag and setting the dogs at the fox ugh said the fox bounding away the old saying well done ill paid is only too true and now i find it is also true that one's relations are one's worst enemies and he panted as he saw the red dogs at his heels end of chapter eighty three Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 84 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. Reynard and Chancellor. Once upon a time there was a cock who stood on a dung heap and crew and flapped his wings. Then the fox came by. Good day, said Reynard. I heard you crowing so nicely. But can you stand on one leg and crow and wink your eyes? Oh, yes, said the chancellor. I can do that very well. So he stood on one leg and crow, but he winked only with one eye. And when he had done that, he made himself big and flapped his wings, as though he had done a great thing. Very pretty, to be sure, said Reynard, almost as pretty as when the person preaches in church. But can you stand on one leg and wink both your eyes at once? I hardly think you can. Can't I, though? said the Chancellor, 
and stood on one leg and winked both his eyes and crew. But Reynard caught hold of him, took him by the throat, and threw him over his back, so that he was off to the wood before he had crowed his crow out, as fast as Reynard could lay legs to the ground. When they had come under an old spruce fir, Reynard threw Cancellier on the ground, and set his paw on his breast, and was going to take a bite. "'You are heathen, Reynard,' said Chancellor. "'Good Christians say grace, and a blessing before they eat. But Reynard would be no heathen. God forbid it. So he let go his hold, and was about to fold his paws over his breast, and say grace, when pop! up flew Chancellor into a tree. "'You shan't get off for all that said Reynard to himself, so he went away and came again with a few chips which the woodcutters had left. Chancellor peeped and peered to see what they could be. "'What in the world have you there?' he asked. "'These are letters I have just got,' said Reynard. "'Wouldn't you help me read them, for I don't know how to read writing?' I'd be so happy, but I dare not read them now, said Chancellor, for here comes a hunter. I see him, I see him, as I sit by the tree trunk. When Reynard heard Chancellor chattering about a hunter, he took to his heels as quickly as he could. So this time Reynard was made game of again. End of chapter 84 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 85 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Father Bruin in the Corner Once on a time there was a man who lived far, far away in the wood. He had many, many goats and sheep, but never a one could he keep for fear of Greylegs, the wolf. At last he said, I'll soon trap Greyboots. So he set to work digging a pitfall. When he had dug it deep enough, he put a pole down in the midst of the pit, and on top of the pole he set a board, and on the board he put a little dog. Over the pit itself he spread boughs and branches and leaves and other rubbish, and atop of all he strewed snow, so that Greylegs might not see there was a pit underneath. So when it got on in the night, the little dog grew weary of sitting there. Bow wow, bow wow, it said, and bayed at the moon. Just then up came a fox, slouching and sneaking, and thought here was a fine time for marketing, and with that gave a jump, head over heels down into the pitfall. And when it got a little farther on in the night, the little dog got so weary and hungry, and it fell to yelping and howling. Bow wow, bow wow, it cried out. Just at that very moment up came Greylegs, trotting and trotting. He too thought he should get a fat stake, and he too made a spring, head over heels down into the pitfall. When it was getting on toward grey dawn in the morning, down fell snow with a north wind, and it grew so cold that the little dog stood and froze, and shivered and shook. It was so weary and so hungry. Bow wow, bow wow, bow wow, it called out, and barked and yelped and howled. Then came up a bear, tramping and tramping along, and thought to himself how he could get a morsel for breakfast at the very top of the morning. And so he thought and thought among the boughs and branches, till he, too, went bump, head over heels down into the pitfall. So when it got a little farther on in the morning, an old beggar wife came walking by, 
who toddled from farm to farm with a bag on her back when she set eyes on the little dog that stood there and howled she couldn't help going near to look and see if any wild beasts had fallen into the pit during the night so she crawled up on her knees and peeped down into it art thou come into the pit at last reynard said she to the fox for he was the first she saw a very good place too for such hen roost robber as thou and thou too grey paw said she to the wolf many a goat and sheep hast thou torn and rent and now thou shalt be plagued and punished to death bless my heart thou too bruin art thou too sitting in this room thou mare flayer thee too will we strip and thee shall we flay and thy skull shall be nailed up on the wall all this the old lass screeched out as she bent over toward the bear but just then her bag fell over her ears and dragged her down and slap down went the old crone head over heels into the pitfall so there they all four sat and glared at one another each in a corner fox in one gray legs in another bruin in a third and the old crone in a fourth but as soon as it was broad daylight reynard began to peep and peer and to twist and turn about for he thought he might as well try to get out but the old lass cried out canst thou not sit still thou whirligig thief and not go twisting and turning only look at father bruin himself in the corner how he sits as grave as a judge for now she thought she might as well make friends with the bear but just then up came the man who owned the pitfall first he drew up the old wife and after that he slew all the beasts and spared neither father bruin himself in the corner nor graylegs nor reynard the whirligig thief that night at least he thought he had made a good haul End of chapter 85 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 86 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 86 Why the Sea is Salt Once upon a time, long, long ago, there were two brothers, the one rich and the other poor. When Christmas Eve came, the poor one had not a bite in the house, either of meat or bread, so he went to his brother and begged him in heaven's name to give him something for Christmas Day. It was by no means the first time that the brother had been forced to give something to him, and he was not better pleased at being asked now than he generally was. "'If you will do what I ask you, you shall have a whole ham,' said he. The poor one immediately thanked him and promised this. "'Well, here is the ham, and now you must go straight to Dead Man's Hall,' said the rich brother, throwing the ham to him. "'Well, I will do what I have promised,' said the other, and he took the ham and set off. He went on and on for the live-long day, and at nightfall he came to a place where there was a bright light. I have no doubt this is the place, thought the man with the ham, and he drew near an old man with a long white beard who was standing in the outhouse chopping yule logs. Good evening, said the man with the ham. Good evening to you. Where are you going at this late hour, said the man. I am going to Dead Man's Hall, if only I am in the right track, answered the poor man. "'Oh, yes, you are right enough, for it is here,' said the old man. "'When you get inside, they will all want to buy your ham, "'for they don't get much meat to eat there. "'But you must not sell it unless you can get for it "'the hand mill which stands behind the door. "'When you come out again, I will teach you how to stop the hand mill, "'which is useful for almost everything.' "'So the man with the ham thanked the other for his good advice "'and rapped at the door. "'When he got in, everything happened just as the old man had said it would.' All the people, great and small, came round him like ants on an anthill, and each tried to outbid the other for the ham. 
By rights, my old woman and I ought to have it for our Christmas dinner, but since you have set your hearts upon it, I must just give it up to you, said the man. But if I sell it, I will have the handmill which is standing there behind the door. At first they would not hear to this, and haggled and bargained with the man, but he stuck to what he had said, and the people were forced to give him the handmill. When the man came out again into the yard, he asked the old woodcutter how he was to stop the handmill, and when he had learned that, he thanked him and set off home with all the speed he could, but did not get there till after the clock had struck twelve on Christmas Eve. But where in the world have you been? said the old woman. Here I have sat, waiting hour after hour, and have not even two sticks to lay across each other under the Christmas porridge pot. Oh, I could not come before. I had something of importance to see about, and a long way to go, too. But now you shall see, said the man, and then he set the handmill on the table, and bade it first grind light, then a tablecloth, and then meat, and beer, and everything else that was good for a Christmas Eve supper, and the mill ground all that he ordered. Bless me, said the old woman, as one thing after another appeared, and she wanted to know where her husband had got the mill from, but he would not tell her that. Never mind where I got it. You can see that it is a good one, and the water that turns it will never freeze, said the man. So he ground meat and drink and all kinds of good things to last all Christmas tide, and on the third day he invited all his friends to come to a feast. Now when the rich brother saw all that there was at the banquet and in the house, he was both vexed and angry, for he grudged everything his brother had. On Christmas Eve he was so poor that he came to me and begged for a trifle, for heaven's sake, and now he gives a feast as if he were both a count and a king, thought he. But tell me, I pray you, where you got your riches from, said he to his brother. From behind the door, said he who owned the mill, for he did not choose to satisfy his brother on that point. But later in the evening, when he had taken a drop too much, he could not refrain from telling how he had come by the hand mill. There you see what has brought me all my wealth, said he, and brought out the mill and made it grind first one thing and then another. When the brother saw that, he insisted on having the mill, and after a great deal of persuasion got it, but he had to give three hundred dollars for it, and the poor brother was to keep it till the haymaking was over, for he thought, if I keep it as long as that, I can make it grind meat and drink that will last many a long year. During that time you may imagine that the mill did not grow rusty, and when the hay harvest came the rich brother got it, but the other had taken good care not to teach him how to stop it. It was evening when the rich man got the mill home, and in the morning he bade his wife go out and spread the hay after the mowers, and he would attend to the house himself that day. So when dinner time drew near, he set the mill on the kitchen table and said, Grind herrings and milk pottage, and do it both quickly and well. So the mill began to grind herrings and milk pottage, and first all the dishes and tubs were filled, and then the food came out all over the kitchen floor. The man twisted and turned the mill and did all he could to make it stop, but howsoever he turned and screwed, it went on grinding, and in a short time the pottage rose so high that the man was like to be drowned. So he threw open the parlor door, but it was not long before the mill had ground the parlor full too, and it was with difficulty and danger that the man could go through the stream of pottage and get hold of the door latch. When he had the door open, he did not stay long in the room, but ran out, and the herrings and pottage came after him and streamed out over both farm and field. Now the wife, who was out spreading the hay, began to think dinner was long in coming, and said to the women and the mowers, Though the master does not call us home, we may as well go. It may be that he finds he is not good at making pottage, and I should do well to help him. So they began to straggle homeward, but when they had got a little way up the hill, they met the herrings and pottage and bread all pouring forth and winding about one over the other, and the man himself in front of the flood. Would to heaven that each of you had a hundred stomachs. Take care that you are not drowned in the pottage, he cried, as he went by them as if mischief were at his heels, down to where his brother dwelt. Then he begged him, for pity's sake, to take the mill back again, and that in an instant, for, said he, if it grinds one hour more, the whole district will be destroyed by herrings and pottage. But the brother would not take it until the other paid him three hundred dollars, and that he was obliged to do. Now the poor brother had both the money and the mill again. So it was not long before he had a farmhouse much finer than that in which his brother lived, 
but the mill ground him so much money that he covered it with plates of gold, and the farmhouse lay close to the seashore, so it shone and glittered far out to sea. Everyone who sailed by there now had to put in to visit the rich man in the gold farmhouse, and every one wanted to see the wonderful mill, for the report of it spread far and wide, and there was no one who had not heard tell of it. After a long, long time a skipper came who wished to see the mill. He asked if it could make salt. Yes, it could make salt, said he who owned it, and when the skipper heard that he wished with all his might and main to have the mill, let it cost what it might, for he thought if he had it he would get off having to sail far away over the perilous sea for freights of salt. At first the man would not hear of parting with it, but the skipper begged and prayed, and at last the man sold it to him, and got many, many thousand dollars for it. When the skipper had the mill on his back, he did not stay long there, for he was so afraid that the man would change his mind, and he had no time to ask how he was to stop its grinding, but got on board his ship as fast as he could. When he had gone a little way out to sea, he took the mill on deck. Grind salt, and grind both quickly and well, said the skipper. So the mill began to grind salt till it spouted out like water, and when the skipper had the ship filled, he wanted to stop the mill. But whichever way he turned it, and howsoever much he tried, it went on grinding, and the heap of salt grew higher and higher, until at last the ship sank. There lies the mill at the bottom of the sea, and still, day by day, it grinds on. And that is why the sea is salt. End of chapter 86. Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter number 87 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggum goodbrand on the hillside there was once upon a time a man whose name was goodbrand he had a farm which lay far away up on the side of a hill and therefore they called him goodbrand on the hillside he and his wife lived so happily together and agreed so well that whatever the man did the wife thought it so well done that no one could do it better no matter what he did she thought it was always the right thing they lived on their own farm and had a hundred dollars at the bottom of their chest and two cows in their cow shed one day the woman said to goodbrand I think we ought to go to town with one of the cows and sell it, so that we may have some ready money by us. We are pretty well off, and ought to have a few shillings in our pocket like other people. The hundred dollars in the chest we mustn't touch, but I can't see what we want with more than one cow, and it will be much better for us as i shall have only one to look after instead of the two i have now to mind and feed yes goodbrand thought that was well and sensibly spoken he took the cow at once and went to town to sell it but when he got there no one would buy the cow ah well thought goodbrand i may as well take the cow home again I know I have both stall and food for it, and the way home is no longer than it was here. So he strolled homeward again with the cow. When he had got a bit on the way, he met a man who had a horse to sell. Goodbrand thought it was better to have a horse than a cow, and so he changed the cow for the horse. When he had gone a bit farther, he met a man who was driving a fat pig before him and then he thought it would be better to have a fat pig than a horse and so he changed with the man he now went a bit farther and then he met a man with a goat and so he thought it was surely better to have a goat than a pig 
and changed with the man who had the goat then he went a long way till he met a man who had a sheep he changed with him for he thought it was always better to have a sheep than a goat when he had got a bit farther he met a man with a goose and so he changed the sheep for the goose and when he had gone a long long way he met a man with a cock he changed the goose with him for he thought this wise it is surely better to have a cock than a goose he walked on till late in the day when he began to feel hungry so he sold the cock for sixpence and bought some food for himself for it is always better to keep body and soul together than to have a cock thought goodbrand then he set off again homeward till he came to his neighbor's farm and there he went in how did you get on in town asked the people oh only so-so said the man i can't boast of my luck nor can i grumble at it either and then he told them how it had gone with him from first to last well you'll have a fine reception when you get home to your wife said the man heaven help you i should not like to be in your place i think i might have fared much worse said goodbrand but whether i have fared well or ill i have such a kind wife that she never says anything no matter what i do eh so you say but you won't get me to believe it said the neighbor shall we have a wager on it said goodbrand i have a hundred dollars in my chest at home will you lay the same so they made the wager and goodbrand remained there till the evening when it began to get dark and then they went together to the farm the neighbor was to remain outside the door and listen while goodbrand went in to his wife good evening said goodbrand when he came in good evening said the wife heaven be praised you are back again yes here i am said the man and then the wife asked him how he had got on in town oh so so answered goodbrand not much to brag of when i came to town no one would buy the cow so i changed it for a horse oh i'm so glad of that said the woman we are pretty well off and we ought to drive to church like other people and when we can afford to keep a horse i don't see why we should not have one run out children and put the horse in the stable well i haven't got the horse after all said goodbrand for when i had got a bit on the way i changed it for a pig dear me cried the woman that's the very thing i should have done myself i'm so glad of it for now we can have some bacon in the house and something to offer people when they come to see us what do we want with a horse people will only say we have become so grand that we could no longer walk to church run out children and let the pig in but i haven't got the pig either said goodbrand for when i had got a bit farther on the road i changed it into a milch goat dear dear how well you manage everything cried his wife when i really come to think of it what do i want with the pig people would only say over yonder they eat up everything they have no now i have a goat i can have both milk and cheese and keep the goat into the bargain let in the goat children but i haven't got the goat either said goodbrand when i got a bit on the way i changed the goat and got a fine sheep for it well returned the woman you do everything just as i should wish it just as if i had been there myself what do we want with a goat i should have to climb up hill and down dale to get it home at night no when i have a sheep i can have wool and clothes in the house and food as well run out children and let in the sheep but i haven't got the sheep any longer said goodbrand 
for when i had got a bit on the way i changed it for a goose well thank you for that said the woman and many thanks too what do i want with a sheep i have neither wheel nor spindle and i do not care to toil and drudge making clothes we can buy clothes now as before now i can have goose fat which i have so long been wishing for and some feathers to stuff that little pillow of mine run children and let in the goose well i haven't got the goose either said goodbrand when i had got a bit farther on the way i changed it for a cock well i don't know how you can think of it all cried the woman it's just as if i had done it all myself a cock why it's just the same as if you'd bought an eight-day clock for every morning the cock will crow at four so we can be up in good time what do we want with a goose i can't make goose fat and i can easily fill my f pillow with some soft grass run children and let in the cock but i haven't the cock either said goodbrand for when i had got a bit farther i became so terribly hungry i had to sell the cock for sixpence and get some food to keep body and soul together heaven be praised you did that cried the woman whatever you do you always do the very thing i could have wished besides what did i want with the cock we are our own masters and can lie as long as we like in the mornings heaven be praised as long as i have got you back again and who manage everything so well i shall neither want cock nor goose nor pig nor cows goodbrand then opened the door have i won the hundred dollars now he asked and the neighbor was obliged to confess that he had End of chapter 87 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 88 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 88 The Pancake Once on a time there was a goody who had seven hungry bairns, and she was frying a pancake for them. It was a sweet milk pancake, and there it lay in the pan, bubbling and frizzling so thick and good, it was a sight for sore eyes to look at. And the bairn stood round about, and the good man sat by and looked on. "'Oh, give me a bit of pancake, mother dear, I am so hungry,' said one bairn. "'Oh, darling mother,' said the second. "'Oh, darling good mother,' said the third. "'Oh, darling good nice mother,' said the fourth. "'Oh, darling pretty good nice mother,' said the fifth. "'Oh, darling pretty good nice clever mother,' said the sixth. "'Oh, darling pretty good nice clever sweet mother,' said the seventh. So they begged for the pancake all round, and one more prettily than the other, for they were so hungry and so good. Yes, yes, bairns, only bide a bit till it turns itself. She ought to have said, till I can get it turned. But then you shall all have some, a lovely sweet milk pancake, only look how fat and happy it lies there. When the pancake heard that, it got afraid, and in a trice it turned itself all of itself and tried to jump out of the pan, but it fell back into it again, the other side up, and so when it had been fried a little on the other side too till it got firmer in its flesh it sprang out on the floor and rolled off like a wheel through the door and down the hill aloa stop pancake and away went the goody after it with the frying pan in one hand and the ladle in the other as fast as she could and her bairns behind her while the good man limped after them last of all hi won't you stop seize it stop pancake they all screamed out one after the other and tried to catch it on the run and hold it but the pancake rolled on and on and in the twinkling of an eye it was so far ahead that they couldn't see it for the pancake was faster on its feet than any of them so when it had rolled a while it met a man good day pancake said the man 
"'God bless you, Manny Panny,' said the pancake. "'Dear pancake,' said the man, "'don't roll so fast. Stop a little and let me eat you. "'When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman and seven squalling children, "'I may well slip through your fingers, Manny Panny,' said the pancake, "'and rolled on and on till it met a hen. "'Good day, pancake,' said the hen. "'The same to you, Henny Penny,' said the pancake. "'Pancake, dear, don't roll so fast.' "'Bide a bit, and let me eat you up,' said the hen. "'When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman "'and seven squalling children and Manny Panny, "'I may well slip through your claws, Henny Penny,' said the pancake, "'and so it rolled on like a wheel down the road. "'Just then it met a cock. "'Good day, Pancake,' said the cock. "'The same to you, Cocky Locky,' said the pancake. "'Pancake, dear, don't roll so fast, but bide a bit, and let me eat you up.' When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman and seven squalling children and to Manny Panny and Henny Penny, I may well slip through your claws, Cocky Locky, said the pancake, and off it set, rolling away as fast as it could, and when it had rolled a long way, it met a duck. Good day, pancake, said the duck. The same to you, Ducky Lucky. Pancake, dear, don't roll away so fast. Bide a bit and let me eat you up. When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman and seven squalling children and Manny Panny and Henny Penny and Cocky Locky, I may well slip through your fingers, Ducky Lucky, said the pancake, and with that it took to rolling and rolling faster than ever, and when it had rolled a long, long while, it met a goose. Good day, pancake, said the goose. The same to you, goosey poosey. Pancake, dear, don't roll so fast. Bide a bit and let me eat you up. When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman and seven squalling children and Manny Panny and Henny Penny and Cocky Locky and Ducky Lucky, I can well slip through your feet, Goosey Poosey, said the pancake, and off it rolled. So when it had rolled a long, long way farther, it met a gander. Good day, pancake, said the gander. The same to you, gander pander, said the pancake. Pancake, dear, don't roll so fast. Bide a bit and let me eat you up. When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman and seven squalling children and Manny Panny and Henny Penny and Cocky Locky and Ducky Lucky and Goosey Poosey, I may well slip through your feet, Gander Pander, said the pancake, and it rolled off as fast as ever. So when it had rolled a long, long time, it met a pig. Good day, pancake, said the pig. The same to you, Piggy Wiggy, said the pancake, which, without a word more, began to roll and roll like mad. "'Nay, nay,' said the pig, "'you needn't be in such a hurry. "'We two can then go side by side "'and see each other over the wood. "'They say it is not too safe in there.' "'The pancake thought there might be something in that, "'and so they kept company. "'But when they had gone a while, "'they came to a brook. "'As for Piggy, he was so fat, "'he swam safely across. "'It was nothing to him, "'but the poor pancake couldn't get over. "'Seat yourself on my snout,' said the pig, "'and I'll carry you over.' So the pancake did that. Oof, oof, said the pig, and swallowed the pancake in one gulp, and then, as the poor pancake could go no farther, why, this story can go no farther either. End of chapter 88 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 89 of Tales of Laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Death of Chancellor. Once on a time, there was a cock and a hen who walked out into the field and scratched and scraped and scrabbled. All at once Chanticleer found a burr of hop, and Partlet found a barley corn, and they said they would make malt and brew yule ale. Oh, I pluck barley, and I malt malt, and I brew ale, and the ale is good, crackled Dame Partlet. Is the wart strong enough? crew Chancellor. As he crowed, he flew up on the edge of the cask and tried to have a taste, 
But just as he bent over to drink a drop he took to flapping his wings, and so he fell head over heels into the cask and was drowned. When Dame Partlet saw that, she clean lost her wits and flew up into the chimney corner and fell a screaming and screeching out harm in the house harm in the house she screeched out all in a breath and there was no stopping her what ails you dame partlet that you sit there sobbing and sighing said the hand quern why not said dame partlet when goodman chancellor has fallen into the cask and drowned himself and lies dead that's why i sigh and sob well if i can do naught else i will grind and groan said the hand quern and so it fell to grinding as fast as it could when the chair heard that it said what ails you hand quern that you grind and groan so fast and oft why not when goodman chancellor has fallen into the cask and drowned himself and dame partlet sits in the ingle and sighs and sobs that's why i grind and groan said the hand quern if i can do naught else i will crack said the chair and with that he fell to creaking and cracking when the door heard that it said what's the matter why do you creak and crack so mr chair why not said the chair goodman chancellor has fallen into the cask and drowned himself dame partlet sits in the ingle sighing and sobbing and the hand quern grimes and groans that's why i creak and crackle and croak and crack well said the door if i can do naught else i can rattle and bang and whistle and slam and with that it began to open and shut and bang and slam it deaved one to hear and all one's teeth chattered all this the stove heard and it opened its mouth and called out door door why all this slamming and banging why not said the door when goodman chancellor has fallen into the cask and drowned himself dame parlette sits in the ingle sighing and sobbing the hand quern grinds and groans and the chair creaks and cracks that's why i bang and slam well said the stove if i can do naught else i can smolder and smoke so it fell a smoking and steaming till the room was all in a cloud the axe saw this as it stood outside and peeped with its shaft through the window what's all this smoke about mr stove said the axe in a sharp voice why not said the stove when goodman chancellor has fallen into the cask and drowned himself dame partlet sits in the ingle sighing and sobbing the hand quern grinds and groans the chair creaks and cracks the door bangs and slams that's why i smoke and steam well if i can do naught else i can riv and rend said the axe and with that it fell to riving and rending all around about this the aspen stood by and saw why do you riv and rend everything so mr axe said the aspen goodman chancellor has fallen into the ale cask and drowned himself said the axe dame parlet is sitting in the ingle sighing and sobbing the hand quern grinds and groans the chair creaks and cracks the door slams and bangs and the stove smokes and steams that's why i riv and rend all about well if i can do naught else said the aspen i can quiver and quake in all my leaves so it grew all of a quake the birds saw this and twittered out why do you quiver and quake miss aspen goodman chancellor has fallen into the owl cask 
and drowned himself said the aspen with trembling voice dame partlet sits in the ingle sighing and sobbing the handquern grinds and groans the chair creaks and cracks the door slams and bangs the stove steams and smokes and the axe rives and rends that's why i quiver and quake well if we can do naught else we will pluck off all our feathers said the birds and with that they fell a piling and plucking themselves till the room was full of feathers this the master stood by and saw and when the feathers flew about like fun he asked the birds why do you pluck off all your feathers you birds oh goodman chancellor has fallen into the ale cask and drowned himself twittered out the birds dame parlet sits sighing and sobbing in the ingle the handcorn grinds and groans the chair creaks and cracks the door slams and bangs the stove smokes and steams the axe rives and rends and the aspen quivers and quakes that's why we are piling and plucking all our feathers off well if i can do nothing else i can tear the brooms asunder said the man with that he fell tearing and tossing the brooms till the birch twigs fell about east and west the goody stood cooking porridge for supper and saw all this why man she called out what are you tearing the brooms to bits for oh said the man goodman Ch chancellor has fallen into the ale vat and drowned himself dame parlet sits sighing and sobbing in the ingle the handquern grinds and groans the chair cracks and creaks the door slams and bangs the stove smokes and steams the axe rives and rends the aspen quivers and quakes the birds are piling and plucking all their feathers off and that's why i am tearing the besoms two bits so so said the goody then i'll dash the porridge all over the walls and she did it for she took one spoonful after the other and dashed it against the walls so that no one could see what they were made of for very porridge that is was how they drank the burial ale after goodman chancellor who fell into the brewing vat and was drowned and if you don't believe it you may set off thither and have a taste both of the ale and the porridge end of chapter eighty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter ninety of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 90. Reynard Wants to Taste Horse Flesh. One day, as Bruin lay by a horse which he had slain and was hard at work eating it, Reynard came along that way and came up spying about and licking his lips to see if he might get a taste of the horse flesh. So he doubled and turned till he got just behind Bruin's back, and then he jumped on the other side of the carcass and snapped a mouthful as he ran by. Bruin was not slow either, for he made a grab at Reynard and caught the tip of his red brush in his paw, and ever since then Reynard's brush is white at the tip, as any one may see. But that day Bruin was merry and called out, Bide a bit, Reynard, and come hither, and I'll tell you how to catch a horse for yourself. Yes, Reynard was ready enough to learn, but he did not for all that trust himself to go very close to Bruin. Listen, said Bruin, when you see a horse asleep, basking in the sunshine, you must mind and bind yourself fast by the hair of his tail to your brush, and then you must make your teeth meet in the flesh of his thigh. As you may fancy, it was not long before Reynard found out a horse that lay asleep in the sunshine, and then he did as Bruin had told him, for he knotted and bound himself well into the hair of his tail, and made his teeth meet in the horse's thigh. 
Up sprang the horse and began to kick and rear and gallop, so that Reynard was dashed against stock and stone and got battered black and blue, so that he was not far off losing both wit and sense. And while the horse galloped, they passed Jack Longears, the hare. "'Whither away so fast, Reynard?' cried Jack Longears. "'Post haste on business of life and death, dear Jack,' cried Reynard. And with that, Jack stood upon his hind legs and laughed till his sides ached and his jaws split right up to his ears. It was so funny to see Reynard ride post haste. But you must know, since that ride, Reynard has never thought of catching a horse for himself. For that once, at least, it was Bruin who had the best of it in wit, though they do say he is nearly always as simple-minded as the trolls. End of chapter 90 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 91 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 91. Bruin and Reynard Partners. Once on a time, Bruin and Reynard were to own a field in common. They had a little clearing up in the wood, and the first year they sowed rye. "'Now we must share the crop as is fair and right,' said Reynard. "'If you like to have the root, I'll take the top.' Yes, Broom was ready to do that, but when they had threshed out the crop, Reynard got all the corn, but Bruin got nothing but roots and rubbish. He did not like that at all, but Reynard said it was how they had agreed to share it. "'This year I have the gain,' said Reynard. "'Next year it will be your turn.' Then you shall have the top, and I shall have to put up with the root. But when the spring came and it was time to sow, Reynard asked Bruin what he thought of turnips. Ay, ay, said Bruin, that's better food than corn, and so Reynard thought also. But when harvest came, Reynard got the roots while Bruin got the turnip tops. And then Bruin was so angry with Reynard that he put an end at once to his partnership with him. End of chapter 91 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 92 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 92. Pork and Honey. At dawn the other day, when Bruin came tramping over the bog with a fat pig, Reynard sat up on a stone by the moorside. "'Good day, grandsire,' said the fox. "'What's that so nice that you have there?' "'Pork,' said Bruin. "'Well, I have got a dainty bit, too,' said Reynard. "'What is that?' asked the bear. "'The biggest wild bee's comb I ever saw in my life,' said Reynard. "'Indeed, you don't say so,' said Bruin, who grinned and licked his lips. He thought it would be so nice to taste a little honey. At last he said, "'Shall we swap our fare?' "'Nay, nay,' said Reynard, "'I can't do that.' The end was that they made a bet and agreed to name three trees. If the fox could say them off faster than the bear, he was to have leave to take one bite of the bacon. But if the bear could say them faster, he was to have leave to take one sup out of the comb. Greedy Bruin thought he was sure to sup out all the honey in one breath. Well, said Reynard, it's all fair and right, no doubt, but all I say is, if I win, you shall be bound to tear off the bristles where I am to bite. Of course, said Bruin, I'll help you as you can't help yourself. So they were to begin and name the trees. Fir, scotch fir, spruce, growled out Bruin, for he was gruff in his tongue, that he was. But for all that he only named two trees, for fir and scotch fir are both the same. Ash, aspen, oak, screamed Reynard, so that the wood rang again. So he had won the wager, and down he ran and took the heart out of the pig at one bite, and was just running off with it, but Bruin was angry because Reynard had taken the best bit out of the whole pig, and so he laid hold of his tail and held him fast. Stop a bit, stop a bit, he said, and was wild with rage. Never mind, said the fox, it's all right, let me go, grandsire, and I'll give you a taste of my honey. When Bruin heard that, he let go his hold, and away went Reynard after the honey. 
Here, on this honeycomb, said Reynard, lies a leaf, and under this leaf is a hole, and that hole you are to suck. As he said this, he held up the comb under the bear's nose, took off the leaf, jumped up on a stone, and began to gibber and laugh, for there was neither honey nor honeycomb, but a wasp's nest, as big as a man's head, full of wasps, and out swarmed the wasps, and settled on Bruin's head, and stung him in the eyes and ears and mouth and snout, and he had such hard work to rid himself of them, that he had no time to think of Reynard. And that's why, ever since that day, Bruin is so afraid of wasps. End of chapter 92 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 93 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 93 How Reynard Outwitted Bruin Once on a time there was a bear who sat on a hillside in the sun and slept. Just then Reynard came slouching by and caught sight of him. "'There you sit, taking your ease, grandsire,' said the fox. "'Now see if I don't play you a trick.' So he went and caught three field mice and laid them on a stump close under Bruin's nose, and then he bawled out into his ear, "'Bo, Bruin, here's Peter the hunter just behind this stump.' And as he bawled this out, he ran off through the wood as fast as ever he could. Bruin woke up with a start, and when he saw the three little mice, he was as mad as a March hare, and was going to lift up his paw and crush them, for he thought it was they who had bellowed in his ear. But just as he lifted it, he caught sight of Reynard's tail among the bushes in the woodside, and away he set after him, so that the underwood crackled as he went, and to tell the truth, Bruin was so close upon Reynard that he caught hold of his off hind foot, just as he was crawling into an earth under a pine root. So there was Reynard in a pinch, but for all that he had his wits about him, for he screeched out, Slip the pine root and catch Reynard's foot! And so the silly bear let his foot slip and laid hold of the root instead. But by that time Reynard was safe inside the earth and called out, I cheated you that time, didn't I, grandsire? Out of sight isn't out of mind, growled Bruin down the earth, and was wild with rage. End of chapter 93 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 94 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 94 Nanny Who Wouldn't Go Home to Supper there was once upon a time a woman who had a son and a goat. The son was called Espen, and the goat was called Nanny. But they were not good friends and did not get on together, for the goat was perverse and wayward, as goats will be, and she would never go home at the right time for her supper. So it happened one evening that Espen went out to fetch her home, and when he had been looking for her a while, he saw Nanny high, high up on a crag. "'My dear Nanny, you must not stay any longer up there. "'You must come home now. It is just supper time. "'I am so hungry and want my supper.' "'No, I shan't,' said Nanny. "'Not before I have finished the grass on this tussock, "'and that tussock, and this and that tussock.' "'Then I'll go and tell Mother,' said the lad. "'That you may, and then I shall be left to eat in peace,' said Nanny. "'So Espen went and told his mother. "'Go to the fox and ask him to bite Nanny,' said his mother." The lad went to the fox. My dear fox, bite Nanny, for Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and I want my supper, said Espen. No, I don't want to spoil my snout on pig's bristles and goat's beard, said the fox. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the wolf, said his mother. The lad went to the wolf. My dear wolf, tear the fox, for the fox won't bite Nanny and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and I want my supper. No, said the wolf, I won't wear out my paws and teeth on a skinny fox. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the bear and ask him to slay the wolf, said the mother. The lad went to the bear. My dear bear, slay the wolf, for the wolf won't tear the fox, and the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. 
No, that I won't, said the bear. I don't want to wear out my claws for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the Finn and ask him to shoot the bear. The lad went to the Finn. My dear Finn, shoot the bear, for the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the Finn. I am not going to shoot away my bullets for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the fir, said the mother, and ask it to crush the Finn. The lad went to the fir tree. My dear fir, crush the fin, for the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the fir. I am not going to break my boughs for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the fire, said his mother, and ask it to burn the fir. The lad went to the fire. My dear fire, burn the fir, for the fir won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the fire. I am not going to burn myself out for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the water and ask it to quench the fire, she said. The lad went to the water. My dear water, quench the fire, for the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the water. I am not going to waste myself for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the ox, said she, and ask him to drink up the water. The lad went to the ox. My dear ox, Drink up the water, for the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the ox. I am not going to burst myself for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the yoke, said she, and ask it to throttle the ox. The lad went to the yoke. My dear yoke, throttle the ox, for the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the yoke. I am not going to break myself in two for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the axe, said she, and tell it to split the yoke. The lad went to the axe. My dear axe, split the yoke, for the yoke won't throttle the ox, the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the axe. I am not going to blunt my edge for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the smith, said she, and ask him to hammer the axe. The lad went to the smith. My dear smith, hammer the axe, for the axe won't split the yoke. The yoke won't throttle the ox, the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the smith. I will not burn my coals and wear out my sledgehammers for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the rope, said she, and ask it to hang the smith. The lad went to the rope. My dear rope, hang the smith, for the smith won't hammer the axe, the axe won't split the oak, the oak won't throttle the ox, the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the rope. I am not going to break in two for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the mouse, said she, and ask her to gnaw the rope. The lad went to the mouse. My dear mouse, gnaw the rope, for the rope won't hang the smith, the smith won't hammer the axe, the axe won't split the oak, the oak won't throttle the ox, the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. 
No, I will not, said the mouse. I am not going to wear out my teeth for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the cat, said she, and ask her to catch the mouse. The lad went to the cat. My dear cat, catch the mouse, for the mouse won't gnaw the rope, the rope won't hang the smith, the smith won't hammer the axe, the axe won't split the yoke, the yoke won't throttle the ox, the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite nanny, and nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. Yes, but give me a drop of milk for my kittens, and then, said the cat, yes, that she should have. So the cat caught the mouse, and the mouse gnawed the rope, and the rope hanged the smith, and the smith hammered the axe, and the axe split the yoke, and the yoke throttled the ox, and the ox drank the water, and the water quenched the fire, and the fire burned the fur, and the fur crushed the fin, and the fin shot the bear, and the bear slew the wolf, and the wolf tore the fox, and the fox bit Nanny, and Nanny took to her heels, scampered home, and ran against the burn wall, and broke one of her legs. Ma bleated the goat. There she lay, and if she isn't dead, she is still limping about on three legs. But Espen said it served her right, because she would not come home in time for supper that day. End of chapter 94 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 95 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin The box with something pretty in it. Once on a time there was a little boy who was out walking on the road, and when he had walked a bit he found a box. I am sure there must be something pretty in this box, he said to himself, but however much he turned it, and however much he twisted it, he was not able to get it open. But when he had walked a bit further, he found a little tiny key. Then he grew tired and sat down, and all at once he thought what fun it would be if the key fitted the box, for it had a little keyhole in it. So he took the little key out of his pocket, and then he blew first into the pipe of the key, and afterward into the keyhole, and then he put the key into the keyhole and turned it. Snap! It went within the lock, and when he tried the hasp, the box was open. But can you guess what there was in the box? Why, a cow's tail! And if the cow's tail had been longer, this story would have been longer, too. End of chapter 95 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 96 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Hill Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 96 The Farmer and the Troll A troll once lived in a little hill that stood in the corner of a farm. Thinking that the ground should not lie idle, the farmer came one day and began to plough it up. He had hardly begun when the troll appeared and asked, "'How dare you plough in the roof of my house?' "'I did not know it was the roof of your house,' returned the farmer. "'I thought it a pity to let such a good piece of land lie idle, and I think so still. Let me make an agreement with you.' "'What is your agreement?' said the troll. "'Well, let me see. I will plough, so." and reap the ground every year, and we will take the produce year and year about. One year you will take what grows above ground, and I will take what grows below. Then we can change around, and I will take what grows above ground, and you what grows below. What do you say? Very well, answered the troll. That will satisfy me. The agreement was then made. 
but the crafty farmer took care to sow carrots the year the troll was to have what grew above ground and corn the year the troll was to have what grew below so the poor elf got only carrot tops and corn roots however he was content and the farmer and he lived for years amicably under this arrangement End of chapter ninety six chapter ninety seven of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin one's own children always prettiest once upon a time a man went out shooting in a forest and there he met a woodcock pray don't shoot my children cried the woodcock what are your children like asked the man mine are the prettiest children in the forest answered the woodcock i suppose i mustn't shoot them then said the man when he came back he carried in his hand a whole string of young woodcocks which he had shot oh dear oh dear why you have shot my children after all wept the woodcock are these yours said the man why i shot the ugliest i could find yes yes answered the woodcock but don't you know that every one thinks his own children the prettiest end of chapter ninety seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter ninety eight of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter ninety eight The Princess Whom Nobody Could Silence. There was once upon a time a king, and he had a daughter who would always have the last word. She was so perverse and contrary in her speech that no one could silence her. So the king therefore promised that he who could outwit the princess should have her in marriage and half the kingdom besides. There were plenty of those who wanted to try, I can assure you, for it isn't every day that a princess and half a kingdom are to be had. The gate to the palace hardly ever stood still. The suitors came in swarms and flocks from east and west, both riding and walking, but there was no one who could silence the princess. At last the king announced that those who tried and did not succeed should be branded on both ears with a large iron. He would not have all this running about the palace for nothing. So there were three brothers who had also heard about the princess, and as they were rather badly off at home, they thought they would try their luck and see if they could win the princess and half the kingdom. They were good friends, and so they agreed to set out together. When they had got a bit on the way, Ashypaddle found a dead magpie. I have found something, I have found something, cried he. What have you found? asked the brothers. I have found a dead magpie, said he. Oh, throw it away. What can you do with that? said the other two, who always believed they were the wisest. Oh, I've nothing else to do. I can easily carry it, said Ashypaddle. When they had gone on a bit farther, Ashypaddle found an old willow twig, which he picked up. I have found something, I have found something, he cried. What have you found now, said the brothers. I have found a willow twig, said he. Oh, what are you going to do with that? Throw it away, said the two. I have nothing else to do. I can easily carry it with me, said Ashypaddle. When they had gone still farther, he found a broken saucer, which he also picked up. Here, lads, I have found something, I have found something, said he. Well, what have you found now, asked the brothers. A broken saucer, said he. Oh, is it worth while dragging that along with you too? Throw it away, said the brothers. Oh, I've nothing else to do. I can easily carry it with me, said Ashypaddle. When they had gone a bit farther, he found a crooked goat horn, and soon after he found the fellow to it. I have found something, I have found something, lad, said he. What have you found now, said the others. Two goat horns, answered Ashypaddle. Oh, throw them away. 
"'What are you going to do with them?' said they. "'Oh, I have nothing else to do. I can easily carry them with me,' said Ashy-Paddle. In a little while he found a wedge. "'I say, lads, I have found something. I have found something,' he cried. "'You are everlastingly finding something. What have you found now?' asked the two eldest. "'I have found a wedge,' he answered. "'Oh, throw it away. What are you going to do with it?' said they. "'Oh, I have nothing else to do. I can easily carry it with me,' said Ashy-Paddle. As he went across the king's fields, which had been freshly manured, he stooped down and took up an old boot-sole. "'Hello, lads, I have found something. I have found something,' said he. "'Heaven grant you may find a little sense before you get to the palace,' said the two. "'What is it you have found now?' "'An old boot-sole,' said he. "'Is that anything worth picking up? Throw it away.' "'What are you going to do with it?' said the brothers. "'Oh, I have nothing else to do. I can easily carry it with me, and who knows, it may help me to win the princess and half the kingdom,' said Ashy-Paddle. "'Yes, you look a likely one, don't you?' said the other two. So they went in to the princess, the eldest first. "'Good day,' said he. "'Good day to you,' answered she, with a shrug. "'It's terribly hot here,' said he. "'It's hotter in the fire,' said the princess.' The branding iron was lying waiting in the fire. When he saw this, he was struck speechless, and so it was all over with him. The second brother fared no better. Good day, said he. Good day to you, said she, with a wriggle. It's terribly hot here, said he. It's hotter in the fire, said she. With that he lost both speech and wits, and so the iron had to be brought out. Then came Ashypaddle's turn. Good day, said he. "'Good day to you,' said she, with a shrug and a wriggle. "'It's very nice and warm here,' said Ashy-Paddle. "'It's warmer in the fire,' she answered. She was in no better humour now she saw the third suitor. "'Then there's a chance for me to roast my magpie on it,' said he, bringing it out. "'I'm afraid it will sputter,' said the princess. "'No fear of that. I'll tie this willow twig around it,' said the lad. "'You can't tie it tight enough,' said she. "'Then I'll drive in a wedge,' said the lad, and brought out the wedge. "'The fat will be running off it,' said the princess. "'Then I'll hold this under it,' said the lad, and showed her the broken saucer. "'You are so crooked in your speech,' said the princess. "'No, I am not crooked,' answered the lad. "'But this is crooked,' and he brought out one of the goat horns. "'Well, I've never seen the like,' cried the princess. "'Here you see the like,' said he, and he brought out the other horn.' "'It seems you have come here to wear out my soul,' she said. "'No, I have not come here to wear out your soul, "'for I have one here which is already worn out,' answered the lad, "'and brought out the old boot sole. "'The princess was so dumbfounded at this that she was completely silenced. "'Now you are mine,' said Ashy-Paddle, "'and so he got her and half the kingdom into the bargain. "'End of chapter 98 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 99 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Laura Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Money Box. In a nursery where a number of toys lay scattered about, a money box stood on the top of a very high wardrobe. It was made of clay in the shape of a pig, and has been bought of the potter. In the back of the pig was a slit, and this slit has been enlarged with a knife, so that dollars or crown pieces might slip through, and, indeed, there were two crown pieces in the box besides a number of pence. The money pig was stuffed so full that it could no longer rattle, which is the highest state of perfection to which a money pig can attain. There he stood upon the cupboard, high and lofty, looking down upon everything else in the room. He knew very well that he had enough inside him to buy up all the other toys, and this gave him a very good opinion of his own value. The rest thought of this fact also, although they did not speak of it, for there were so many other things to talk about. 
a large doll still handsome though rather old for her neck had been mended lay inside one of the drawers which was partially open she called out to the others let us have a game at being men and women that is worth playing at upon this there was a great uproar even the engravings which hung in frames on the wall turned round in their excitement and showed that they had a wrong side to them although they had not the least intention to expose themselves in this way or to object to the game it was late at night but as the moon shone through the windows they had light at a cheap rate and as the game was now to begin all were invited to take part in it even the children's wagon which certainly belonged to the coarser plague things each has its own value said the wagon we cannot all be noblemen there must be some to do the work the money pig was the only one who received a written invitation he stood so high that they were afraid he would not accept a verbal message but in his reply he said that if he had to take part he must enjoy the sport from his own home they were to arrange for him to do so and they did the little toy theater was therefore put up in such a way that the money pig could look directly into it some wanted to begin with a comedy and afterward to have a tea party and a discussion for mental improvement but they commenced with the latter first the rocking horse spoke of training and races the wagon of railways and steam power for these subjects belonged to each of their professions, and it was right they should talk of them. The clock talked politics. Tick, tick, he professed to know what the time of day. But there was a whisper that he did not go correctly. The bamboo cane stood by, looking stiff and proud. He was vain of his brass for rule and silver top and on the sofa lay two worked cushions pretty but stupid when the play at the little theatre began the rest sat and looked on they were requested to applaud and stamp and the whip to crack when they felt gratified with what they saw but the riding whip said he never cracked for old people only for the young who were not yet married i crack for everybody said the cracker yes and a fine noise you make thought the audience as the play went on it was not worth much but it was very well played and all the characters turned their painted sides to the audience for they were made only to be seen on one side the acting was wonderful excepting that sometimes they came out beyond the lamps because the wires were a little too long the doll whose neck had been darned was so excited that the place in her neck burst and the money pig declared he must do something for one of the players as they had all pleased him so much so he made up his mind to mention one of them in his will as the one to be buried with him in the family vault whenever that event should happen they all enjoyed the comedy so much that they gave up all thoughts of the tea-party and only carried out their idea of intellectual amusement which they called playing at men and women and there was nothing wrong about it for it was only play all the while each one thought most of himself or of what the money pig could be thinking his thoughts were on as he supposed a very distant time of making his will and of his burial and of when it might all come to pass certainly sooner than he expected for all at once down he came from the top of the press fell on the ground and was broken to pieces then the pennies hopped and danced about in the most amusing manner the little ones twirled round like tops and the large ones rolled away as far as they could especially one of the great silver crown pieces who had often wanted to go out into the world and now he had his wish as well as all the rest of the money 
the pieces of the money pig were thrown into the dust bin and the next day there stood a new money pig on the cupboard but it had not a farthing in its inside yet and therefore it could not rattle like the old one this was the beginning with him and we will make it the end of our story hans christian anderson end of chapter ninety nine recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 100 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B. C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Darning Needle. Once upon a time there was a darning needle which thought itself so fine and grand it ought to have been a sewing needle. Be careful, it said to the fingers which held it. Be sure you don't let me fall, for I am so thin you will never find me again that's what you think said the fingers as they closed firmly round its body look out i am followed by my train said the darning needle and a long thread came trailing behind it but the thread had no knot in it the fingers guided the needle straight toward the cook's slipper there was a little tear in the leather and it must be mended this sort of work is quite beneath me said the needle i can never do it i shall break i know i shall and break it did did not i tell you i was too slender for such a task asked the darning needle there now you are good for nothing said the fingers but they still held the needle firmly and soon they had fixed a ball of sealing wax on the top the cook now used it as a pin to fasten her scarf. Ho, ho, so I'm a scarf pin now. I always knew I should make my way in the world. Worth always tells in the end, said the needle, and it chuckled to itself, although you could not see it do so. A darning needle never lets you see it laugh. This one sat bolt upright and gazed in all directions just as if it were riding in a state carriage might i be allowed to inquire if you are made of gold it asked of its neighbor a pin you have a very bright look and a head of your own though it is ridiculously small you must do your best to grow it a bit of course it is not everyone who is decorated with a ball of red sealing wax the darning needle drew itself up so proudly as it said this that it overbalanced and fell out of the scarf into the sink which the cook at the moment was rinsing down now i am going to see the world thought the needle i hope i shall not lose myself but lose itself it did and as it was washed through a long greasy pipe and carried away into the gutter it said i am not coarse and strong enough to hold my own in this world but i know who and what i am and that's a great comfort and the darning needle kept its proud bearing and did not lose its bright way of looking at things although all sorts of objects passed over it chips of wood and pieces of straw and old newspaper look how they sail it said but they little know what lies beneath them i stick fast here and there goes a chip a mere chip looking as though it was all the world and there's a straw floating by too how it whirls round and round it had better take care lest it run against a stone ah and now there is a piece of newspaper giving itself such airs too as if all that was printed on it were not forgotten long ago 
I have to sit still, patiently and alone, but I know who I am, and that I shall continue still to be, and that is a great comfort. One day a piece of glass bottle lay beside the darning needle, and because it glittered so splendidly the needle thought it must certainly be a diamond, so it spoke and introduced itself. Good morning, it said. I am a scarf pin. I believe I have the pleasure of speaking to a diamond? Yes, I am a member of that family, I believe, was the answer. And thus they both thought each other very superior, and spoke together of the vanity and pride of the world. I lived in a girl's workbox, the darning needle said. She was a cook, and had five fingers on each hand but I never saw anything so conceited as those fingers in my life. And after all is said and done, they were only there to take me out and put me back into the box again. Were they very aristocratic then? The piece of glass asked. Aristocratic? No, but very proud. They were brothers, all born fingers, and they kept to themselves. They were various heights, too. The first, named the thumb, was short and broad, and held himself rather aloof from the others. He only had one joint in his back, so could only make one bow, but he said a man could not be a soldier unless he possessed one like him on his hand. The second was called Sweet Tooth and was used to put into sweet and sour dishes, to point to the sky and the stars, and make the downstrokes of the pen when the fingers wrote a letter. Long one was the third, and could look over all the heads of the others. Ringgold, the fourth, wore a gold belt round his waist, and the last one of all was Playboy, who never did a stroke of work, and was proud of it. But I had to leave them, said the needle. They could do nothing but boast. And now here we sit and glitter, murmured the piece of glass. But at that moment the water came rushing along the gutter and carried off the piece of glass in its arms. He has received promotion already, said the darning needle. It is my pride that stands in my way. I am so very fine, and I am quite right to keep myself to myself, and it sat up erect and proud, and was filled with great thoughts. I surely must be the child of some sunbeam, it thought. I am so very fine, and the sunbeams always seem to me to be trying to find me beneath the water. Perhaps I am too slender for my mother to be able to see me. I am sure if I had my old eye that was broken off, I should cry. But I won't. It is not well bred to cry. Then one day some rag muffins came poking in the gutter to find farthings and old nails and other such precious things. It was very muddy and dirty, but they only enjoyed it the better for that. Ugh! cried one as the darning needle ran into his fingers. Ugh, you great ugly fellow! I am a miss, and not a fellow, shrieked the darning needle, but no one heard it. The ball of sealing wax had fallen off, and the needle had turned quite black, but it felt more pleased with itself than ever, for one looks so much slimmer in black. Here, let us stick it into this eggshell they called, and the darning needle was fixed firmly. These white walls must be very becoming to me, the darning needle thought. I shall show up well against them, and shall certainly be seen at last. I hope I shall not become seasick or break. But the darning needle became neither seasick, nor did it break. A steel stomach is a good preventative against seasickness and it did not forget that it was something better than a mere man. Really, the finer one is, the more one can bear, it thought. Crack! groaned the eggshell as the wheels of a cart passed over it. 
gracious heavens how it presses gasped the darning needle i do believe i am going to be seasick after all i shall break but although the heavy cart rolled over it it did not break only lay stretched full length in the mud and there it may stay for there is no more of its story worth listening to hans christian anderson end of chapter one hundred recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter one o one of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggum master of all masters a girl once went to the fair to hire herself for a servant at last a funny-looking old gentleman engaged her and took her home to his house when she got there he told her that he had something to teach her for that in his house he had his own names for things he said to her what will you call me master or mister or whatever you please sir says she he said you must call me master of all masters and what would you call this pointing to his bed bed or couch or whatever you please sir no that's my barnacle and what do you call these said he pointing to his pantaloons breeches or trousers or whatever you please sir you must call them squibs and crackers and what would you call her pointing to the cat cat or kit or whatever you please sir you must call her white face simony and this now showing the fire what would you call this fire or flame or whatever you please sir you must call it hot cockalorum and what this he went on pointing to the water water or wet or whatever you please sir no pondalorum is its name and what do you call all this asked he as he pointed to the house house or cottage or whatever you please sir you must call it high topper mountain that very night the servant woke up her master in a fright and said master of all masters get out of your barnacle and put on your squibs and crackers for white-faced simony has got a spark of hot cockalorum on his tail and unless you get some pondalorum high topper mountain will be all on hot cockalorum that's all end of chapter 101 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter 102 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 102. Belling the Cat. Once upon a time, the mice sat in council and talked of how they might outwit their enemy, the cat. But good advice was scarce and in vain the president called upon all the most experienced mice present to find a way. At last a very young mouse held up two fingers and asked to be allowed to speak, and as soon as he could get permission he said, I've been thinking for a long time why the cat is such a dangerous enemy. Now it's not so much because of her quickness, though people make so much fuss about that. If we could only notice her in time, I've no doubt we're nimble enough to jump into our holes before she could do us any harm. It's in her velvet paws. There's where she hides her cruel claws till she gets us in her clutches. That's where her power lies. With those paws, she can tread so lightly that we can't hear her coming. 
and so, while we are still dancing heedlessly about the place, she creeps close up, and before we know where we are, she pounces down on us and has us in her clutches. Well, then, it's my opinion we ought to hang a bell round her neck to warn us of her coming while there's yet time. Everyone applauded this proposal, and the council decided that it should be carried out. Now the question to be settled was, who should undertake to fasten the bell round the cat's neck? The president declared that no one could be better fitted for the task than he who had given such excellent advice. But at that the young mouse became quite confused and stammered an excuse. He was too young for the deed, he said. He didn't know the cat well enough. His grandfather, who knew her better, would be more suited to the job. But the grandfather declared that, just because he knew the cat very well, he would take good care not to attempt such a task. And the long and the short of it was that no other mouse would undertake the duty, and so this clever proposal was never carried out, and the cat remained mistress of the situation. End of chapter 102 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 103 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Magpie and Her Children Said a magpie to her children, It's high time you learn to look for your own food. It is indeed. And with that she turned the whole lot of them out of their nest and took them into the fields. But the magpie's children didn't care about that. We'd rather go back to our nest, they cried. It's so comfortable to have you bringing our food to us in your beak. I dare say, said their mother, but you're big enough to feed yourselves. I was turned out of the nest when I was much younger. I can tell you that. But people will kill us with their bows and arrows, said the young magpies. No fear of that, replied their mother. People can't shoot without taking aim, and that takes time. When you see them raising their bows to their faces, ready to draw, you must just fly away. We might do that, said the children, but if someone were to throw a stone at us, he wouldn't have to take aim. Well, you'll see him stooping down to pick up the stone, said the old magpie. But supposing he carries a stone in his hand, ready, why, if you're sharp enough to think of that, said their mother, you're sharp enough to take care of yourselves. And with that, she flew away and left them. End of chapter 103 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 104 of Tales of Laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Cock, the Cockatoo, and the Black Cock. Once upon a time the cock, the cockatoo, and the black cock bought a cow between them, but when they came to share it, and couldn't agree which should buy the others out, they settled among them that he who woke first in the morning should have the cow. So the cock woke first. Now the cow is mine. Now the cow is mine. Hurrah! Hurrah! He crew. And so pleased was he that in his excitement he awoke the cockatoo. Half cow, half cow, sang the cockatoo, and woke up the black cock. A like share, a like share, dear friends, that's only fair. Saw see, see saw, that's what the black cock said. 
and now can you tell me which one of them ought to have the cow end of chapter 104 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 105 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Race Between Hare and Hedgehog It was once upon a time on a Saturday morning in autumn, all the barley fields were still in bloom. The sun was shining, the morning wind was blowing over the stubble, the larks were singing high in the air, the bees were buzzing in the barley blossoms, and the people were going blithely about their day's work. In short, all the world was happy, and the hedgehog too. The hedgehog stood in front of his door with folded arms, looked at the weather, and hummed a tune as only a hedgehog can hum on a Saturday morning. Now, as he stood there humming, he thought to himself all at once, while his wife was washing and dressing the children, he might as well go for a little walk in the fields and see how his turnips were getting on. The turnips grew near his house, and he and his family ate as many of them as ever they wanted, and so he looked upon them quite naturally as his property. Well, the hedgehog slammed his door and started for the turnip field. He hadn't got very far, and was just sauntering round the briar bush that stood outside the field, when he met the hare, who was out on the same errand, namely, to look at his cabbages. When the hedgehog caught sight of the hare, he gave him a pleasant, Good morning. But the hare, who was a very aristocratic person in his own way, and very high and mighty in his manner, didn't answer the hedgehog's greeting, but said with a nasty sneer, What are you running about the fields for so early in the morning? I'm out walking, said the hedgehog. Walking, grinned the hare. I should have thought you could use your legs for something better. This remark annoyed the hedgehog, for, though he was a good-natured fellow enough, he was touchy on the subject of his legs, which were, by nature, bandy. "'I suppose,' he said tartly, "'you think your legs are better than mine?' "'That I do,' said the hare. "'It remains to be seen,' said the hedgehog. "'I bet you that if we two were to run a race, I should outstrip you.' "'Absurd!' cried the hare. "'You with your crooked legs!' But if you're so anxious to try, I've no objection. What do you wager? A golden guinea, said the hedgehog. Done, said the hare. We'll start right away. Oh, don't be in such a hurry, said the hedgehog. I haven't had my breakfast yet, and I feel a bit faint. I'll come back here in an hour. So away he trotted, for the hare made no objection. Then he thought to himself, The hare thinks a lot of his long legs, but I'll get the better of him all the same. For all his haughty ways, he's not so very clever, and I'll make him pay. See if I don't. As soon as he got home, he said to his wife, Quick, go get dressed. You must come out with me. What's the matter? said his wife. I've wagered the hare a golden guinea. I'm to run a race with him, and I want you to be there. Good gracious me, cried the hedgehog's wife. Have you lost your senses? How can you think of racing the hare? Don't be so quick with your words, woman said the hedgehog. That's my affair. You mustn't meddle with what you don't understand. Look sharp, put on your things, and come along. What was the wife to do? She had to obey, whether she wanted to or not. On the way to the field, the hedgehog said, Now listen to what I'm going to tell you. In that plowed field over there, we're to run our race. The hare will run in one furrow, and I in the other. We begin at the top. Now all you've got to do is to stand at the other end of my furrow, and directly the hare arrives, you call out to him, Here I am already. With that they reached the field. The hedgehogs told his wife where to stand, and went on to the other end. The hare was there waiting for him. Shall we start? said the hare. Right, said the hedgehog. Now then. Each took up his place. The hare counted. One, two, three and away he went like the wind. But the hedgehog took about three paces, 
Then he went back, ducked down in his furrow, and stood there as comfortably as you please, and laughing as if he would split his sides. Now, the moment the hare came rushing up to the other end, the hedgehog's wife called out to him, "'Here I am already!' The hare was quite taken aback, for he made sure it was the hedgehog himself who was sitting there calling to him, since, as everyone knows, a hedgehog's wife looks exactly like her husband. "'There's something not quite right here,' said the hare. "'We must run again back to the starting point.' And away he flew like the wind, but the hedgehog's wife never moved. When the hare got to the other end, the hedgehog called out, "'Here I am, already!' But the hare, quite beside himself with jealousy, shouted, "'We must run again!' "'Right,' said the hedgehog, "'as often as you like.' And so the hare went on, running backward and forward seventy-three times, and every time the hedgehog got the better of him. Every time the hare arrived at one end or the other, the hedgehog, or his wife, called out, "'Here I am, already!' But the seventy-fourth time the hare dropped down dead tired before he got halfway. So the hedgehog took his golden guinea, and he and his wife went home very well pleased with themselves. And so my tale is finished. End of chapter 105Chapter 106 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Bruno's Story from Sylvie and Bruno. Once there were a mouse, and a crocodile, and a man, and a goat, and a lion, said Bruno. And the mouse found a shoe, and it thought it were a mouse trap, so it got right in and stayed in it ever so long. Why did it stay in? Cause it thought it couldn't get out again, Bruno explained. It were a clever mouse. It knew it couldn't get out of traps. But why did it go in then? No matter why, said Bruno decisively, and it jump, and it jump, and at last it got right out again and it looked at the mark in the shoe, and the man's name were in it, so it knew it wasn't its own shoe. So the mouse gave the man his shoe, and the man were welly glad, cause he hadn't got but one shoe, and he were hoping to get the other. And the man took the goat out of the sack. No, I know who hasn't heard of the sack before, and who won't again. And he said to the goat, Who oh, will walk about here till I comes back? And he went, and he tumbled into a deep hole, and the goat walked round and round, and it walked under the tree, and it wug its tail, and it looked up in the tree, and it sang a sad little song. Ooh, never heard such a sad little song. It singed it right through. I sawed it singing with its long beard. And when it had singed all the song, it ran away for to get along to look for the man. You know. And the crocodile got along after it, for to bite it, you know. And the mouse got along after the crocodile. Wasn't the crocodile running? He wasn't running, said Bruno. And he wasn't crawling. He went struggling along like a portmanteau. And he held his chin ever so high in the air. What did he do that for? Because he hadn't got a toothache, said Bruno. Can't you make out muffin without I splain it? Why, if he'd had a toothache, of course he'd have held his head down. Like this. And he'd have put a lot of warm blankets round it. Did he have any blankets? Course he had blankets, said Bruno. Does you think crocodiles goes walks without blankets? And he frowned with his eyebrows. And the goat was welly flightened at his eyebrows. I'd never be afraid of eyebrows. I should think who would, though. If they'd got a crocodile fastened to them, like these had. And so the man jump, and he jump, and at last he got right out of the hole, and he runned away. For to look for the goat, you know. And he heard the lion grunting, and its mouth were like a large cupboard. And it had plenty of room in its mouth. And the lion runned after the man, for to eat him, you know. And the mouse runned after the lion. At first he caught the crocodile. And then he didn't catch the lion. And when he'd caught the crocodile, what does you think he did? 
cause he'd got pincers in his pocket. Why, he wrenched out that crocodile's tooth. Which tooth? The tooth he were going to bite the goat with, of course. And what became of the man? Well, the lion springed at him, but it came so slow, it were three weeks in the air. Did the man wait for it all that time? Course he didn't. He sold his house, and he packed up his things while the lion were coming. And he went and he lived in another town. So the lion ate the wrong man. End of chapter 106Chapter 107 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. The Blue Bottle Who Went Courting. A gay young bluebottle went out courting, and first he flew into the king's palace to woo the king's daughter. Now she was the most beautiful princess in all the world, and had a thousand suitors at her feet. So the bluebottle came and settled on her hand, and sang, Zum, zum, zoo, I want to marry you. But the princess didn't understand the song. She only saw a great bluebottle fly, and she tried to flick it off her hand, but the blue bottle sat fast. Then the princess cried out, Here's a great horrid fly on my hand, and it won't move. Quick, someone take it away. At that, you may be sure, all the suitors came running up and made grabs at the blue bottle, and the cleverest of them caught him between his finger and thumb, and nearly crushed the life out of him, but he managed to wriggle free, and in his flight, he flew at the king himself and settled right on the tip of the royal nose. Then the king gave a terrific snort and hit the blue bottle such a blow that if it hadn't just missed him, he would have certainly been killed. By this time, I can tell you, the blue bottle was in such a state that he didn't know whether he was on his head or his heels. So he buzzed round and round the room and was chased from one courtier to the other and dashed his wings against the window panes and at last the king threw his sceptre at him and the sceptre hit the fattest duchess in the room and bounded off and struck the blue bottle on the head. You may fancy how that confused the poor thing and so he flew into the fireplace and got his left wing scorched and he only just managed to crawl up the chimney by the skin of his teeth. But a maiden blue bottle, who was distantly related to his family, nursed his wing for him. And so pretty soon he was as gay as ever. Then he said, Very well, if I can't have the princess, I'll have the next best thing. And so he flew into the king's stable, and sat himself down right on the back of the princess's favorite mare. Zum, zum, zoo, I want to marry you. He hummed, but the mare took not the least notice of his song. She only shifted her feet irritably, for the blue bottle tickled her. Zum, zum, zoo, I want to marry you, repeated the blue bottle quite boldly. At that, the mare gave a flick of her tail and hit the blue bottle slap, bang, right in the middle of his bright azure waistcoat, so that he was sent spinning in among the straw that littered the floor. So there he lay, buzzing mournfully, till the maiden blue bottle came along and rubbed him all over and put him on his feet again. And pretty soon he was gayer than ever, and thought how he would go courting once more. Better stick to your own station, said his lady friend. But he only tossed his head and sniffed scornfully, and then he put on a brand new waistcoat and flew into the king's kitchen where the princess's favorite cat lay purring on the hearth. And the blue bottle lost no time at all, but crept straight into the cat's right ear and sang his song. Zoom, zoom, zoo, I want to marry you. Now, the cat had just been dreaming the most delicious dream about the fattest mouse you can think of. And the buzzing in her ear just woke her up in the most exciting part. And so, you may guess, she wasn't in the best of tempers. 
whether she heard the blue bottle's proposal of marriage or not i really can't say if she did you may be sure it didn't please her for she just made a snatch with her paw and grabbed him by the leg now it would have been all up with him if the maiden relative hadn't flown up in the very nick of time and tickled the cat's nose very well that made the cat sneeze so violently that she let go of the blue bottle's leg and so he flew away but his leg was broken and the doctor came every day for a week and then he sent in his bill and the maiden friend brought all her savings rolled up in an old stocking of her mother's and so the blue bottle paid the doctor and there was an end of that now would you believe it the blue bottle was so young and giddy that his leg was scarcely well before he began to wonder where he should go courting next when there are so many old maids in the world he said it's a bachelor's duty to look around for a wife i'll do it out of charity charity begins at home said his lady friend and blushed in a modest way but the blue bottle was not the kind of person to take a hint so he just put on another new waistcoat and away he flew into the woods and there a fine young lady woodpecker was hopping about digging for worms in a ladylike manner now here is a person after my own heart said the blue bottle she doesn't wait for us men to bring her food she just helps herself i might do worse than marry her and without a minute's hesitation he began to buzz round and round the woodpecker singing his old song zum zum zoo i want to marry you when the woodpecker caught sight of him she cocked her tail in a knowing way change of food is as good as a change of air said she and gave a peck that nearly finished the blue bottle there and then and tore his right wing from end to end so there he was sprawling on his back with his legs curled up in agony for a torn wing is no trifle and now the woodpecker would certainly have gobbled him up but just then the faithful maiden friend who had followed the blue bottle because he was bound to get into mischief hurried up when she saw the state of things she didn't stop twice to think but took a dead leaf and dropped it right over the blue bottle now when the woodpecker saw the maiden blue bottle she took her for the bachelor and gave another peck but the maiden flew away and hid behind a fern and so the woodpecker went back to her worms oh oh i am dead i am dead groaned the blue bottle under the leaf nonsense said his lady friend rubbish doesn't die so easily you see she was severe because her pride had been hurt oh dear kind friend don't fly away and leave me begged the blue bottle meekly you've flown away and left me often enough said the lady friend i'll never do it again as long as i live cried he you couldn't if you wanted to said she and stroked the broken wing oh why wasn't i content with a blue bottle bride groaned he no lady blue bottle will look at you now she said for you'll always fly lame as long as you live oh won't you take pity on me asked the poor blue bottle who felt thoroughly humble by this time then his lady friend put her own strong wing under his broken one i'll marry you out of charity she said and flew away with him end of chapter 107chapter 108 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by annie hill tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter 108 how two beetles took lodgings once upon a time there was a worthy set of ants who lived together as happily as possible in their little town at the foot of a fine old oak tree they were honest peaceable folk and always did as the three queen ants who ruled over them told them to do the young men stayed quietly at home until it was time for them to get married and the young ladies 
who had nothing else to do, did the same. As for the working people, but here's a curious state of things. You'll never find a working man in an ant city as long as you live, for all the workers are females, even the soldiers. You may take my word for that. Well, as for these, they were at it morning, noon, and night, digging and building and fetching food for the whole town, looking after the eggs, of which there were so many you could never have counted them, and seeing that all the baby ants were quite happy and comfortable. Now things would have gone on very well indeed if other people had only left these worthy ants alone. But they did not, and this is where my story really begins. One fine day, a set of ants belonging to quite another tribe came to the forest and built themselves a town not far from the first. And these ants, it grieves me to write it, were far from peaceful and honest like their neighbors. To tell the truth, they were nothing more nor less than robbers. They had not been very long in the place before their soldiers, all women folk too, made a raid on the town of the mild and harmless ants and carried off all the girl babies they could lay hands on. And the moment the children were old enough to walk, they were made into slaves and had to do all the roughest and hardest work. Well, you may guess there was sorrow in the town of the peaceful ants. They were too weak to fight their foes, and so they just had to sit down and bear it as best they could. Now, what happened once happened again and yet again till at last the harmless ants made up their minds to move and build themselves a new city in another part of the forest. And so they did. But it was all of no use, for the robbers followed them, and then the same thing happened all over again. So soon as there was a fine, fat, promising bunch of girl babies in the town, the robbers came and carried them into slavery. One misfortune followed fast upon another. Not long after the ants had moved into their new town, a beetle and his wife came stalking in and demanded lodgings in the queen's palace. They were smartly dressed in blue and green coats of the latest cut, but they carried no baggage except a toothbrush that stuck out of the beetle wife's pocket. This was suspicious, and they looked so hungry and thirsty into the bargain that it was not to be wondered at that the poor queen ant pulled a long face. We are travelling for pleasure, said the beetle's wife, and we shall have much pleasure in staying here as long as we like. With that, she walked straight up to the best bedroom. She said she hoped the sheets were aired and went to bed while her husband talked pleasantly with the three queens and ate three dozen new-laid ants' eggs for his supper. The unhappy queens soon saw what kind of visitors they had got. The beetles made themselves at home everywhere, in the palace and out of it, and called for whatever they wanted. The working ants had to wait on them hand and foot. There was the beetle shaving water to be got first thing in the morning and the beetle's wife's cup of milk fresh from the cow. For ants, you must know, keep their cows, just as human beings do, though the milk of the ant cow is more like sugar water than anything else we have. Then there never was anyone who could do with so many meals in the course of a single day as that beetle and his wife. They just ate and drank from morning to night, and it was all the ants could do to keep the palace larder stocked. All the choicest morsels, the finest seeds and salads the workers could bring, fell to the beetle's share, while the queens got what was left. There was no peace and quiet in the town. The beetles pried into every hole and corner, spread themselves in everybody's parlor, and paraded the streets singing and whistling when quiet folks wanted to rest. But what was worst of all, they showed never a sign of moving on. I thought you said you were traveling, the bravest of the queens ventured to remark at last. Why, 
so we were said the beetles but one must settle down some time or other and your air really suits us very well did you hear that whispered one young working ant to another the two had come to the palace with a pitcher of milk just in time to listen to the conversation they'll never leave us said the second ant not unless someone takes steps returned the first ant and pray whose steps and why asked the second you always were stupid said the first one and gave her waist a twitch which is a way ants have when they're put out now if someone were to take my advice she went on but there's nobody in all the town with two pennies worth of spirit nobody would take my advice i suppose you couldn't take it yourself asked the second aunt who really was not quite as stupid as people thought it never occurred to me said the first aunt but now you mention it perhaps i might and then the first aunt thought and thought and the end of it was that she slipped out of the town so soon as her day's work was finished and strolled away toward the town where the robber ants lived and presently a fierce old soldier ant came marching out at the gate then the little worker's heart beat very fast and she turned as pale as an ant can turn nothing venture nothing win she said to herself and walked straight up to the soldier hello who are you said the soldier oh i'm a neighbor of yours from beach town said the little ant i'm just taking a stroll before supper a stroll before supper cried the soldier staring very hard you don't seem to have much work to do over there why no i can't say i have said the little ant but i can see by your dress you're a servant said the soldier woman so i am said the little ant but we servants of beach town have an easy place a bit of dusting now and then and a little light needlework that's all i heard a very different story only the other day said the soldier ah but everything's changed since the beetles came said the little worker they do all the dirty work and my goodness they can work you may take my word for that it's worth something i can tell you to have two fine beetles like that in the town aha thought the soldier woman to herself here's something for us and she was so taken up with thinking that she forgot to bid the little ant good night and there and then she marched straight back to her town to tell the general what she had heard but the little ant went home well pleased with herself and sure enough what she expected would happen did happen the robber ants as soon as they heard the soldier's story were eager as possible to carry off the two beetles who could work so well and to prevent any fuss and bother this is what they did they took a great pitcher of ant cow's milk and mixed it with a few drops of the poison which as every one knows an ant always carries about with her in her poison bag then twelve soldiers took the pitcher to beach town and waited outside the gate for the beetles to come out and directly they saw them coming they put down the pitcher and hid behind a mountain of dead leaves but the beetles drank up the sweet stuff till there was not a drop left at the bottom of the pail and immediately the poison began to work and both the beetle and his wife fell back in a heap on to the grass and there they lay and could stir neither hand nor foot the robbers you may fancy lost no time bundled the pair on to a stout rhubarb leaf and dragged them away to their own city as fast as they could go now scarcely had they got them there when the poison began to wear off for ants poison is not very strong you see and pretty soon the beetle's wife sat up and pinched her husband it was not long before he sat up too and by and by those two were as clear in their heads and as firm on their legs as any two beetles ever were and now there was an unpleasant surprise in store for the robber ants when the beetle's wife had looked around a bit she said to her husband why it seems comfortable enough here i don't think we'll trouble to go back to beach town i think this will suit us very well 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 we'll just see what the cooking's like said he 
and went straight to the palace where the six queen ants who ruled over the robbers lived he just said how do you do to the queens in an off-hand way and then he sat down and helped himself to all the dishes he could find in the larder his wife she did the same and between them they finished all the food there was and so they went on just as they were used to doing in beech town and it did not take the robbers long to find out the mistake they had made the beetles had never done a day's work in their lives and they had no notion of beginning now just because the robbers expected it when they heard how they had been carried off and why they thought the whole affair a very good joke and laughed and laughed till they grew purple in the face and had to slap each other on the back to keep from choking the robbers you may believe me were as angry as angry could be they coaxed and they threatened but neither the beetle nor his wife would do a stroke of work on the contrary they took such a deal of waiting upon that the robbers were driven well nigh crazy and racked their brains for a way to get rid of them but the beetles liked their new quarters very well and there they stopped so things went on till at last the robbers made up their minds to give the beetles the slip and one dark night while they were asleep they packed their trunks and left the town but the gate wanted oiling and creaked so as they swung it open that the beetle's wife got nightmare and woke up in a minute you may be sure she had found out what was going on and had wakened her husband then the two crept very softly out at the gate and kept the ants at a comfortable distance so the end of it all was that though the robbers went far into the forest many leagues from their old town they had no sooner finished building the new one than in marched the beetles and went on in their old way as though nothing had happened now the robbers had settled so far away from beech town that it was not worth their while to come and steal children of the harmless ants for they found another town nearer to hand and so the harmless ants lived together quite happily and peacefully once more and the clever little worker to whom they owed their good fortune was raised to great honour and glory but the robbers had to make the best of the beetles for get rid of them they never could and if you ever should be passing that way why i make no doubt you'll find them there still End of chapter 108「1009 of Tales of Laughter」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pat Mathewson, England. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 109 Little Tuppen. One day, an old hen whose name was Cluck Cluck went into the woods with her little chick Tuppen to get some blueberries to eat. But a berry stuck fast in the little one's throat, and he fell upon the ground, choking and gasping. Cluck Cluck, in great fright, ran to fetch some water for him. She ran to the spring and said, My dear spring, please give me some water. I want it for my little chick Tuppen who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The spring said, I will give you some water if you will bring me a cup. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the oak tree and said, Dear oak tree, please give me a cup. I want it for the spring. And then the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The oak tree said, I will give you a cup if someone will shake my branches. Then Cluck Cluck ran to Maid Marian, the woodcutter's child, and said, Dear Maid Marian, please shake the oak tree's branches, and then the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The woodcutter's child, Maid Marian, said, I will shake the oak tree's branches if you will give me some shoes. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the shoemaker and said, 
Dear shoemaker, please give me some shoes. I want them for Maid Marian, the woodcutter's child, for then Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The shoemaker said, I will give you some shoes if you will give me some leather. Then Cluck Cluck ran to Moo Moo the ox and said, Dear Moo Moo, please give me some leather. I want it for the shoemaker. For then the shoemaker will give me some shoes, and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian. And Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The ox, Moo Moo, said, I will give you some leather if you will give me some corn. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the farmer and said, Dear farmer, please give me some corn. I want it for Moo Moo the ox, for then the ox will give me some leather, and I will give the leather to the shoemaker, and the shoemaker will give me shoes, and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The farmer said, I will give you some corn if you will give me a plough. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the blacksmith and said, Dear blacksmith, please give me a plough. I want it for the farmer, for then the farmer will give me some corn, and I will give the corn to the ox, and the ox will give me leather and I will give the leather to the shoemaker, and the shoemaker will give me shoes, and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The blacksmith said, I will give you a plough if you will give me some iron. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the busy little dwarfs who live under the mountains and have all the iron that is found in the mines. Dear, dear dwarfs, she said, please give me some of your iron. I want it for the blacksmith, for then the blacksmith will give me a plough and I will give the plough to the farmer and the farmer will give me corn and I will give the corn to the ox and the ox will give me leather and I will give the leather to the shoemaker and the shoemaker will give me shoes and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian and Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The little dwarfs who live under the mountains had pity on poor Cluck Cluck, and they gave her a great heap of red iron ore from their mines. Then she gave the iron to the blacksmith, and the plough to the farmer, and the corn to the ox, and the leather to the shoemaker, and the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian shook the oak tree, and the spring got the acorn cup, and Cluck Cluck carried it full of water to her little chick Tuppen. Then little Tuppen drank the water, and was well again, and ran chirping and singing in the long grass, as if nothing had happened to him. End of chapter 109 Chapter 110 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Story of the Four Little Children who went round the world. Once upon a time, a long while ago, there were four little people whose names were Violet, Slingsby, Guy, and Lionel, and they all thought they should like to see the world. So they bought a large boat to sail quite round the world by sea, and then they were to come back on the other side by land. The boat was painted blue with green spots, and the sail was yellow with red stripes, 
and when they set off they only took a small cat to steer and look after the boat besides an elderly quangle wangle who had to cook the dinner and make the tea for which purposes they took a large kettle for the first ten days they sailed on beautifully and found plenty to eat as there were lots of fish and they had only to take them out of the sea with a long spoon when the quangle wangle instantly cooked them and the pussy cat was fed with the bones with which she expressed herself pleased on the whole so that all the party was very happy during the daytime violet chiefly occupied herself in putting salt water into a churn while her three brothers churned it violently in the hope that it would turn into butter which it seldom if ever did and in the evening they all retired into the tea kettle where they all managed to sleep very comfortably while pussy and the quangle wangle managed the boat after a time they saw some land at a distance and when they came to it they found it was an island made of water quite surrounded by earth besides that it was bordered by evanescent isthmuses with a great gulf stream running all over it so that it was perfectly beautiful and contained only a single tree five hundred and three feet high when they had landed they walked about but found to their great surprise that the island was quite full of veal cutlets and chocolate drops and nothing else so they all climbed up the single high tree to discover if possible if there were any people but having remained on the top of the tree for a week and not seeing anybody they naturally concluded that there were no inhabitants and accordingly when they came down they loaded the boat with two thousand veal cutlets and a million of chocolate drops and these afforded them sustenance for more than a month during which time they pursued their voyage with the utmost delight and apathy after this they came to a shore where there were no less than sixty-five great red parrots with blue tails sitting on a rail all in a row and all fast asleep and i am sorry to say that the pussy-cat and the quangle-wangle crept softly and bit off the tail-feathers of all the sixty-five parrots for which violet reproved them both severely notwithstanding which she proceeded to insert all the feathers two hundred and sixty in number in her bonnet thereby causing it to have a lovely and glittering appearance highly prepossessing and efficacious the next thing that happened to them was in a narrow part of the sea which was so entirely full of fishes that the boat could not go on no farther so they remained there about six weeks till they had eaten nearly all the fishes which were soles and all readily cooked and covered with shrimp sauce so there was no trouble whatever and as the few fishes who remained uneaten complained of the cold as well as of the difficulty they had in getting any sleep on account of the extreme noise made by the arctic bears and the tropical turnspits which frequented the neighbourhood in great numbers violet most amiably knitted a small woollen frock for several of the fishes and slingsby administered some opium drops to them through which kindness they became quite warm and slept soundly then they came to a country which was wholly covered with immense orange trees of a vast size and quite full of fruit so they all landed taking with them the tea kettle intending to gather some of the oranges and place them in it but while they were busy about this a most dreadfully high wind rose and blew out most of the parrot tail feathers 
from violet's bonnet that however was nothing compared with the calamity of the oranges falling down on their heads by millions and millions which thumped and bumped and bumped and thumped them all so seriously that they were obliged to run as hard as they could for their lives besides that the sound of the oranges rattling on the tea-kettle was of the most fearful and amazing nature nevertheless they got safely to the boat although considerably vexed and hurt and the quangle wangle's right foot was so knocked about that he had to sit with his head in his slipper for at least a week this event made them all for a time rather melancholy and perhaps they might never have become less so had not lionel with a most praiseworthy devotion and perseverance continued to stand on one leg and whistled to them in a loud and lively manner which diverted the whole party so extremely that they gradually recovered their spirits and agreed that whenever they should reach home they would subscribe toward a testimonial to lionel entirely made of gingerbread and raspberries as an earnest token of their sincere and grateful infection after sailing on calmly for several more days they came to another country where they were much pleased and surprised to see a countless multitude of white mice with red eyes all sitting in a great circle slowly eating custard pudding with the most satisfactory and polite demeanour and as the four travellers were rather hungry being tired of eating nothing but soles and oranges for so long a period they held a council as to the propriety of asking the mice for some of their pudding in a humble and affecting manner by which they could hardly be otherwise than gratified it was agreed therefore that guy should go and ask the mice which he immediately did and the result was that they gave a walnut shell only half full of custard diluted with water now this displeased guy who said out of such a lot of pudding as you have got i must say you might have spared a somewhat larger quantity but no sooner had he finished speaking than the mice turned round at once and sneezed at him in an appalling and vindictive manner and it is impossible to imagine a more scrupulous and unpleasant sound than that caused by the simultaneous sneezing of many millions of angry mice so that guy rushed back to the boat having first shied his cap in the middle of the custard pudding by which means he completely spoiled the mice's dinner by and by the four children came to a country where there were no houses but only an incredibly innumerable number of large bottles without corks and of a dazzling and sweetly susceptible blue color each of these blue bottles contained a blue bottle fly and all these interesting animals lived continually together in the most copious and rural harmony nor perhaps in many parts of the world is such perfect and abject happiness to be found violet and slingsby and guy and lionel were greatly struck with this singular and instructive settlement and having previously asked permission of the blue bottle flies which was most courteously granted the boat was drawn up to the shore and they proceeded to make tea in front of the bottles but as they had no tea leaves they merely placed some pebbles in the hot water and the quangle wangle played some tunes over it on an accordion by which of course tea was made directly and of the very best quality the four children then entered into conversation with the blue-bottle flies 
who discoursed in a placid and genteel manner though with a slightly buzzing accent chiefly owing to the fact that they each held a small clothes brush between their teeth which naturally occasioned a fizzy extraneous utterance why said violet would you kindly inform us do you reside in bottles and if in bottles at all why not rather in green or purple or indeed in yellow bottles to which questions a very aged blue bottle fly answered we found the bottles here all ready to live in that is to say our great 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 grandfathers did so we occupied them at once and when the winter comes on we turn the bottles upside down and consequently rarely feel the cold at all and you know very well that this could not be the case with bottles of any other color than blue of course it could not said slingsby but if we may take the liberty of inquiring on what do you chiefly subsist mainly on oyster patties said the blue bottle fly and when these are scarce on raspberry vinegar and russian leather boiled down to a jelly how delicious said guy to which lionel added huzz and all the blue bottle flies said buzz at this time an elderly fly said it was the hour for the evening song to be sung and on a signal being given all the blue bottle flies began to buzz at once in a sumptuous and sonorous manner the melodious and mucilaginous sounds echoing all over the waters and resounding across the tumultuous tops of the transitory tumultuous upon the intervening and verdant mountains which a serene and sickly solvity only known to the truly virtuous the moon was shining sublaciously from the star bespangled sky while her light irrigated the smooth and shiny sides and wings and backs of the blue-bottle flies with a peculiar and trivial splendor while all nature cheerfully responded to the cerulean and conspicuous circumstances in many long after years the four little travellers looked back to that evening as one of the happiest in all their lives and it was already past midnight when the sail of the boat having been set up by the quangle wangle the tea kettle and churn placed in their respective positions and the pussycat stationed at the helm the children each took a last and affectionate farewell of the blue bottle flies who walked down in a body to the water's edge to see the travellers embark as a token of parting respect and esteem violet made a curtsey quite down to the ground and stuck one of her few remaining parrot tail feathers into the back hair of the most pleasing of the blue bottle flies while slingsby guy and lionel offered them three small boxes containing respectively black pins dried figs and epsom salts and thus they left the happy shore for ever overcome by their feelings the four little travellers instantly jumped into the tea kettle and fell fast asleep but all along the shore for many hours there was distinctly heard a sound of severely suppressed sobs and of a vague multitude of living creatures using their pocket handkerchiefs in a subdued simultaneous snuffle lingering sadly along the walloping waves as the boat sailed farther and farther away from the land of the happy blue-bottle flies nothing particular occurred for some days after these events except that as the travellers were passing a low tract of sand they perceived an unusual and gratifying spectacle namely 
a large number of crabs and crawfish perhaps six or seven hundred sitting by the waterside and endeavouring to disentangle a vast heap of pale pink worsted which they moistened at intervals with fluid composed of lavender water and white wine negus can we be of any service to you o crusty crabbies said the four children thank you kindly said the crabs consecutively we are trying to make some worsted mittens but do not know how on which violet who was perfectly acquainted with the art of mitting making said to the crabs do your claws unscrew or are they fixtures they are all made to unscrew said the crabs and forthwith they deposited a great pile of claws close to the boat with which violet combed all the pale pink worsted and then made the loveliest mittens with it you can imagine these the crabs having resumed and screwed on their claws placed cheerfully upon their wrists and walked away rapidly on their hind legs warbling songs with a silvery voice and in a minor key after this the four little people sailed on again till they came to a vast and wide plain of astonishing dimensions on which nothing whatever could be discovered at first but as the travellers walked onward they appeared in the extreme and dim distance a single object which on a nearer approach and on an accurately cutaneous inspection seemed to be somebody in a large white wig sitting on an armchair made of sponge cakes and oyster shells it does not quite look like a human being said violet doubtfully nor could they make out what it really was till the quangle wangle who had previously been round the world exclaimed softly in a loud voice it is the cooperative cauliflower and so in truth it was and they soon found that what they had taken for an immense wig was in reality the top of the cauliflower and that he had no feet at all being able to walk tolerably well with a fluctuating and graceful movement on a single cabbage stalk an accomplishment which naturally saved him the expense of stockings and shoes presently while the whole party from the boat was gazing at him with mingled affection and disgust he suddenly arose and in a somewhat plumdopious manner hurried off toward the setting sun his steps supported by two superincumbent confidential cucumbers and a large number of water wagtails proceeding in advance of him by three and three in a row till he finally disappeared on the brink of the western sky in a crystal cloud of sodorphic sand so remarkable a sight of course impressed the four children very deeply and they returned immediately to their boat with a strong sense of undeveloped asthma and a great appetite shortly after this the travellers were obliged to sail directly below some high overhanging rocks from the top of one of which a particularly odious little boy dressed in rose-coloured knickerbockers and with a pewter plate upon his head threw an enormous pumpkin at the boat by which it was instantly upset but this upsetting was of no consequence because all the party knew how to swim very well and in fact they preferred swimming about till after the moon rose when the water growing chilly they spontaneously entered the boat meanwhile the quangle wangle threw 
back the pumpkin with immense force so that it hit the rocks where the malicious little boy in rose-colored knickerbockers was sitting when being quite full of lucifer matches the pumpkin exploded surreptitiously into a thousand bits whereupon the rocks instantly took fire and the odious little boy became unpleasantly hotter and hotter and hotter till his knickerbockers were turned quite green and his nose was burned off two or three days after this happened they came to another place where they found nothing at all except some wide and deep pits full of mulberry jam this is the property of the tiny yellow-nosed apes who abound in these districts and who store up the mulberry jam for their food in winter when they mix it with pellucid pale periwinkle soup and serve it out in wedgewood china bowls which grow freely all over that part of the country only one of the yellow-nosed apes was on the spot and he was fast asleep yet the four travellers and the quadrangle and the pussy were so terrified by the violence and the sanguinity sound of his snoring that they merely took a small cupful of the jam and returned to re-embark in their boat without delay what was their horror on seeing the boat including the churn and the sea kettle in the mouth of an enormous sea's prider an aquatic and ferocious creature truly dreadful to behold and happily not only met with in those excessive longitudes in a moment the beautiful boat was bitten into fifty thousand million hundred billion bits and it instantly became quite clear that violet slingsby guy and lionel could no longer premulate their voyage by sea the four travellers were therefore obliged to resolve on pursuing their wanderings by land and very fortunately there happened to pass by at that moment an elderly rhinoceros on which they seized and all four mounting on their back the quadrangle sitting on his horn and holding on by his ears and the pussycat swinging at the end of his tail they set off having only four small beans and three pounds of mashed potatoes to last through their whole journey they were however able to catch numbers of the chickens and turkeys and other birds who incessantly alighted on the head of the rhinoceros for the purpose of gathering the seeds of the rhododendron plants which grew there and these creatures they cooked in the most translucent and satisfactory manner by means of a fire lighted on the end of the rhinoceros's back a crowd of kangaroos and gigantic cranes accompanied them from feelings of curiosity and complacency so that they were never at a loss for company and went onward as it were in sort of a profuse and triumphant procession thus in less than eighteen weeks they all arrived safely at home where they were received by their admiring relatives with joy tempered with contempt and where they finally resolved to carry out the rest of their travelling plans at some more favourable opportunity as for the rhinoceros in token of their grateful adherence they had him killed and stuffed directly and then set him up outside the door of their father's house as a diaphanous door scraper end of chapter 110 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
Chapter One Hundred Eleven of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter One Hundred Eleven: The History of the Seven Families of the Lake Pipple Popple from nonsense stories chapter one introductory in former days that is to say once upon a time there lived in the land of gramble blamble seven families they lived by the side of the great lake pipple popple one of the seven families indeed lived in the lake and on the outskirts of the city of tosh which excepting when it was quite dark they could see plainly the names of all these places you have probably heard of and you have only not to look in your geography books to find out all about them now the seven families who lived on the borders of the great lake pipple popple were as follows in the next chapter chapter two the seven families there was a family of two old parrots and seven young parrots there was a family of two old storks and seven young storks there was a family of two old geese and seven young geese there was a family of two old owls and seven young owls there was a family of two old guinea pigs and seven young guinea pigs there was a family of two old cats and seven young cats and there was a family of two old fishes and seven young fishes chapter three the habits of the seven families the parrots lived upon the sofsky pofsky trees which were beautiful to behold and covered with blue leaves and they fed upon fruit artichokes and striped beetles the storks walked in and out of the lake pipple popple and ate frogs for breakfast and buttered toast for tea but on account of the extreme length of their legs they could not sit down and so they walked about continually the geese having webs to their feet caught quantities of flies which they ate for dinner the owls anxiously looked after mice which they caught and made into sago puddings. The guinea pigs toddled about the gardens and ate lettuces and Cheshire cheese. The cats sat still in the sunshine and fed upon sponge biscuits. The fishes lived in the lake and fed chiefly on boiled periwinkles. And all these seven families lived together in the utmost fun and felicity. Chapter 4 The Children of the Seven Families Are Sent Away one day all the seven fathers and the seven mothers of the seven families agreed that they would send their children out to see the world so they called them all together and gave them each eight shillings and some good advice some chocolate drops and a small green morocco pocket-book to set down their expenses in they then particularly entreated them not to quarrel and all the parents sent off their children with a parting injunction if said the old parrots you find a cherry do not fight about who should have it and said the old storks if you find a frog divide it carefully into seven bits but on no account quarrel about it and the old geese said to the seven young geese whatever you do be sure you do not touch a plum pudding flea and the old owl said if you find a mouse tear him up into seven slices and eat him cheerfully but without quarrelling and the old guinea pig said have a care that you eat your lettuces should you find any not greedily but calmly and the old cat said be particularly careful not to meddle with a clangle wangle if you should see one and the old fishes said above all things avoid eating a blue boss was, for they do not agree with fishes and give them a pain in their toes so all the children of each family thanked their parents and making in all forty-nine polite bows they went into the wide world chapter five the history of the seven young parrots the seven young parrots had not gone far when they saw a tree with a single cherry on it which the oldest parrot picked instantly but the other six being extremely hungry tried to get it also on which all the seven began to fight and they scuffled and huffled and ruffled and shuffled and puffled 
and muffled and buffled and duffled and fluffled and guffled and bruffled and screamed and shrieked and squealed and squeaked and clawed and snapped and bit and bumped and thumped and dumped and flumped each other till they were all torn into little bits and at last there was nothing left to record this painful incident except the cherry and seven small green feathers and that was the vicious and voluble end of the seven young parrots chapter six the history of the seven young storks when the seven young storks set out they walked or flew for fourteen weeks in a straight line and for six weeks more in a crooked one and after that they ran as hard as they could for one hundred and eight miles and after that they stood still and made a himmeltaneous clatter clatter blattery noise with their bills about the same time they perceived a large frog spotted with green and with a sky-blue stripe under each ear so being hungry they immediately flew at him and were going to divide him into seven pieces when they began to quarrel as to which of his legs should be taken off first one said this and another said that and while they were all quarrelling the frog hopped away and when they saw that he was gone they began to chatter clatter bladder platter patter bladder matter clatter flatter quatter more violently than ever and after they had fought for a week they pecked each other all to little pieces so that at last nothing was left of any of them except their bills and that was the end of the seven young storks chapter seven the history of the seven young geese when the seven young geese began to travel they went over a large plain on which there was but one tree and that was a very bad one so four of them went up to the top of it and looked about them while the other three waddled up and down and repeated poetry and their last six lessons in arithmetic geography and cookery presently they perceived a long way off an object of the most interesting and obese appearance having a perfectly round body exactly resembling a boiled plum pudding with two little wings and a beak and three feathers growing out of his head and only one leg so after a time all the seven young geese said to each other beyond all doubt this beast must be a plum pudding flea on which they incautiously began to sing aloud plum pudding flea plum pudding flea wherever you be oh come to our tree and listen oh listen oh listen to me and no sooner had they sung this verse than the plum pudding flea began to hop and skip on his one leg with the most dreadful velocity and came straight to the tree where he stopped and looked about him in a vacant and voluminous manner on which the seven young geese were greatly alarmed and all of a tremble bemble so one of them put out his long neck and just touched him with the tip of his bill but no sooner had he done this than the plum pudding flea skipped and hopped about more and more and higher and higher after which he opened his mouth and to the great surprise and indignation of the seven geese began to bark so loudly and furiously and terribly that they were totally unable to bear the noise and by degrees every one of them suddenly tumbled down quite dead so that was the end of the seven young geese chapter eight the history of the seven young owls when the seven young owls set out they sat every now and then on the branches of old trees and never went far at one time and one night when it was quite dark they thought they heard a mouse but as the gas lamps were not lighted they could not see him so they called out is that a mouse on which a mouse answered squeaky peaky weeky yes it is and immediately all the young owls threw themselves off the tree meaning to alight on the ground but they did not perceive that there was a large well below them into which they all fell superficially and were every one of them drowned in less than half a minute so that was the end of the seven young owls chapter nine the history of the seven young guinea pigs the seven young guinea pigs went into a garden full of gooseberry bushes and tiggery trees under one of which they fell asleep when they awoke they saw a large lettuce which had grown out of the ground while they had been sleeping 
and which had an immense number of green leaves at which they all exclaimed lettuce oh lettuce let us oh let us oh lettuce leaves oh let us leave this tree and eat lettuce oh let us lettuce leaves and instantly the seven young guinea pigs rushed with such extreme force against the lettuce plant and hit their heads so vividly against its stalk that the concussion brought on directly an incipient transitional inflammation of their noses which grew worse and worse and worse and worse till it accidentally killed them all seven and that was the end of the seven young guinea pigs chapter ten the history of the seven young cats the seven young cats set off on their travels with great delight and rapacity but on coming to the top of a high hill they perceived at a long distance off a clangle wangle or as it is more properly written clangel wangel and in spite of the warning they had had they ran straight up to it now the clangle wangles are most dangerous and delusive beasts and by no means commonly to be met with they live in the water as well as on land using their long tails as a sail when in the former element their speed is extreme but their habits of life are domestic and superfluous and their general demeanour pensive and pellucid on summer evenings they may sometimes be observed near the lake pipple standing on their heads and humming their national melodies they subsist entirely on vegetables excepting when they eat veal or mutton or pork or beef or fish or saltpetre the moment the clangle wangle saw the seven young cats approach he ran away and as he ran straight on for four months and the cats though they continued to run could never overtake him they all gradually died of fatigue and exhaustion and never afterward recovered and this was the end of the seven young cats chapter eleven the history of the seven young fishes the seven young fishes swam across the lake pipple and into the river and into the ocean where most unhappily for them they saw on the fifteenth day of their travels a bright blue boss and instantly swam after him but the blue boss plunged into a perpendicular speculiar orbicular quadrangular circular depth of soft mud where in fact his house was and the seven young fishes swimming with great and uncomfortable velocity plunged also into the mud quite against their will and not being accustomed to it were all suffocated in a very short time and that was the end of the seven young fishes chapter twelve of what occurred subsequently after it was known that the seven young parrots and the seven young storks and the seven young geese and the seven young owls and the seven young guinea pigs and the seven young cats and the seven young fishes were all dead then the frog and the plum pudding flea and the mouse and the clangle wangle and the blue boss was all met together to rejoice over their good fortune and they collected the seven feathers of the seven young parrots and the seven bills of the seven young storks and the lettuce and the cherry and having placed the latter on the lettuce and the other objects in a circular arrangement at their base they danced a hornpipe round all these memorials until they were quite tired after which they gave a tea party and a garden party and a ball and a concert and then returned to their respective homes full of joy and respect sympathy satisfaction and disgust chapter thirteen of what became of the parents of the forty-nine children but when the two old parrots and the two old storks and the two old geese and the two old owls and the two old guinea pigs and the two old cats and the two old fishes became aware by reading in the newspapers of the calamitous extinction of the whole of their families they refused all further sustenance and sending out to various shops they purchased great quantities of cayenne pepper and brandy and vinegar and blue sealing wax besides seven immense glass bottles with air-tight stoppers and having done this they ate a light supper of brown bread and jerusalem artichokes and took an affecting and formal leave of the whole of their acquaintance which was very numerous and distinguished and select 
and responsible and ridiculous chapter fourteen conclusion and after this they filled the bottles with the ingredients for pickling and each couple jumped into a separate bottle by which effort of course they all died immediately and became thoroughly pickled in a few minutes having previously made their wills by the assistance of the most eminent lawyers of the district in which they left strict orders that the stoppers of the seven bottles should be carefully sealed up with the blue sealing wax they had purchased and that they themselves in the bottles should be presented to the principal museum of the city of tosh to be labelled with parchment or any other anti-congenial succedaneum and to be placed on a marble table with silver gilt legs for the daily inspection and contemplation and for the perpetual benefit of the pusillanimous public and if you ever happen to go to gramble blamble and visit that museum in the city of tosh look for them on the ninety-eighth table in the four hundred and twenty-seventh room of the right-hand corridor of the left wing of the central quadrangle of that magnificent building for if you do not you certainly will not see them edward lear end of chapter one hundred eleven chapter number a hundred and twelve of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wigan wee robin's yule song there was an odd gray pussy bodrons and she got away down by a water slide and there she saw a wee robin redbreast hoppin on a briar and pussy bodron says where's ta gone wee robin and wee robin says i'm gone away to the king to sing him a sang this gid yule morning and pussy bodron says come here wee robin and i'll let you see a bonny white ring round my neck but wee robin says na na gray pussy bodrons na na ye worry the wee mousie but ye see na worry me so wee robin flew away till he came to a fail fod dyke turf wall and there he saw a gray greedy gled hawk sitting and gray greedy gled says where's to ga wee robin and wee robin says i'm gone away to the king to sing him a sang this gid yule morning and gray greedy glid says come here wee robin and i'll let ye see a bonny feather in my wing but wee robin says na na gray greedy gled na na ye pocket pecked a thee we linty but ye see no pook me so wee robin flew away till he came to the clutch hollow o a craig and there he saw slee todd lowry sly fox sitting and slee todd lowry says where to gone wee robin and wee robin says i'm gone away to the king to sing him a song this guild you morning and see todd lowry says come here wee robin and i'll let ye see a bonny spot on the tap of my tail but wee robin says na na slee todd lowry na na ye worry the wee lammy but ye see no worry me so wee robin flew away till he came to a bonny burnside and there he saw a wee callant sitting and the wee callant says where to gone wee robin and wee robin says i'm gone away to the king to sing him a sang this gid yule morning and the wee callant says come here wee robin and i'll gie you a ween grand moolins crumbs out of my pooch 
but we robin says na na we callant na na ye spaldert knock down the gold pink goldfinch but ye see no spelder me so we robin flew away till he came to the king and there he sat on a winnock sole ploughshare and sang the king a bonny sang and the king says to the queen what will ye gee to we robin for singing us this bonny sang and the queen says to the king i think we'll gee him the wee ran to be his wife so wee robin and the wee ran were married and the king and the queen and the court danced at the wedding sin he flew away home to an water slide and hop it on a brier attributed to robert burns end of chapter 112 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc Chapter number 113 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Giant's Shoes once upon a time there was a large giant who lived in a small castle at least he didn't all of him live there but he managed things in this wise from his earliest youth up his legs had been of a superstitiously small size unsuited to the rest of his body so he sat upon the southwest wall of the castle with his legs inside and his right foot came out of the east gate and his left foot out of the north gate while his gloomy but spacious coat-tails covered up the south and west gates and in this way the castle was defended against all comers and was deemed impregnable by the military authorities this however as we shall soon see was not the case for the giant's boots were inside as well as his legs but as he had neglected to put them on in the giddy days of his youth he was never afterward able to do so because there was not enough room and in this bootless but compact manner he passed his time the giant slept for three weeks at a time and two days after he woke his breakfast was brought to him consisting of bright brown horses sprinkled on his bread and butter Besides his boots, the giant had a pair of shoes, and in one of them his wife lived when she was at home. On other occasions she lived in the other shoe. She was a sensible, practical kind of woman, with two wooden legs and a clothes horse, but in other respects not rich. The wooden legs were kept pointed at the end in order that, if the giant were dissatisfied with his breakfast he might pick up any stray people that were within reach using his wife as a fork this annoyed the inhabitants of the district so that they built their church in a southwestern direction from the castle behind the giant's back that he might not be able to pick them up as they went in but those who stayed outside to play pitch and toss were exposed to great danger and sufferings. Now in the village there were two brothers of altogether different tastes and dispositions, and talents and peculiarities and accomplishments, and in this way they were discovered not to be the same person. The elder of them was most marvelously good at singing, and could sing the old hundredth and old hundred times without stopping. Whenever he did this, he stood on one leg and tied the other round his neck to avoid catching cold and spoiling his voice. But the neighbors fled, and he was also a rare hand at making guava dumplings out of three cats and a shoehorn, which is an accomplishment seldom met with. But his brother was more meager, melanguinous person 
and his chief accomplishment was to eat a wagon load of hay overnight and wake up thatched in the morning the whole interest of this story depends upon the fact that the giant's wife's clothes horse broke in consequence of a sudden thaw being made of organ pipes so she took off her wooden legs and stuck them in the ground tying a string from the top of one to the top of the other and hung out her clothes to dry on that now this was astutely remarked by the two brothers who therefore went up in front of the giant after he had his breakfast the giant called out fork fork but his wife trembling hid herself in the more recondite toe of the second shoe then the singing brother began to sing but he had not taken into account the pious disposition of the giant who instantly joined in the psalm and this caused the singing brother to burst his head off but as it was tied by the leg he did not lose it altogether but the other brother being well thatched on account of the quantity of hay he had eaten overnight lay down between the great toe of the giant and the next and wriggled so the giant being unable to bear tickling in the feet kicked out in an orthopedical manner whereupon the castle broke and he fell backward and was impaled upon the sharp steeple of the church so they put a label on him on which was written nupes gigantens that's all william clingdon clifford end of chapter 113 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter 114 of tales of laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 114. The Farmer and the Money Lender. There was once a farmer who suffered much at the hands of a money lender. Good harvests or bad, the farmer was always poor, the money lender rich. At the last, when he hadn't a farthing left, the farmer went to the money lender's house and said, You can't squeeze water from a stone, and as you have nothing to get by me now, you might tell me the secret of becoming rich. My friend, returned the money lender piously, riches come from Ram. Ask him. Thank you, I will, replied the simple farmer, so he prepared three girdle cakes to last him on the journey and set out to find Ram. First he met a Brahmin, and to him he gave a cake, asking him to point out the road to Ram. But the Brahmin only took the cake and went on his way without a word. Next the farmer met a yogi, or devotee, and to him he gave a cake, without receiving any help in return. At last he came upon a poor man sitting under a tree, and finding out he was hungry, the kindly farmer gave him his last cake, and sitting down to rest beside him, entered into conversation. "'And where are you going?' asked the poor man at length. "'Oh, I have a long journey before me, for I am going to find Ram,' replied the farmer. "'I don't suppose you could tell me which way to go.' "'Perhaps I can,' said the poor man, smiling, "'for I am Ram. What do you want of me?' Then the farmer told the whole story, and Ram, taking pity on him, gave him a conch shell and showed him how to blow it in a particular way, saying, "Remember." Whatever you wish for, you have only to blow the conch that way, and your wish will be fulfilled. Only have a care of that money lender, for even magic is not proof against his wiles. The farmer went back to his village rejoicing. In fact, the money lender noticed his high spirits at once, and said to himself, Some good fortune must have befallen the stupid fellow to make him hold his head so jauntily. Therefore he went over to the simple farmer's house and congratulated him on his good fortune in such cunning words, pretending to have heard all about it, that before long the farmer found himself telling the whole story, all except the secret of blowing the conch, for with all his simplicity the farmer was not quite such a fool as to tell that. Nevertheless, the money lender determined to have the conch by hook or by crook, 
and as he was villain enough not to stick at trifles, he waited for a favorable opportunity and stole the conch. But, after nearly bursting himself with blowing the conch in every conceivable way, he was obliged to give up the secret as a bad job. However, being determined to succeed, he went back to the farmer and said coolly, Look here, I've got your conch, but I can't use it. You haven't got it, so it's clear you can't use it either. Business is at a standstill unless we make a bargain. Now I promise to give you back your conch, and never to interfere with your using it, on one condition, which is this. Whatever you get from it, I am to get double. Never, cried the farmer. That would be the old business all over again. Not at all, replied the wily money lender. You will have your share. Now, don't be a dog in the manger, for if you get all you want, what can it matter to you if I am rich or poor? At last, though it went sorely against the grain to be of any benefit to a money lender, the farmer was forced to yield, and from that time, no matter what he gained by the power of the conch, the money lender gained double. And the knowledge that this was so preyed upon the farmer's mind day and night, so that he had no satisfaction out of anything. At last there came a very dry season, so dry that the farmer's crops withered for want of rain. Then he blew his conch and wished for a well to water them, and lo, there was the well, but the money lender had two, two beautiful new wells. This was too much for any farmer to stand, and our friend brooded over it and brooded over it, till at last a bright idea came into his head. He seized the conch, blew it loudly, and cried out, O oh, ram, I wish to be blind of one eye. And so he was, in a twinkling, but the money lender, of course, was blind of both, and in trying to steer his way between the two new wells, he fell into one and was drowned. Now, this true story shows that a farmer once got the better of a money lender, but only by losing one of his eyes. End of chapter 114. Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter 115 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 115. How the Sun, the Moon, and the Wind Went Out to Dinner One day the Sun, the Moon, and the Wind went out to dine with their uncle and aunt, the Thunder and Lightning. Their mother, one of the most distant stars you see far up in the sky, waited alone for her children's return. Now both the Sun and the Wind were greedy and selfish. They enjoyed the great feast that had been prepared for them, without a thought of saving any of it to take home to their mother. But the gentle Moon did not forget her. Of every dainty dish that was brought round, she placed a small portion under one of her beautiful long fingernails, that the star might also have a share in the treat. On their return, their mother, who had kept watch for them all night long with her little bright eye, said, Well, children, what have you brought home for me? Then the son, who was the eldest, said, I have brought nothing home for you. I went out to enjoy myself with my friends, not to fetch a dinner for my mother. And the wind said, Neither have I brought anything home for you, mother. You could hardly expect me to bring a collection of good things for you when I merely went out for my own pleasure. But the moon said, Mother, fetch a plate, see what I have brought you. And, shaking her hand, she showered down such a choice dinner as never was seen before. Then the star turned to the sun and spoke thus, because you went out to amuse yourself with your friends, and feasted and enjoyed yourself without any thought of your mother at home, you shall be cursed. Henceforth your rays shall ever be hot and scorching, and shall burn all that they touch, and men shall hate you and cover their heads when you appear. And that is why the sun is so hot to this day. Then she turned to the wind and said, You also, who forgot your mother in the midst of your selfish pleasures, hear your doom. You shall always blow in the hot, dry weather, and shall parch and shrivel all living things, and men shall detest and avoid you from this very time. And that is why the wind in the hot weather is still so disagreeable. But to the moon she said, Daughter, because you remembered your mother and kept for her a share in your own enjoyment, from henceforth you shall be ever cool and calm and bright. 
no noxious glare shall accompany your pure rays, and man shall always call you blessed. And that is why the moon's light is so soft and cool and beautiful, even to this day. End of chapter 115. Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter 116 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Sing Raj and the cunning little jackals once upon a time in a great jungle there lived a great lion he was rajah of all the country round and every day he used to leave his den in the deepest shadow of the rocks and roar with a loud angry voice and when he roared the other animals in the jungle who were all his subjects got very much frightened and ran here and there and sing raj would pounce upon them and kill them and gobble them up for his dinner this went on for a long long time until at last there were no living creatures left in the jungle but two little jackals raj jackal and a rene jackal husband and wife a very hard time of it the poor little jackals had running this way and that to escape the terrible sing raj and every day the little rene jackal would say to her husband i am afraid he will catch us to-day do you hear how he is roaring oh dear oh dear and he would answer her never fear i will take care of you let us run on a mile or two come come quick 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 and they would both run away as fast as they could after some time spent in this way they found however one fine day that the lion was so close upon them that they could not escape then the little rene jackal said husband husband i feel much frightened the sing raj is so angry he will certainly kill us at once what can we do but he answered cheer up we can save ourselves yet come and i'll show you how we may manage it so what did these cunning little jackals do but they went to the great lion's den and when he saw them coming he began to roar and shake his mane and he said you little wretches come and be eaten at once i have had no dinner for three whole days and all that time i have been running over hill and dale to find you roar roar come and be eaten i say and he lashed his tail and gnashed his teeth and looked very terrible indeed then the jackal raja creeping quite close up to him said oh great sing raj we all know you are our master and we would have come at your bidding long ago but indeed sir there is a much bigger raj even than you in this jungle and he tried to catch hold of us and eat us up and frightened us so much that we were obliged to run away what do you mean growled sing raj there is no king in the jungle but me ah sir answered the jackal in truth one would think so for you are very dreadful your very voice is death but it is as we say for we with our own eyes have seen one with whom you could not compete whose equal you can no more be than we are yours whose face is as flaming fire his step as thunder and his power supreme it is impossible interrupted the old lion but show me this rajah of whom you speak so much that i may destroy him instantly then the little jackals ran on before him until they reached a great well and pointing down to his own reflection in the water they said see sir there lives the terrible king of whom we spoke when sing raj looked down the well he became very angry for he thought he saw another lion there 
he roared and shook his great mane and the shadow lion shook his and looked terribly defiant at last beside himself with rage at the violence of his opponent saying raj sprang down to kill him at once but no other lion was there only the treacherous reflection and the sides of the well were so steep that he could not get out again to punish the two jackals who peeped over the top after struggling for some time in the deep water he sank to rise no more and the little jackals threw stones down upon him from above and danced round and round the well singing ayo 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 the king of the forest is dead is dead we have killed the great lion who would have killed us ayo 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 ring a ting ding a ting ring a ting ding a ling ayo 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 end of chapter a hundred and sixteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter one hundred and seventeen of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggum harris sermon there was a certain brahmin in a certain village named harasarman he was poor and foolish and in evil case for want of employment and he had very many children that he might reap the fruit of his misdeeds in a former life he wandered about begging with his family and at last he reached a certain city and entered the service of a rich householder called stultata his sons became keepers of stultata's cows and other property and his wife a servant to him and he himself lived near his house performing the duty of an attendant one day there was a feast on account of the marriage of the daughter of stultata largely attended by many friends of the bridegroom and merrymakers harrisarman hoped that he would be able to fill himself up to the throat with ghee and flesh and other dainties and get the same for his family in the house of his patron while he was anxiously expecting to be fed no one thought of him then he was distressed at getting nothing to eat and he said to his wife at night it is owing to my poverty and stupidity that i am treated with such disrespect here so i will pretend by means of an artifice to possess a knowledge of magic so that i may become an object of respect to this still data so when you get an opportunity tell him that i possess magical knowledge he said this to her and after turning the matter over in his mind while people were asleep he took away from the house of stultata a horse on which his master's son-in-law rode he placed it in concealment at some distance and in the morning his friends of the bridegroom could not find the horse though they searched in every direction then while stultata was distressed at the evil omen and searching for thieves who had carried off the horse the wife of harasman came and said to him my husband is a wise man skilled in astrology and magical sciences he can get the horse back for you why do you not ask him when stultata heard that he called harasman who said yesterday i was forgotten but to-day now the horse is stolen i am called to mind and stultata then prop repeated the brahmin with these words i forgot you forgive me and asked him to tell him who had taken away their horse then harassman drew all kinds of pretended diagrams and said the horse has been placed by thieves on the boundary line south from this place 
it is concealed there and before it is carried off to a distance as it will be at close of day go quickly and bring it when they heard that many men ran and brought the horse quickly praising the discernment of harassman then harassman was honored by all men as a sage and dwelt there in happiness honored by stoldata now as days went on much treasure both of gold and jewels had been stolen by a thief from the palace of the king as the thief was not known the king quickly summoned harassman on account of his reputation for knowledge of magic and he when summoned tried to gain time and said i will tell you tomorrow and then he was placed in a chamber by the king and carefully guarded and he was sad because he had pretended to have knowledge now in that palace there was a maid named jehiva which means tongue who with the assistance of her brother had stolen that treasure from the interior of the palace she being alarmed at harassman's knowledge went at night and applied her ear to the door of that chamber in order to find out what he was about and harassman who was alone inside was at that very moment blaming his own tongue that had made a vain assumption of knowledge he said o oh, tongue what is this that you have done through your greediness wicked one you will soon receive punishment in full when jehiva heard this she thought in her terror that she had been discovered by this wise man and she managed to get in where he was and falling at his feet she said to the supposed wizard brahman here i am that jiva whom you have discovered to be the thief of the treasure and after i took it i buried it in the earth in the garden behind the palace under a pomegranate tree so spare me and receive the small quantity of gold which is in my possession when harassman heard that he said to her proudly depart i know all this i know the past present and future but i will not denounce you being a miserable creature that is implored my protection but whatever gold is in your possession you must give back to me when he said this to the maid she consented and departed quickly but harassman reflected in his astonishment fate brings about as if in sport things impossible for when calamity was so near who would have thought chance would have brought us success while i was blaming my jehiva the thief jehiva suddenly flung herself at my feet secret crimes manifest themselves by means of fear thus thinking he passed the night happily in the chamber and in the morning he brought the king by some skilful parade of pretended knowledge into the garden and led him up to the treasure which was buried under the pomegranate tree and said that the thief had escaped with part of it then the king was pleased and gave him the revenue of many villages but the minister named devanjanin whispered in the king's ear how can a man possess such knowledge unattainable by men without having studied the books of magic you may be certain that this is a specimen of the way he makes a dishonest livelihood by having a secret intelligence with thieves it will be much better to test him by some new artifice then the king of his own accord brought a covered picture into which he had thrown a frog and said to harassman brahm if you can guess what there is in this picture i will do you great honor today when the brahm harassman heard that he thought that his last hour had come and he called to mind the pet name of froggy which his father had given him in his childhood in sport and impelled by luck he called to himself by his pet name lamenting his hard fate and suddenly called out 
this is a fine picture for you froggy it will soon become the swift destroyer of your helpless self the people there when they heard him say that raised a shout of applause because his speech chimed in so well with the object presented to him and murmured ah a great sage he knows even about the frog then the king thinking that this was all due to the knowledge of divination was highly delighted and gave harrisman the revenue of more villages with gold an umbrella and state carriages of all kinds so harrisman prospered in the world end of chapter one hundred and seventeen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter one eighteen of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by annie hill tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter one eighteen it is quite true what a dreadful story exclaimed a hen it so frightened me that i did not dare to sleep alone in the hen-house all night i was glad there were so many of us and she began to relate to the other hens who were on the roosting perch above the story she had heard till their feathers stood on end and even the cock let his comb droop it was so dreadful but we will begin at the beginning and discover what really had happened in the hen-house on the other side of the town one evening just before sunset the hens as usual went early to roost and among them was a pretty hen with white feathers and short legs who laid regularly such fine eggs that she was very valuable and much esteemed by all her relations as this hen was flying up in the hen-house to the roosting perch she either pecked or scratched herself with her beak till one of her feathers fell off there goes another she said good-humouredly how beautiful i shall look if one falls off every time i scratch myself this white hen was not only very much esteemed but also the merriest of all the hens in the hen-house but she forgot all about the fallen feather and was soon asleep it became quite dark the hens were seated side by side near each other on the perch but one of them could not sleep for she had partly heard what the white hen said the wakeful hen stayed and thought and then said to her next neighbour have you heard i name no one but a hen has plucked out all her feathers and is not fit to be seen if i were the cock i should despise her the gossiping hen soon after left the hen-house and went to visit an owl who lived just opposite with her husband and children the owl families have very sharp ears and they heard every word that their neighbour the hen said and the little ones rolled their eyes about while the mother owl fanned herself with her wings to repeat what you just have been told is nothing continued the hen but i really and truly heard what was said with my own ears and people must hear a great deal even if they do disapprove it is about a hen who has forgotten what was due to herself in her high position she has pulled out all her feathers and then allowed the world to see her in that bare condition prenez garde au enfant said the owl father all this is not fit for the children to hear i will just fly over and tell my neighbour said the mother owl she is a very highly esteemed owl and worthy of our acquaintance hoo, hoo, oh, hoo, howled the children as the mother flew away and passed by her neighbours the pigeons who were in the pigeon-house have you heard have you heard about the hen that has plucked off all her feathers and is going about quite bare she will freeze to death if she is not dead already <coughs> cooed the pigeons i heard of it in the neighbouring farmyard said another i have as good as seen it with my own eyes 
the story is really so improper that no one cares to relate it but it is certainly true we believe it we believe every word said the pigeons and they flew down cooing to the farmyard and exclaimed have you heard about the hen the hen why people now say there are two hens who have plucked off all their feathers yet one of them is not like the first who did not wish to be seen for she has positively tried to attract the attention of everybody it was a daring game however they caught cold and are both dead from a fever wake up wake up crowed the cock as he flew out of the hen-house to the palings sleep was still in his eyes yet he stood and crowed lustily listen said the hen there is a cock in the next farm who has unluckily lost three of his wives they had plucked off all their feathers and died of cold go away he exclaimed i will not hear it it is an ugly story send it away send it away hissed the bat while the hens cackled and the cock crowed send it away send it away and so the story flew from one farmyard to another until it came back to the last place where the original circumstance occurred there are five hens thus now ran the story who have plucked off all their feathers at least so they say and it made the cock so unhappy that he became quite thin and he has pecked himself so dreadfully ever since from indignation and shame that at last he has fallen down and died covered with blood for these hens had not only disgraced his family but occasioned a great loss to his owner and the hen who had really lost the one feather naturally could not recognize her own story but she was a sensible worthy hen and she said i despise these cackling hens however there shall be no more tittle-tattle of this sort when people have a secret among themselves to gossip about in future i will find it out and send it to the newspapers so that it may travel through the whole land and be heard of by everybody this will just serve these cackling hens and their families right and the newspapers took it up and so altered the wonderful story that at last it was actually true one little feather had become five hens End of chapter one eighteen Chapter 119 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 119 Manaboso and His Toe. Manaboso, the great wizard of the Indians, was so powerful that he began to think there was nothing he could not do. Very wonderful were many of his feats, and he grew more conceited day by day. Now it chanced that one day he was walking about amusing himself by exercising his extraordinary powers, and at length he came to an encampment where one of the first things he noticed was a child lying in the sunshine, curled up with its toe in its mouth. Manaboso looked at the child for some time and wondered at its extraordinary posture. I have never seen a child before lie like that, he said to himself, but I could lie like it. So saying, he put himself down beside the child, and, taking his right foot in his hand, drew it toward his mouth. When he had brought it as near as he could, it was yet a considerable distance away from his lips. I will try with the left foot, said Manaboso. He did so and found he was no better off. Neither of his feet could he get to his mouth. He curled and twisted and bent his large limbs and gnashed his teeth in rage to find that he could not get his toe in his mouth. All, however, was vain. At length he rose, worn out by his exertions and passions, and walked slowly away in a very ill humor, which was not lessened by the sound of the child's laughter for Manaboso's efforts had awakened it. Ah, ah, said Manaboso, shall I be mocked by a child? He did not, however, revenge himself upon the victor, 
but on his way homeward, meeting a boy who did not treat him with a proper respect, he transformed him into a cedar tree. At least, said Manaboso, I can do something. End of chapter 119 Manaboso and his toe Chapter 120 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 120 The Most Frugal of Men A man who was considered the most frugal of all the dwellers in a certain kingdom heard of another man who was the most frugal in the whole world. He said to his son thereupon, We indeed live upon little, but if we were more frugal still, we might live upon nothing at all. It will be well worth while for us to get instructions in economy from the most frugal of men. The son agreed, and the two decided that the son should go and inquire whether the master in economic science would take pupils. An exchange of presents being a necessary preliminary to closer intercourse, the father told the son to take the smallest of coins, one farthing, and to buy a sheet of paper of the cheapest sort. The boy, by bargaining, got two sheets of paper for the farthing. The father put away one sheet, cut the other sheet in halves, and on one half drew a picture of a pig's head. This he put into a large covered basket, as if it were the thing which it represented, the usual gift sent in token of great respect. The son took the basket, and after a long journey reached the abode of the most frugal man in the world. The master of the house was absent, but his son received the traveller, learned his errand, and accepted the offering. Having taken from the basket the picture of the pig's head, he said courteously to his visitor, I am sorry that we have nothing in the house that is worthy to take the place of the pig's head in your basket. I will, however, signify our friendly reception of it by putting in four oranges for you to take home with you. Thereupon the young man, without having any oranges at hand, made the motions necessary for putting the fruit into the basket. The son of the most frugal man in the kingdom then took the basket and went to his father to tell of the thrift surpassing his own. When the most frugal man in the world returned home, his son told him that a visitor had been there, having come from a great distance to take lessons in economy. The father inquired what offering he had brought as an introduction, and the son showed the small outline of a pig's head on thin brown paper. The father looked at it, and then asked his son what he had sent as a return present. The son told him that he had merely made the motions necessary for transferring four oranges, and showed how he had clasped the imaginary fruit and deposited it in the visitor's basket. The father immediately flew into a rage and boxed the boy's ears, exclaiming, You extravagant wretch! With your fingers thus far apart you appear to have given him large oranges. Why didn't you measure out small ones? End of chapter 120 The Most Frugal of Men Chapter 121 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 121 The Moon Cake. A little boy had a cake that a big boy coveted. Designing to get the cake without making the little boy cry so loud as to attract his mother's attention, the big boy remarked that the cake would be prettier if it were more like the moon. The little boy thought that a cake like the moon must be desirable, and on being assured by the big boy that he had made many such, he handed over his cake for manipulation. The big boy took out a mouthful, leaving a crescent with a jagged edge. The little boy was not pleased by the change, and began to whimper, whereupon the big boy pacified him by saying that he would make the cake into a half-moon. 
so he nibbled off the horns of the crescent and gnawed the edge smooth but when the half moon was made the little boy perceived that there was hardly any cake left and he again began to snivel the big boy again diverted him by telling him that if he did not like so small a moon he would have one that was just the size of the real orb he took the cake and explained that just before the new moon is seen the old moon disappears then he swallowed the rest of the cake and ran off leaving the little boy waiting for the new moon End of chapter 121chapter 122 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dale grothman tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter 122 the ladle that fell from the moon once there was an old woman who lived on what she got by while from her relatives and neighbors. Her husband's brother lived alone with his only son, in a house near hers, and when the son brought home a wife, the old woman went to call on the bride. During the call she inquired of the bride whether she had not, since her arrival in the house, heard a scratching at night among the boxes containing her wedding outfit. The bride said she had not. A few days later the old woman came again, and during the visit the bride remarked that, before the matter was mentioned, she had heard no scratching among her boxes, but that since that time she had listened for it, and had heard it every night. The old woman advised her to look carefully after her clothing, saying that there were evidently many mice in the house, and that she would likely at any time find her best garments nibbled into shreds. The old woman knew there was no cat in the house, but she inquired whether there was one, and on hearing there was not she offered to lend the young woman her own black and white cat saying that it would soon extirpate all the mice the bride accepted the loan and the old woman brought the cat and left it in the bride's apartment after a few hours the cat disappeared and the bride supposing it had gone home made no search for it it did indeed go home and the old woman secretly disposed of it but several days later she came to the young woman and said that when she lent the cat her house had been free from mice but that as soon as the cat was gone the mice came and multiplied so fast that now everything was overrun by them and she would be obliged to take the cat home again the young woman told her that the cat went away the same day that it came and she had supposed it had gone home the old woman said it had not and that nothing could compensate her for the loss of it for she had reared it herself and there was never before such a cat for catching mice that a cat spotted as that one was was seldom found and that it was a rare breed which gave rise to the common saying a coal-black cat with snowy loins is worth its weight in silver coins and that the weight of her cat was two hundred ounces the young woman was greatly surprised by this estimate of the value of the lost cat and went to her father-in-law and related all that had occurred the father-in-law knowing the character of the old woman could neither eat nor sleep so harassed was he by the expectation that she would worry his daughter-in-law until the two hundred ounces of silver should be paid the young woman being a newcomer thought very lightly of the matter until the old woman came again and again and made mention of the cat when it became apparent that she must defend herself the young woman asked her father-in-law if he had ever lent anything to the old woman and when he said he could not remember having lent anything, she begged him to think carefully, and see if he could not recall a loan of a tool, a dish, or a faggot. He finally recollected that he had lent her an old wooden ladle, but he said it originally cost but a few farthings, and was certainly not worth speaking about. The next time the old woman came to dun for the amount due for her cat, the young woman asked her to return the borrowed ladle. The old woman said that the ladle was old and valueless, that she had allowed the children to play with it, and that they had dropped it in the dirt, where it had lain until she picked it up and used it for kindlings. The bride responded, You expect to enrich yourself and your family by means of your cat. I and my family also want money, 
since you cannot give back the ladle we will both go before the magistrate and present our cases if your cat is adjudged to be worth more than my ladle i will pay you the excess but if my ladle is worth more than your cat you must pay me being sure that the cat would by any judge be considered a greater value than the ladle the old woman agreed to the proposition and the two went before the magistrate the young woman courteously gave precedence to the elder and allowed her to make the accusation the old woman set forth her case and claimed two hundred ounces of silver as a compensation for the loss of the cat when she had concluded her statement the judge called on the young woman for her defense she said she could not disprove the statement but that the claim was offset by a ladle that had been borrowed by the plaintiff there was a common saying in the moon overhead at its full you can see the trunk branch and leaf of a cinnamon tree a branch from this tree had one night been blown down before her father-in-law's door and he had had a ladle made from the wood whatever the ladle was put into never diminished by use whether wine oil rice or money the bulk remained the same if no ladle besides this one were used in dipping it a foreign innkeeper hearing of this ladle came and offered her father-in-law three thousand ounces of silver for it but the offer was refused and this ladle was the one the plaintiff had borrowed and destroyed the magistrate on hearing this defense understood that the cat had been a pretext for extortion and decided that the two claims offset each other so that no payment was due from either one end of chapter 122 the ladle that fell from the moon chapter 123 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin the young head of the family there was once a family consisting of a father his three sons and his two daughters-in-law the two daughters-in-law wives of the two elder sons had but recently been brought into the house and were both from one village a few miles away having no mother-in-law living they were obliged to appeal to their father-in-law whenever they wished to visit their former homes and as they were lonesome and homesick they perpetually bothered the old man by asking leave of absence vexed by these constant petitions he set himself to invent a method of putting an end to them and at last gave them leave in this wise you are always begging me to allow you to go and visit your mothers and thinking that i am very hard-hearted because i do not let you go now you may go but only upon condition that when you come back you will each bring me something i want the one shall bring me some fire wrapped in paper and the other wind in a paper unless you promise to bring me these you are never to ask me to let you go home and if you go and fail to get these for me you are never to come back the old man did not suppose that these conditions would be accepted but the girls were young and thoughtless and in their anxiety to get away did not consider the impossibility of obtaining the articles required so they made ready with speed and in great glee started off on foot to visit their mothers after they had walked a long distance chatting about what they should do and whom they should see in their native village the high heel of one of them slipped from under her foot and she fell down owing to this mishap both stopped to adjust the misplaced footgear and while doing this the conditions under which they alone could return to their husbands came to mind and they began to cry 
while they sat there crying by the roadside a young girl came riding along from the fields on a water buffalo she stopped and asked them what was the matter and whether she could help them they told her she could do them no good but she persisted in offering her sympathy and inviting their confidence till they told her their story and then she at once said that if they could go home with her she would show them a way out of their trouble their case seemed so hopeless to themselves and the child was so sure of her own power to help them that they finally accompanied her to her father's house where she showed them how to comply with their father-in-law's demand for the first a paper lantern only would be needed when lighted it would be a fire and its paper surface would compass the blaze so that it would truly be some fire wrapped in paper for the second a paper fan would suffice when flapped the wind would issue from it and the wind wrapped in paper could thus be carried to the old man the two young women thanked the wise child and went on their way rejoicing after a pleasant visit to their old homes they took a lantern and a fan and returned to their father-in-law's house as soon as he saw them he began to vent his anger at their light regard for his commands but they assured him that they had perfectly obeyed him and showed him that what they had brought fulfilled the conditions prescribed much astonished he inquired how it was that they had suddenly become so astute and they told him the story of their journey and of the little girl who had so opportunely come to their relief he inquired whether the little girl was already betrothed and finding she was not engaged a go-between to see if he could get her for a wife for his youngest son having succeeded in securing the girl as a daughter-in-law he brought her home and told all the rest of the family that as there was no mother in the house and as this girl had shown herself to be possessed of extraordinary wisdom she should be the head of the household the wedding festivities being over the sons of the old man ready to return to their usual occupations on the farm but according to their father's order they came to the young bride for instructions she told him they were never to go to or from the fields empty-handed when they went they must carry fertilizers of some sort for the land and when they returned they must bring bundles of sticks for fuel they obeyed and soon had the land in fine condition and so much fuel gathered and none needed to be bought when there were no more sticks roots or weeds to bring she told them to bring stones instead and they soon accumulated an immense pile of stones which were heaped in a yard near their house one day an expert in the discovery of precious stones came along and saw in this pile a block of jade of great value in order to get possession of this stone at a small cost he undertook to buy the whole heap pretending that he wished to use them in building the little head of the family asked an exorbitant price for them and as he could not induce her to take less he promised to pay her the sum she asked and to come two days later to bring the money and to remove the stones that night the girl thought about the reason for the buyers being willing to pay so large a sum for the stones and concluded that the heap must contain a gem the next morning she sent her father-in-law to invite the buyer to supper and she instructed the men of her family in regard to his entertainment the best of wine was to be provided and the father-in-law was to induce him to talk of precious stones and to cajole him into telling in what way they were to be distinguished from other stones the head of the family listening behind a curtain 
heard how the valuable stone in her heap could be discovered she hastened to find and remove it from the pile and when her guest had recovered from the effect of the banquet he saw that the value had departed from his purchase he went to negotiate again with the seller and she conducted the conference with such skill that she obtained the price originally agreed upon for the heap of stones and a large sum besides for the one in her possession the family having become wealthy built an ancestral hall of fine design and elaborate workmanship and put the words no sorrow as an inscription over the entrance soon after a mandarin passed that way and noticing this remarkable inscription had his sedan chair set down that he might inquire who were the people that professed to have no sorrow he sent for the head of the family was much surprised on seeing so young a woman thus appear and remarked yours is a singular family i have never before seen one without sorrow nor one with so young a head i will fine you for your impudence go and weave me a piece of cloth as long as this road very well responded the little woman so soon as your excellency shall have found the two ends of the road and inform me as to the number of feet in its length i will at once begin the weaving finding himself at fault the mandarin added and i also find you as much oil as there is water in the sea certainly responded the woman as soon as you shall have measured the sea and sent me correct information as to the number of gallons i will at once begin to press out the oil from my beans indeed said the mandarin since you are so sharp perhaps you can penetrate my thoughts if you can i will find you no more i hold this pet quail in my hand now tell me whether i mean to squeeze it to death or to let it fly in the air well said the woman i am an obscure commoner and you are a famed magistrate if you are no more knowing than i you have no right to find me at all now i stand with one foot on one side my threshold and the other foot on the other side tell me whether i mean to go in or come out if you cannot guess my riddle you should not require me to guess yours being unable to guess her intention the mandarin took her his departure and the family lived long in opulence and good repute under its chosen head end of chapter 123 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter 124 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 124 A Dreadful Boar a poor old woman who lived with her one little granddaughter in the woods was out gathering sticks for fuel and found a green stalk of sugar cane which she added to her bundle she presently met an elf in the form of a wild boar that asked her for the cane but she declined giving it to him saying that at her age to stoop and to rise again was to earn what she picked up and that she was going to take the cane home and let her little granddaughter suck its sap the boar angry at her refusal said that he would during the coming night eat her granddaughter instead of the cane and went off into the woods when the old woman reached her cabin she sat down by the door and wailed for she knew she had no means of defending herself against the boar while she sat crying a vendor of needles came along and asked her what was the matter 
she told him and he said that all he could do was give her a box of needles this he did and went on his way the old woman stuck the needles thickly on the lower half of her door on its outer side and then she went on crying just then a man came along with a basket of crabs heard her lamentations and stopped to inquire what ailed her she told him and he said he knew no help for her but he would do the best he could for her by giving her half his crabs the old woman put the crabs in her water jar behind the door and again sat down and cried a farmer soon came along from the fields leading his ox and he also asked the cause of her distress and heard her sad story he said he was sorry he could not think of any way of preventing the evil she expected but that he would leave his ox to stay all night with her as it might be some sort of company for her in her loneliness she led the ox into her cabin tied it to the head of the bedstead gave it some straw and then cried again a courier returning on horseback from a neighboring town next passed her door and dismounted to inquire what troubled her having heard her tale he said he would leave his horse to stay with her and make the ox more contented so she tied the horse to the foot of her bed and thinking how surely evil was coming upon her with the night she burst out crying anew a boy just then came along with a snapping turtle that he had caught and stopped to ask what had happened to her on learning the cause of her weeping he said it was of no use to contend against sprites but that he would give her his snapping turtle as a proof of his sympathy she took the turtle tied it to the front of her bedstead and continued to cry some men who were carrying millstones then came along inquired into her trouble and expressed their compassion by giving her a millstone which they rolled into her backyard a little later a man arrived carrying hoes and pickaxe and asked her why she was crying so hard she told him her grief and he said he would gladly help her if he could but he was only a well digger and could do nothing for her other than to dig her a well she pointed out a place in the middle of her backyard and he went to work and quickly dug a well on his departure the old woman cried again until a paper seller came and inquired what was the matter when she had told him he gave her a large sheet of white paper as a token of pity and she laid it smoothly over the mouth of the well nightfall came the old woman shut and barred her door put her granddaughter snugly on the wall side of the bed and then laid down beside her to await the foe at midnight the boar came and threw himself against the door to break it in the needles wounded him sorely so that when he had gained an entrance he was heated and thirsty and went to the water jar to drink when he thrust in his snout the crabs attacked him clinging to his bristles and pinching his ears until he rolled over and over to disencumber himself then in a rage he approached the front of the bed but the snapping turtle nipped his tail and made him retreat under the feet of the horse who kicked him over to the ox who tossed him back to the horse and thus beset he was glad to escape to the back yard to take a rest and to consider the situation seeing a clean paper spread on the ground he went to lie upon it and fell into the well the old woman heard the fall rushed out rolled the millstone down on him and crushed him end of chapter 124 a dreadful boar chapter 125 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dale grothman tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter 125 the old man and the devils a long time ago there was an old man who had a big lump on the right side of his face one day he went into the mountain to cut wood when the rain began to pour and the wind to blow so very hard that finding it impossible to return home and filled with fear he took refuge in the hollow of an old tree 
While sitting there, doubled up and unable to sleep, he heard the confusing sound of many voices in the distance, gradually approaching to where he was. He said to himself, How strange! I thought I was all alone on the mountain, but I hear the voices of many people. So, taking courage, he peeped out, and saw a great crowd of strange-looking beings. Some were red and dressed in green clothes, others were black and dressed in red clothes. Some had only one eye, and others had no mouth. Indeed, it was quite impossible to describe their varied and strange looks. They kindled a fire, so that it became as light as day. They sat down in two crossed rows and began to drink wine and make merry just like human beings. They passed the wine cup around so often that many of them soon drank too much. One of the young devils got up and began to sing a merry song and to dance. So also the others, some dancing well, others badly. One said, We have had uncommon fun tonight, but I would like to see something new. Then the old man, losing all fear, thought he would like to dance, and saying, Let come what will, if I die for it, I will have a dance too, crept out of the hollow tree, and, with his cap slipped over his nose and his axe sticking in his belt, began to dance. The devils, in great surprise, jumped up, saying, Who is this? But the old man advanced and receded, swaying to and fro, and posturing this way and that. The whole crowd laughed and enjoyed the fun, saying, How well the old man dances! You must always come to join us in our sport. But, for fear you might not come, you will give us a pledge that you will. So the devils consulted together, and agreeing that the lump on his face, which was a token of wealth, was what he valued most highly, demanded that it should be taken. The old man replied, I have had this lump for many years, and would not without good reason part with it. But you may have it, or an eye, or my nose either, if you wish. So the devils laid hold of it, twisting and pulling, and took it off without giving him any pain and put it away as a pledge that he would come back. Just then the day began to dawn, and the birds to sing, so the devils hurried away. The old man felt his face, and found it quite smooth, and not a trace of a lump left. He forgot all about cutting wood, and hastened home. His wife, seeing him, exclaimed in great surprise, What has happened to you? So he told her all that had befallen him. Now among the neighbors there was another old man who had a big lump on the left side of his face. Hearing all about how the first old man had got rid of his misfortune, he determined that he would also try the same plan. So he went and crept into the hollow tree, and waited for the devils to come. Sure enough, they came just as he was told, and they sat down, drank wine, and made merry just as they did before. The second old man, afraid and trembling, crept out of the hollow tree. The devils welcomed him, saying, The old man has come! Now let us see him dance! This old fellow was awkward, and did not dance as well as the other. So the devils cried out, You dance badly, and are getting worse and worse. We will give you back the lump which we took from you as a pledge. Upon this one of the devils brought the lump, and stuck it on the side of his face. So the poor old fellow returned home with a lump on each side. End of chapter 125 The Old Man and the Devils Chapter 126 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. J. Burns. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 126 The Wonderful Tea Kettle. A long, long time ago, at the temple of Morinji in the province of Kotsuke, there lived an old priest. 
This old priest was very fond of the ceremonial preparing and drinking of tea, known as chanoyu. Indeed, it was his chief interest and pleasure in life to conduct this ceremony. One day, he chanced to find in a second-hand shop a very nice-looking old tea kettle, which he bought and took home with him, highly pleased by its fine shape and artistic appearance. Next day, he brought out his new purchase and sat for a long time, turning it round on this side and on that and admiring it. You are a regular beauty, that's what you are, he said. I shall invite all my friends to the Chanoyu, and how astonished they will be at finding such an exquisite kettle as this. He placed his treasure on the top of a box where he could see it to the best advantage, and sat, admiring it and planning how he should invite his guests. After a while, he became drowsy and began to nod, and at last fell forward, his head on his desk, fast asleep. Then a wonderful transformation took place. The tea kettle began to move. From its spout appeared a hairy head. At the other side, out came a fine bushy tail. Next, four feet made themselves visible, while fine fur seemed gradually to cover the surface of the kettle. At last, jumping off the box, it began capering around the room for all the world, just like a badger. Three young novices, pupils of the priest, who were at study in the next room, heard the noise, and when one of them peeped through the sliding doors, what was his astonishment to see the tea kettle on four feet dancing up and down the room? He cried out, Oh, what a wonderful thing! The tea kettle is changed into a badger. What? said the second novice. Do you mean to say that the tea kettle is turned into a badger? What nonsense! So saying, he pushed his companion to one side and peeped in. But he also was terrified by what he saw and screamed. It's a goblin! It's coming at us! Let us run away! The third novice was not so easily frightened. Come, this is rather fun, said he. How the creature does jump, to be sure. I will rouse the master and let him see, too. So he went into the room and shook the priest, crying, Wake, master, wake! A strange thing has happened. What's the matter? said the old man, drowsily rubbing his eyes. What a noisy fellow you are. Anyone would be noisy when such a strange thing as this is going on, said the novice. Only look, master, your tea kettle has got feet and is running about. What? 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 What's that you say? asked the priest again. The kettle. Got feet? What's this? Let me see. But by the time the old man was thoroughly roused, the tea kettle had turned into its ordinary shape and stood quietly on its box again. What foolish young fellows you are, said the priest. There stands a kettle on top of a box. Surely there is nothing very strange in that. No, no. I have heard of the rolling pin that grew a pair of wings and flew away. But, long as I have lived, never have I heard before of a tea kettle walking about on its own feet. You will never make me believe that. But for all that, the priest was a little uneasy in his mind and kept thinking of the incident all that day. When evening came, and he was alone in his room, 
He took down the kettle, filled it with water, and set it upon the embers to boil, intending to make some tea. But as soon as the water began to boil, Hot! Hot! cried the kettle and jumped off the fire. Help! Help! cried the priest, terrified out of his wits. But when the novices rushed to his help, the kettle at once resumed its natural form. So one of them, seizing a stick, cried, We'll soon find out whether it's alive or not, and began beating it with might and main. There was evidently no life in the thing, and only a metallic clang, clang, clang responded to his lusty blows. Then the old priest heartily repented having bought the mischievous tea kettle, and was debating in his own mind how he should get rid of it, when who should drop in but the tinker? Here's the very man, thought the priest. A bargain was soon struck. The tinker bought the tea kettle for a few coppers and carried it home, well pleased with his purchase. Before going to bed, he took another look at it and found it still better than he had at first thought. So he went to sleep that night in the best of spirits. In the midst of a pleasant dream, the tinker suddenly started up, thinking he heard somebody moving in the room. But when he opened his eyes and looked about, he could see nobody. It was only a dream, I suppose, said he to himself as he turned over and went to sleep again. But he was disturbed once more by someone calling, Tinker! Tinker! Get up! Get up! This time he sprang up, wide awake, and lo and behold, there was the tea kettle with a head, tail, feet, and fur of a badger strutting up and down the room. Goblin! Goblin! shrieked the tinker. But the tea kettle laughed and said, Don't be frightened, my dear tinker. I am not a goblin, only a wonderful tea kettle. My name is Bumbuko Chagama and I will bring good luck to anyone who treats me well. But, of course, I don't like to be set on the fire and then beaten with sticks, as happened to me at the temple yesterday. How can I please you, then? asked the tinker. Shall I keep you in a box? Oh, no, no, answered the tea kettle. I like nice sweet things to eat, and sometimes a little wine to drink, just like yourself. Will you keep me in your house and feed me? And as I would not be a burden upon you, I will work for you in any way you like. To this the tinker agreed. Next morning he provided a good feast for Bumbuku, who then spoke. I certainly am a wonderful and accomplished tea kettle, and my advice is that you take me round the country as a show with accompaniments of singing and music. The tinker, thinking well of this advice, at once started a show, which he named the Bambuku Chagama. The lucky tea kettle at once made the affair a success, for not only did he walk about on four legs, but he danced the tightrope and went through all kinds of acrobatic performances, ending by making a profound bow to the spectators and begging for their future patronage. The fame of these performances soon spread abroad, and the theater was filled daily to overflowing, until at length even the princes of the land sent to order the tinker and his kettle to come to them, and the show would take place to the great delight of the princesses and ladies of the court. At last the tinker grew so rich that he retired from business, and wishing his faithful kettle also to be at rest, he took it back, together with a large share of his wealth, to the temple of Moringi, where it was laid up as a precious treasure, and some say 
even worshipped as a saint. End of chapter 126 Recording by T.J. Burns